Yeah. Hello, Dan. I think uh, you can hear me and see me as well. I guess. Yes. yes. Okay, so it should work. Okay, yeah, great. So we basically still have two speakers for, for the first part that are not connected. Is it right? I think so, yeah. Not everybody, yeah. but they still have quite a lot of time. Uh, I'm uh, I'm connected yeah. from the first uh, session, and I already tried uh, the video settings. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, we basically we just don't have Dracici, uh, Abip, uh, and uh, Bocheng, Chang, if I see it correctly. The last two speakers. But let's wait. Hi, Pavel. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. I can hear you. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Ah, I see. I'm here also. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you and see you. Okay. Hi, Carla. <laughs> And maybe just to make sure, even if you, uh, if there are other speakers, even from from the later session, later sessions of the day, please, uh, if if you are unsure about uh, whether Zoom will work for you, try to test it now because during the coffee breaks we have really a little time to uh, to tune these uh, technical things. Okay, it seems that no one else wants to test, so I will we'll just share my screen. If anybody decides to test, just let me know. Now, can I have a question uh, to the conveners? Yes, sure. Uh, uh, these YouTube channels is uh, kind of public or it's, uh, um, I don't know, it's something uh, special to the yeah, uh, should, should regist be. Uh, registrations? Yeah, I think it should be public if I remember well. Okay. Uh, so maybe I can add here. Uh, so it's unlisted. What that means is right. that anybody with the link can see it, but the link cannot be found on the YouTube website. Mm, okay, I see, I see. Okay, thank you. 
but the link is open to the at, at the Indico, and it's really intended for all those who could not register because we hit the uh, the limit, or just what want to watch later. Yeah. And this is generated from Zoom, so it has some delay, yeah, some one or two, two minutes or something like this. Actually, I see that now we have also uh, Rashi Chip and uh, Bocheng connected. Uh, maybe do they want to test their setups as well, or did they test it before? Yeah, hello. <clears throat> Sorry, I was having a connection glitch. Um, um, I can test sharing my screen just for... Uh... Yes, yes, we can hear you now. Okay, perfect. So... Can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Um, okay, good. Yeah, okay, even, good. Yes, even in full screen, it works. Okay, perfect. So, okay, I'll, okay. I think that's good. Thank you for letting me test. All right, we have a few minutes to start. Um, actually, Midan, are there any instructions that you want to yet uh, show or tell, or are you waiting uh, till the exact time? <laughs> right, so we start by a video. So I will play the video now, and then you can take off. Yeah, OK. okay. Yeah, great. Thanks. The following message is best viewed on an oscilloscope. Okay, I guess that was it. <laughs> so, uh, 
so welcome uh, to the uh, to the track five uh, about the uh, with the talks about the quarks and laptop wave physics. Uh, today we will basically start uh, with uh, with talks uh, concerning uh, the uh, the rarity case. Uh, we will also have uh, a few talks uh, later in the day about spectroscopy and uh, production and decay properties. Uh, uh, at, at the at the basically very end of, uh, of of the day, we have pretty picked up agenda. So I would like to ask speakers to to stick to the uh, to the allocated time as much as possible. So basically, you all have fifteen minutes uh, uh, for for talk and discussion, which basically means twelve minutes for talk and three minutes for the discussion. I will uh, notify you five minutes uh, before uh, the expected end of uh, the talk. Uh, I will probably show. A label like this on uh, camera, or uh, I can also annotate uh, uh, the the shared screen as well, just to make sure that uh, you do not uh, do not overlook it. So, okay, I think that's basically it, and um, we can uh, we can go ahead. So, can I ask uh, Lauren Jomans Jomans to to uh, tell us about the pure electronic radi case at LHCB? Yep. So, oh, can you see my slides? Yes, we can see them. Okay, perfect. So, thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is Lauren Yeomans. Um, I'm from the University of Liverpool, and I'm going to be giving an update on purely leptonic radicase at LHCB on behalf of the LHCB collaboration. So first thing um, I'm going to do is have a quick look at the LHCB detector for anyone who isn't familiar with that, um, followed by an introduction to rare decays and why they're particularly interesting um, and possible implications on beyond the standard model physics searches. I'll then present um, some analyses with purely leptonic decay signatures that have been completed within LHCB. So firstly, the LHCB detector. Um, LHCB is one of the four main detectors on the LHC ring at CERN. Um, the detector is a single arm forward spectrometer designed for the study of heavy flavor physics, so particularly the study of B quarks. Um, you can see on the left here the side view of the detector. Um, the point on the very far left is the collision point, which is surrounded by the VELO, the vertex locator. Um, and this allows the identification of primary and secondary vertices, which is particularly important with um, B decays uh, because we expect some, um, we expect the bees to fly. So there should be some distance between these primary and secondary vertices of decay. In the bottom right, you can see the uh, total luminosity recorded by each year. Um, and in CERN, we collectively refer to run one as 2010 to 2012, and run two is 2015 to 2018. Um, so you can see that since the start of data taking, we've had over 10 inverse femtobarns barns delivered to um, LHCB and over nine inverse femtobarns recorded by the LHCB detector. So rare decays, um, flavor changing neutral currents are forbidden in the standard model at leading order. So they have to proceed via a, a loop involving another quark. You can see on the sketch there, we've got a top quark in between the B and the S transition. Um, they're powerful tools for probing new physics interaction as an increase of only one or two events um, could have quite a significance on, on the measured branching fraction. Um, and further motivation for these particular rare decays is that um, rare decays involving leptons in the final states also allow us to probe lepton flavor universality tests. Um, and this is particularly interesting given recent uh, discrepancies to the standard model in this area. So the first analysis that I want to talk about is the B to EE analysis. Uh, this is the B meson decay to an electron and positron, um, both for the standard B0 and also the BS decay. The standard 
model predictions for these decays are in the top left. Um, you can see that they're very rare, 8.6 times 10 to the minus 14 for the BS decay and 2.41 times 10 to the minus 15 for the BD decay. However, these branching fractions could be several orders of magnitude larger than this um, with new physics contributions. So before this analysis, the previous bounds were set by the CDF collaboration at 2.8 times 10 to the minus seven for the BS decay and 8.3 times 10 to the minus eight for the BD at 90% confidence level. Um, I should mention here that several of the analysis that I'm going to talk about today are measured with respect to a normalization channel, um, as this reduces uncertainties um, in the branching fraction calculation that arise from cross section and integrated luminosity measurements. So the branching, uh, sorry, the normalization channel used for this decay is the BU to J psi K, where the J psi decays to an electron and a positron, which obviously has a similar decay signature to the signal. Um, this particular analysis is performed at LHCB using five inverse femtoans of data. So we have three from run one and two from run two. And the, the plot there on the right shows the fit to the simultaneous, uh, sorry, the fit to the dielectron invariant mass distribution for the BS decay. Um, this is for run two. So the same thing was done for run one separately and also for the BD decay. Um, those plots are in the backup if you're interested in looking at them. So no excess was observed over the background in this case. So the limits have been set using the CLS method of 9.4 times 10 to the minus nine for the BS decay and 2.5 times 10 to the minus nine for the BD decay at 90% confidence level. Um, and these limits are more than an order of magnitude lower than previous values. And you can see from the diagram in the middle that this puts a constraint on, um, on new physics scenarios. Moving on to the BS to mu mu. So um, again, looking at both the BD and the BS decay. So the standard model predictions are in the top left. Um, 3.65 times 10 to the minus nine for the BS decay and 1.06 times 10 to the minus 10 for the BD decay. Um, this analysis was performed using a total of 4.4 inverse femtoans of data. So three from run one and 1.4 from run two. Um, the normalization channels used here are again the BU to jape psi k, but this time with the jape psi decay into two muons um, and also the BD to k pi decay. Um, so the signal yield is extracted from a fit to the dimuon invariant mass, which you can see in the plot on the right there. Um, and in this case, an excess of BS decays was found uh, with a significance of 7.8 standard deviations. Um, and the measured branching fraction in this case was three times 10 to the minus nine, which is in agreement with the standard model prediction within the uncertainties. Um, and evidence from the BD decay of 3.2 sigma was found when combining the LHCB data with the CMS data. And in this case, the branching fraction was 3.9 times 10 to the minus 10, which is 2.2 sigma above the standard model prediction. Um, so the analysis of the full run one, run two data set is currently ongoing within LHCB. Uh, the next K that I want to talk about is the beta tau tau. So you can see the standard model predictions in the top left-hand side. Um, but again, new physics uh, such as lept quarks or two Higgs doublet model um, could, well, do predict that these branching fractions could be increased by several orders of magnitude over those standard model predictions. Uh, the previous limit set by, ba by Barbar on the BD decay was 4.1 times 10 to the minus three at 90% confidence level, and there was no previous uh, limit on the BS decay. Um, the main challenge with this analysis is that we have two undetected neutrinos in the final state. Um, so as you can see by the decay chain on the bottom left, uh, the, tau, the predominant tau decay chain um, gives a neutrino. So obviously if we've got two taus, we've got two neutrinos. Um, and this means that the tau tau invariant mass distribution only provides a weak uh, discrimination between the signal and the background. So the method used here is to, um, well, the analysis is performed on run one data, so three inverse femtoans of data. 
Um, and the signal yield here is determined via a bind maximum likelihood fit um, on the output of a neural network. So this network uses 29 different um, input variables and it's the output is transformed to obtain a flat distribution for the signal across all 10 of these output bins, um, but with the background peaking towards zero. Um, the yield extracted in this case is consistent with zero. So it's been translated into upper limits of BS to tau tau at 6.8 times 10 to the minus three and 2.1 times 10 to the minus three for the BD decay at 95% confidence level. So um, this is now the world's best limit on the BD to tau tau decay and the first direct limit on the BS. Um, the next decay that I want to talk about is the BS to tau mu. Now this um, is extremely, extremely rare because it's lepton flavor violating. So um, for the decay to proceed, the, we have to take into account neutrino mass oscillations, um, as you can see in the Feynman diagram on the bottom left. Um, so the standard model prediction for this is of the order of 10 to the minus 54. Um, previous limits have been set here by Barber on the BD decay, again, at 2.2 times 10 to the minus five at 90% confidence level. But um, as with the BS tau tau, there was no limit on the BS decay. So um, this analysis of beta tau mu was performed on run one data again, um, using B0 to D pi as a normalization channel. Um, and here a BDT has been used to, um, for signal background discrimination and a fit has been performed in four BDT bins. Um, the extracted yields here, you can see on the right hand side, um, show no excess in signal, but we have placed limits on the BS to tau mu decay um, of 4.2 times 10 to the minus five and 1.4 times 10 to the minus five on the BD decay at 95% confidence level. Um, and these results, um, as I said, there was no previous limit on the BS, so it's the first direct limit on the BS decay and currently the most stringent limit on the BD decay. Um, and these results impose new constraints on the vector electrical model. So the final analysis that I want to talk about is the K short to mu mu. Um, and the standard model prediction here is 5.18 times 10 to the minus 12 with uncertainties relating to the long distance and short distance effects of the decay. So in the Feynman diagrams on the top, you can see the long distance contribution involving two photons. And at the bottom, you can see um, two examples of short distance contributions to the decay mode. Um, this analysis is performed on run two data, but the, it was performed previously on, on pure run one. And the limit was set on, on run one at nine times 10 to the minus nine. Um, but then we have a new and improved trigger strategy for run two. Um, so this analysis here was performed on 5.6 inverse femtobands of RUN2 data using the K short pi pi as a normalization channel. Um, and the plot there shows a projection of the fit to the dimuon invariant mass distribution for one of the most sensitive BDT bins. Um, again, the other plots are in the backup if you're interested. Um, you can see the signal contribution there in orange, the K short to mu. So the yield extracted um, was again consistent with zero. Limits have been placed um, at 2.2 uh, times 10 to the minus 10, um, but this is reduced to 2.1 times 10 to the minus 10 at 90% confidence le level when we um, combine these results with the run one results. Um, that's that's all of the analysis that I wanted to present. Um, just as a summary, so rare decays are very sensitive probes of, of beyond the standard model physics, and rare decays involving leptonic final states are also very interesting because we can use them for tests of lepton flavor universality. Um, we have several interesting purely leptonic analyses already completed within LHCB, and we have many more um, ongoing at the moment using the full 
run one plus run two data set. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Lauren, for, for, for the talk. So do people connected have questions or, or comments uh, to, uh, to the presented analyses? <coughs> Okay. If, um, I yeah. I can ask a question for the uh, analysis with the with the two tows. Um, can you do you know which one? What were the most discriminating variables in the BDT? Like what what was used? Um, oh, sorry, I, in the neural network. Sorry, in the neural network. I, I I'm not sure which the most discriminating ones were. Um, I know that there were 27 different variables input into the neural network, but I can I can have another look at the paper and get back to you in the Mattermost channel if, if that's helpful. Sure. Yeah, thanks. Okay, any other questions? Okay, maybe I would have a quick one. Just uh, what is actually the, the mass resolution when you use the tau decays for, for the B reconstruction? Uh, how, how worse is it compared to neonal electrons? Mm. Um, I'm not sure. I imagine um, it's quite a bit worse because of these neutrinos that we can't reconstruct in LHCB, but I haven't actually got a number, unfortunately. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Okay. Any other comments, questions? All right. If not, then thank you, Lauren, a lot for, for, for the presentation. And let's uh, move to the next talk. Uh, so, which is, uh, yeah. It's in Oslem Ozelik Ozudil, who will tell us about uh, the search for new physics with rare decays at uh, CMS. Hello. Wait a second. Hello. I'm trying to share. Yes. Okay. We can see the slides. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay. So please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, today I will present the latest results for rare decays at CMS and the talk will be dedicated to B2 mu mu and tau to 3 mu analysis specifically. So uh, starting with the B2 mu mu analysis, it uses data collected in 2011, 2012 and 2016 um, with the 7, 8 and 13 TV center of mass energies and with the corresponding integrated luminosities that is uh, shown in the slide. And it's uh, worth to mention that the analysis is performed in two different categories, uh, at two different regions of the, the detector as central and forward for all these uh, three running periods. So these decays are uh, highly sensitive probes for the uh, uh, for the new physics effects uh, because they are effective flavor changing neutral current decays uh, that can only occur at um, that penguin and uh, box diagrams as you can see in this uh, right uh, uh, Feynman diagrams here uh, so that the, the standard model uh, predictions of the branching fractions are uh, highly suppressed as the uh, as the predictions at the order of 10 to minus 9 and 10 to minus uh, 10. So we measured this uh, branching fractions uh, to um, uh, as an indirect search for the for the new physics effects. And in addition to this, we also uh, measure a, a, a BS to mu mu effective lifetime. Uh, it's it's also important because in in standard model, uh, only the heavy mass against state of the uh, BS meson can decay to dimion, which uh, result at uh, 1.65, uh, 61 uh, picosecond in effective lifetime in standard model predictions, but may have different contributions uh, from new physics effects, even though the branching fractions do not change at all. So the analysis is the signal signature of uh, B candidates um, 
reconstructed from two oppositely uh, charged muons uh, that are uh, fit to a common displaced vertex as it's uh, illustrated in this uh, small diagram here. And it has uh, two major background components. One is the combinatorial, uh, which consists of uh, either, uh, which consists of two muons uh, originating from either two uh, uncorrelated semileptonic B decays, as it's shown in this uh, diagram here, or uh, one semileptonic B decay uh, and plus uh, one uh, misidentified hadron. And the other component is the ray single B decays, um, which in these decays, one or two uh, uh, hadron uh, might be uh, reconstructed, uh, misreconstructed as muons. And it, this background has uh, either non picking or picking structure in the signal yields. And the master formula for the, uh, for the, measurement of the branching fraction of BS to mu mu is given in the slide here and uh, is determined relative to a normalization sample of uh, B plus to J psi K plus, which the branching fraction is uh, very well known. And uh, this uh, branching fraction formula is also a function of the corresponding yields and efficiencies uh, along with the fragmentation fractions of uh, B plus and the BS. And the analysis is a blind analysis and um, so that it uses a control sample of BS to J psi phi as a placeholder for the signal events uh, for uh, ver various validations and uh, systematic studies. And it also uses BDT in order to separate the signal events from the background. And the, and the normalization yield extraction is a uh, uh, obtained from a uh, fit to uh, a mimu k invariant mass distribution as it's shown in this two bottom plot here for two different detector regions uh, for central and forward. And you can see on the plots uh, various uh, uh, different background components uh, that is uh, included in the, in the fit and the signal and background models uh, uh, are given in the given in the slide along with the normalization uh, total normalization yield, and uh, here the partially reconstructed uh, corresponding to B two J psi K X uh, decays, which X uh, never considered in the final uh, final reconstruction, and B plus to J psi pi plus uh, is uh, fixed to four percent of the of the signal yields. And um, as I mentioned in the intro introduction, uh, the, the events are divided into two different uh, detector regions for three different years. And um, they are further divided into uh, low and high BDT categories in the beginning of the BDT discriminator distribution. And these branching fractions are obtained from a simultaneous fit to all these event categories. And here in these two plots, uh, you see the combined mass projections for this uh, high and low BDT categories, uh, along with the, uh, with the various uh, background components and the signal components in the fit. And this fit to data uh, gives the results for branching fraction of BS2 mu mu as given in this uh, slide here, uh, with the observed and expected significances as uh, 5.6 and 6.5 sigma. And uh, here the first, uh, first uncertainty is the combination of the statistical and the systematic uncertainties. And it's uh, dominated by the uh, statistical one. And the second one here is uh, from the fragmentation fractions. And uh, the, the plot on the right hand side uh, is the likelihood contours uh, for the fit to branching fractions of BS to MUMU and uh, B0 to MUMU. Um, and it's shown with the CMS value and the standard model expectation value. And the contours are corresponding to one sigma, uh, one, uh, one to five sigma. And since we do not see any significant uh, 
a signal for the B0, we put an upper limit on the branching fraction as it's given in the slide at 95% uh, confidence level. And, uh, and all the results are found to be consistent with SANA model. And another result for this, um, from this analysis is the effective lifetime, and it's uh, obtained from a fit to uh, uh, 2D maximum likelihood fit to uh, daimyon invariant mass and the decay time distribution in a range of uh, 1 to 11 picoseconds. And the fit, uh, you, you see in the two bottom plots here, the combined mass and proper decay time distributions from all event categories. And the FIT2 data gives the results uh, for the effective lifetime as 1.7 picoseconds uh, with a very small, uh, with a small systematic uncertainty here. And uh, this result is also found to be consistent with SANA model. And the second, to uh, second part of the talk will be about the tau to muons and the CMS uh, uh, has two different analysis from two different sources that is searching for this uh, decays. Uh, one is the W channel and the other one is the heavy, heavy flavor channel. And it's uh, the, the both analysis uses data collected in 2016 with um, corresponding center of mass energies and uh, integrated luminosities. So the, since um, the, uh, it's been observed that the neutrinos are not actually massless. So they can uh, oscillate through different generations and these gives a mechanism for the charge lepton flavor violating the case of uh, tau to 3 mu, as it's given in this right Feynman diagram here. But the standard model expectations of the branch fractions are still uh, very small. So, uh, however, this rate can be uh, strongly enhanced by the new physics scenarios, and they are very important and performed by many experiments so far. And CMS uh, first, uh, for the first time, provides a um, search uh, from a combination of two independent channels for these searches. So the typical W channel decay is given in the, uh, illustrated in the right diagram here, which W produced in a primary vertex and then decays into tau and tau neutrino, which appears as missing transverse energy in the decay. And then tau decays into three, three muons in the final state. And this analysis uses a master formula of branching fraction as it's given in the slide here, which uh, signal events are normalized using a W cross section and the W to tau mu branching fraction. And it's, uh, the analysis uses a BDT in order to uh, re uh, suppress the background. And it separates the events into two categories that is, uh, that is going to be included in the final branching fraction fit. The heavy flavor channel uh, searches tau to 3 mu decays from uh, B as well as D meson decays. And here you can see uh, uh, different tau lepton sources in the, in the slide. And the analysis uses a normalization channel uh, as DS to phi pi. And the normalization yield can be extracted from this, uh, uh, this right uh, upper plot here. And um, here, the first and second peak corresponds to D plus and the DS, candid, uh, DS events. Uh, and the fraction of the DS coming from B meson decays uh, are measured in a proper decay length distribution that is uh, shown in this right bottom plot here, which here uh, the prompt and the non-prompt DS uh, distributions are obtained from uh, Monte Carlo simulations and these shapes are used to uh, used to perform a fit to data events in order to estimate this fraction. And this analysis uh, separates the event into uh, six categories in total. And these are this uh, these categories are shown here. And the branching fractions are obtained from a simultaneous fit to this trimion invariant mass distributions from two different channels. And uh, no signal is found. And um, uh, here I, I have to say that uh, these uh, trimion mass distributions here signal yield is uh, uh, normalized as if the branching fraction equals to 10 to minus 7. And no signal is found, and the upper limit is set. Uh, observed and expected uh, upper limits on the branching fraction uh, are shown in the slide here. 
And fitting the channels separately, we also provide the individual results for the upper limits and they are also shown in the slides. And in summary, um, BS2, we moved the case uh, observed in, at CMS with 5.6 sigma and the uh, BS2 Mimi effective lifetime is performed uh, for the first time uh, at CMS and the B0 to Mimi branch fraction uh, upper limit for the branch fraction is set and the very first uh, search for the tau to 3 mu decays from a W channel and the heavy flavor channel is performed at CMS and uh, since these are rare decays and uh, they are surely be uh, um, they are surely uh, have a more uh, more improved sensitivities with more data. Uh, it's going to be interesting to have more data and the more results are on the way. So stay tuned. Thank you very much for your attention. Great. Thank you, Osan. So we still have uh, a minute or two for, for questions. So anyone connected? Okay, so maybe I, ah, I see here, so it's, ah, sorry, it was, uh, sorry, I probably, it was Raul who had a question, if I remember well, please go ahead. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. All right, so I would uh, like to ask uh, about this, uh, how do you deal for, sorry, for the BS to Mu Mu, I mean, how do you deal with these, uh, Hadron misidentification. I mean, I think since CMS doesn't have like a PID detector, mm -hmm. what do you do to yeah. fight this background? Do you let this to the BDTG, your multivariate selection, yeah. or what? Uh, if you can explain, what do you do to? Oh. Yeah, uh, for the rare case, uh, I mean, for the backgrounds. Um, um, CMS has a muon identification, but on top of it, we have a very advanced uh, muon identification that we, a custom muon identification that we are using uh, multivariate analysis. So uh, for this uh, muon identification, actually we managed to, uh, we managed to decrease the fake rates, for example, for the kaons, uh, to 10 to uh, in the order of 10 to minus 3 and for the pions in the order of 10 to minus uh, 4. So it's uh, it's something that we are uh, customized in using the BDT. All right. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so we should go ahead. So please, if people have further questions, please uh, use MetaMost to uh, to post them. And uh, I ask again speakers to, to check the chat in case there are questions for, for them. Sure. Okay, I so would be happy. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you very much, Uzla. Okay, so we can move uh, to the next talks. So Sally, uh, will you tell us about the Atlas results on heavy flavor production and uh, and the case, which includes also the ready case. Okay, I think. Thank you. We see, yeah, we see the slides. Okay. <clears throat> basically. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, so I'd like to re uh, report on Atlas results on heavy flavor production and decay. Uh, these will be two recent results from Atlas using the LHC proton-proton data. I'll just remind you of the uh, structure of the Atlas detector. All of the subsystems of Atlas are used in these analysis. Uh, from inside out, Atlas uses an, an inner detector, which includes silicon pixels, silicon microstrips, and the transition radiation tracker. This is uh, followed by sampling calorimeters, electromagnetic and hadronic, and uh, outermost are the air cord toroids, which provide a uh, magnetic field for the muon drift tubes and the, the cathode strip chambers, and this is critical for the triggers for the analyses that I'm going to describe. I'm going to talk to you about the relative 
production cross-section measurement at 8 TeV for the BC meson relative to the B plus meson. And secondly, a, dis a discussion of the process uh, for BD and BS to two muons at 3 TeV, uh, 13 TeV using 2015 and 2016 data. But before I start that, I'd like to ask you to please take note of some other interesting Atlas B physics talks that will be given at this conference. Later today, there'll be uh, from, from Brad Abbott, the Atlas results on Corconia and associated production. Uh, tomorrow, the measurement of the, B, of the weak mixing uh, phase phi S through time dependent CP violation in BS to JSI phi decays. And on the, the subsequent day, Atlas studies of spectroscopy and exotics. So I'll begin with the discussion of the, the measurement of the, the BC production cross-section at 8 TeV relative to the B plus. And the motivation here is that there's no published calculation of the relative cross-section at 8 TeV at this time. Uh, you'll see that uh, we're going to present evidence for dependence of this ratio upon the transverse momentum of the B. And this is the first measurement of this relative cross-section for this combination of fiducial volume and energy. So looking ahead to the outcome, uh, I'm going to report to you the ratio, the production cross-section for the BC times the branching fraction for BC to J psi pi relative to the production cross-section for B plus times the branching uh, fraction for B plus to J psi K. And this is measured in two PT bins for the rapidity range, uh, absolute rapidity of the B meson less than 2.3. Uh, One bin spans 13 GeV to 22 and the other is PT greater than 22 GeV. It's also measured for two rapidity bins for the PT range for the B meson greater than 13 GeV. One bin is absolute rapidity less than 0.75 and the other is the range 0.75 to 2.3. And we also report a result for the full range PT greater than 13 GeV and rapidity less than 2.3. Here's the method. We begin by finding the J psi. We combine every oppositely signed pair of muons and we constrain uh, the outcome to a common vertex. Then we find the B candidates. We fit the, the tracks of the two muons to a charged hadron track and constrain the outcome of that to a common vertex. The charged hadron takes a k-on mass in the case of the B plus and a pi-on mass in the case of the BC. And we constrain the J psi mass to its world average value. We, we remove combinatorial background in which the J psi is combined with unrelated light, light hadron and we select on the significance of the impact parameter of the hadron um, relative to the primary vertex in the transverse plane. We also remove partially reconstructed BC semi-leptonic decays in which the muon fakes a hadron. And then again, we find the ratio, the production cross-section of BC times the branching fraction for BC to J psi pi times the branching fraction for J psi to um, two muons relative to the same for the the same, the analogous for the, the, the B plus. And the actual um, measurement is, is uh, carried out by uh, taking the ratio of the number of reconstructed uh, BC signal events to the number of reconstructed B plus signal events, each of them weighted by the efficiency uh, for, for uh, the efficiency for measuring that particular type of meson. Here are example uh, invariant mass distributions. On the left side, you see the BC case, and on the right side, you see the B plus case. The inclusive result for this, for the full range PT greater than 13 GeV and absolute rapidity less than 2.3, is a measurement of the production cross-section ratio of 0.34 plus statistical, systematic, and lifetime uncertainties. On slide seven, you see the, um, the results graphically. Uh, again, the inclusive result is repeated here. It, it appears as a horizontal band. It's identical in, in both graphs here, where the, um, the double hatch is the statistical error and the single hatch is the statistical plus systematic plus lifetime in quadrature. And then you also see the differential um, measurements. On the left side, you see the case for uh, absolute rapidity less than 2.3, the two bins in transverse momentum, the horizontal error bars indicate the width of the bin. And you see uh, that the differential measurement uh, seems to suggest a possible dependence on transverse momentum. The production cross section of the BC decreases faster um, with PT than the production cross section of the B plus. 
And on the right-hand side, you see the case for uh, transverse momentum greater than 13 GeV for the two bins in, in uh, absolute rapidity, and, and we uh, report no significant dependence on rapidity. Now we'll move to the second topic, which is the study of the rare decays of BS and BD into muon pairs using the 2015 to 2016 data. And the motivation here, as has been mentioned by, by previous speakers, is that the branching fractions uh, for these decays are highly suppressed, both due to the associated flavor changing neutral current and to helicity suppression. The predicted branching fractions uh, are given here for the BS case 3.66 10 times 10 to the minus 9, and for the BD case 1.03 times 10 to the minus 10. And the smallness and precision of those predictions gives a favorable environment for observing possibly new physics. Looking ahead to the outcome of this measurement, um, what I'm going to show you is that a single fit determines the signal yields for both modes using the 2015 to 2016 data combined with the one run, run one result finds uh, a branching fraction for BS to two muons of 2.8 times 10 to the minus nine and a limit for the uh, frac branching fraction for BD at 2.1 times 10 to the minus 10 at 95% confidence level. This combined result differs from the standard model prediction by 2.4 standard deviations. Some foundational information here. Deviations from the standard model prediction arise in a number of, of scenarios, including minimal supersymmetry, minimal flavor violation, two Higgs doublet models, and, and other models as well. This measurement uses 26.3 inverse femtobarns that was collected by ATLAS at 13 TeV. The ATLAS run one measurement uh, produced the following um, numbers. The branching fraction for BS to two muons was reported at 0.9 times 10 to the minus 9, and the branching fraction for BD uh, was limited at 4.2 times 10 to the minus 10. Measurements for these channels are also uh, reported by CMS and LHCB both separately and in combination. Here's the method, the channels, uh, as, as is the case with, with uh, other um, other experiments, the channels are measured relative to the abundant and well-measured channel B plus goes to J psi K. And then we extract the desired branching fractions as followed. We begin with the uh, signal yield for uh, BD or BS to two muons. We weight that by the uh, acceptance times efficiency in, the, in, these, in this particular fiducial region, including information about the luminosity and the, the trigger selections. Then we multiply that by the branching fraction uh, for this um, well-measured channel B plus goes to J psi K times the branching fraction for J psi to two muons. We then normalize that to the signal yield for B plus goes to J psi K weighted by the efficiency times acceptance uh, for the J psi K um, observation. And finally, we multiply that by the ratio of hadronization probabilities of a B quark into uh, B, B plus versus BD or BS. A blind analysis is used with data for the di muon in the, in the range 5166 to 5526 MeV excluded until the selections are finalized. Uh, the selections use a multivariate analysis, a boosted decision tree classifier. Um, the reference there is B plus goes to J psi K and the control is BS goes to J psi phi. Uh, the events are separated into, into four classifier intervals for, for maximum fit sensitivity. The, the dominant background is continuum. Um, in this case, muons originating from uncorrelated hadron decays contribute to, to this background, and this is weakly dependent on, on the dimuon mass. Uh, partially reconstructed decays and peaking background also contribute. Uh, in the case of peaking background, this is the case where the, the B or um, BD or BS goes to two hadrons and both hadrons are misidentified as muons. The signal yield is extracted from an unbin maximum likelihood fit to the di muon distribution. And the product of this analysis of the 2015 to 16 data is then combined with the Atlas Run 1 results to produce the latest public result. Here's an example di muon invariant mass distribution in the unblinded data for one particular uh, boosted decision tree classifier. So you see the signal um, is, is extracted as this uh, red dotted uh, curve here. The likelihood contours for the simultaneous fit 
uh, to the branching fraction for BS to two muons on the horizontal axis and BD to two muons on the vertical axis uh, for the 2015 to 16 data alone are shown here uh, in the in the lower left. So you see the standard model um, the standard model value here, and you see this measurement uh, uh, from Atlas in the in the um, blue square, uh, in, and uh, you see the um, the contours. Uh, in, including in blue, uh, statistical and systematic uncertainties. That uh, result is combined with the one, run one result here. And you see uh, the, uh, the, uh, the new public result shown in the graph in the upper right-hand corner. Again, you see the standard model number uh, repeated uh, as, a, as a blue triangle. You see the 2015 to 2016 data um, central value exclusively. And then the combination of that with the run one result is the um, black circle here. And again, you see the likelihood contours. So the numbers for the 2015 to 16 data alone, uh, respectively, the branching fractions for BS and BD uh, are 3.2 times 10 to the minus nine and a limit at 4.3 times 10 to the minus 10. Then for the combination of 2015 to to 2016 run two data with the run one measurement, respectively for BS and BD, the branching fractions are 2.8 times 10 to the minus nine and a limit of 2.1 times 10 to the minus 10 at 95% confidence level. I show the expected standard model uh, values here, uh, 3.6 times 10 to the minus nine and a limit of 7.1 times 10 to the minus nine, uh, 10 for BS and BD respectively. And you see that the measurement is consistent within 2.4 uh, standard deviations with the standard model hypothesis. So in summary, Atlas presents here two recent results on heavy flavor production and decay, a measurement of the production cross-section of BC mesons relative to B plus mesons. I've showed you new data in, a, in an energy and fiducial volume region for which no prediction exists. And I've showed some indication of a PT dependence on the ratio. We also present a study of the rare decays of BS and BD into muon pairs. Um, simultaneous measurements are presented of the two channels that combine run one and 2015 to 16 run two data. The outcome is consistent with expectation from the standard model, differing from the expected central value by 2.4 standard deviations. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. So we still have a minute and a half for questions. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, just, just to make sure, uh, please, uh, since we are online, uh, introduce yourself before before uh, before oh, asking, okay. just to make sure I, that uh, we know that we speak. I raised my hand, actually. My name is Sheldon Stone. Yeah. I recognize your voice. Hi, Sally. I can even unmute. I mean, on video. Uh, I was wondering if you had uh, compared your BC fraction results at 7 TEB with the 8 TEB and 13 TEV measurements from LHCB. I mean, do they, are they consistent? Do they fit in? I don't have that number for you, but I can come back to you with that um, offline in Mattermost. Okay, thank you. Thank you, there is still a little time for a question. Okay, it doesn't seem to be the case. Then in that case, I would uh, suggest to continue in the agenda. So thank you, Sally, again for, for uh, the presentation. And uh, let's move to the next talk, which is given Oh, sorry, we lost given, you. Yeah, sorry. Which, yeah, sorry. So the next talk is given by Nisar Nelikumunen, and it's uh, uh, the topic is studio, study of BMBS uh, decays at, at Bell. So Nisar, please go ahead. Can you see my slide? Yes, we can see them. Okay, let me start. Thank you. So uh, I'm Nisar. Uh, today I'm talking on studies of uh, B and B subs decays at Bell on behalf of Bell Collaboration. So my first uh, subject uh, topic is uh, search for B subs to eta prime eta decay. 
So in standard model, uh, Chamless hadronic decay, uh, B sub S eta prime eta proceeds via tree and penguin amplitudes. And uh, penguin amplitude is uh, of special interest since they are uh, sensitive to beyond standard model scenarios. So uh, other uh, uh, prediction that motivate us to study this decay mode is that uh, the prediction that uh, BD and B sub S decays to uh, two body decays into the pairs of uh, eta and eta prime. If we know the branching fraction of uh, at least four of uh, these out of these six, we can extract uh, CP validating parameters using uh, formalism based on SU3 and U3. So far, only B sub S to eta prime, eta prime is measured, and all other uh, decay modes are measured, but uh, they are only upper limits are available or uh, they are either under study. So um, the expected branching fraction for this decay is. Uh, between uh, 2 to 4 in total raised to minus 5, then data. Uh, so we report the result of first search for B sub S to eta prime eta decay using a 121.4 uh, femtobahn inverse data collected by Bell Detect at Bell Detector at the Upsilon 5 s resonance. Uh, this correspond to 6.5 million B sub S, B sub S bar pair. Uh, Upsilon 5 s could uh, decay into like pairs of uh, B sub S and B sub S star and uh, this excite uh, is the best bar, uh, like either in their ground state or in excited states. So this excited is the best this is can could uh, transitions to ground state by emitting a photon. So uh, for this uh, analysis, uh, we exclusively reconstruct is the best to eta prime eta and eta prime decays to pi plus pi minus eta and both etas uh, decay to a pair of photon. To identify signal, we use a beam constraint B mass MBC. Uh, this is the uh, same as uh, the invariant mass where uh, the energy of B sub S candidate is replaced by half of the center of mass energy in E plus E minus center mass. Right? So this give a better resolution compared to invariant mass. And the delta E is the energy difference between energy of B sub S candidate and half of the center of mass, uh, beam energy in center of mass. So a 2D plot between MBC and delta is shown here, and uh, the three peaks are uh, corresponds to uh, three samples, uh, the origin of B sub S from which sample they are. So next, uh, in this analysis, uh, our major contribution of background events are uh, due to production of light quark pairs in E plus E minus collision. We call it as hadronic continuum. Due to large momenta of uh, this, uh, uh, light quarks, uh, they are like more look like a jet-like uh, topology uh, in contrast to our signal events where the heavy B sub S, B sub S bar are like even uh, are distributed more spherically. So we use uh, event shape variables to discriminate between these two backgrounds. And in addition, we have a background, we call it as peaking background due to background events with the uh, real eta prime. Uh, so this part is uh, in, uh, taken care by modeling this in our uh, PDF of, of the fitter. So likelihood ratio derived from modified Fox for frame moment, that's a event shape variable, to, is used to suppress the continuum background. The distribution of uh, likelihood ratio in signal and background is shown here. So we optimize this selection for the discovery of B sub S to eta prime eta and the uh, optimized value is uh, likelihood ratio greater than 0.95. This selection gives us a signal efficiency of 10% uh, while rejecting 99% of background. To extract signal, uh, we use a, a unbind extended maximum likelihood uh, with the MBC, delta E, and mass of eta prime. And signal and background shapes are uh, determined from uh, Bell Monte Carlo simulation. And to correct for the possible uh, data Monte Carlo difference, we use a calibration mode uh, uh, B0 to eta prime k short uh, at Upsilon 4 s resonance. So the projection, uh, signal region projection for 3D fit is shown in the bottom. And uh, we got in total 2.7 plus minus 2.5 signal level. Uh, this is uh, consistent with no signal. So we uh, proceed for an upper limit calculation. So the fitting model is validated using ensemble tests, uh, ensembles of uh, pseudo experiments. And these ensembles are used to prepare a 80% conference belt using Neyman construction. 
So 90% uh, confidence level upper limit on branching fraction is uh, estimated using this expression. This is same as expression for the branching fraction where uh, the, in the numerator, the signal yield is replaced with the uh, expected signal yield at 90% uh, confidence level. So we got a systematic uncertainty uh, of 19% uh, and upper limit on branching fraction is uh, 7.1 into 10 raised to minus five. Then uh, next topic, B0 decays to invisible final states and invisible final state plus gamma. So search for uh, B0 to invisible and invisible plus uh, gamma uh, decays are sensitive to beyond standard model physics. A uh, model with the uh, R parity violation and dark matter contributions predict a branching fraction as high as uh, 10 raised to minus 6 and 10 raised to minus 7. In standard model, B0 decays to nu nu bar and nu nu bar gamma is strongly helicity suppressed and uh, expected uh, uh, branching fraction is of order of 10 raised to minus 25. So a very low background from standard model uh, indicate that any signal for B0 to invisible and uh, invisible plus gamma in uh, our B factory uh, with a clean environment uh, would uh, indicate a new physics. So in this table, I summarize uh, uh, previous results from Bell and Babar. And uh, the most uh, stringent upper limit is from Babar studies. Then uh, for this analysis, we use a data sample of 711 femtobahn inverse uh, of Bell data at epsilon 4 as resonance. And this corresponds to 772 million uh, BB bar pairs. Uh, in BB bar event, uh, one B0 is fully reconstructed, we call as B tag, and we look for the signal in the remaining part of the event. So uh, either nothing or a photon, depend on which decay mode we are looking for, uh, in the remaining part of event is considered as a signal uh, candidate. So in total, we got a 1.4 million beta candidate uh, uh, by reconstructed from hydronic decay, decay channels using a improved uh, neural network based algorithm. The, uh, with this selection, uh, the reconstruction efficiencies for BTAG are 0.41 and 0.7 respectively in simulation respectively for uh, B0 to uh, invisible and B0 to invisible plus gamma. Uh, for the gammas in B0 to invisible plus gamma decay, we select only very high energy photons uh, with energy greater than 0.5 GeV. And after uh, BTAC reconstruction, events with extra tracks, uh, pi, uh, pi zeros and K-longs are rejected. Then the background, as in the last analysis, uh, our uh, major contribution of background is from uh, uh, the hadronic continuum, a production of light quark pairs in E plus C e minus collision, and we call it as a non-B background. Also, we have a generic B background due to decays through B to C transition. So we use uh, uh, two separate neural network uh, to uh, reject each of these background. The first one is to reject a fake B tag and the output we call as O tag. And uh, the second uh, one is to use to reject events with uh, jet-like topology. And uh, the output we call as uh, O shape. This O tag and O shape distribution for uh, both of our decay channels are uh, shown in this figure. And the red is signal and uh, green and uh, blue parts are uh, to non-B and the generic B background. To identify signal, we use a variable EECL, that is sum of all remaining energies of ECL cluster. Basically, this is the energy after the BTAC reconstruction, uh, the remaining energy in the now event is uh, in the calorimeter is the EECL. And uh, the expect, it is a strong variable and the expected signal is like, uh, should peak at uh, EECL uh, equal to zero. In addition, we use a cosine of uh, angle between two thrust axis in E plus C minus center of mass frame to is uh, used for uh, the fitting to extract signal. So we use uh, two methods to uh, extract uh, signal uh, for uh, two of our mode. For B0 to invisible, uh, we use a 2D fit with the uh, EECL and the cosine theta t. Uh, PDFs are uh, obtained from simulation except for non-B component. 
and uh, we use uh, uh, six uh, TK modes of control samples to estimate systematic and uncertainty. And uh, the systematic uncertainty uh, of the signal efficiency is uh, 7.9%. In the bottom, we can see the 2D fit result. And uh, in the table, I summarize uh, the yields for signal and background. The signal yields is consistent with no signal. Okay. So uh, we estimate a uh, upper limit on the banging fraction that is uh, 7.8 in total raised to minus five. Then uh, for B0 to invisible plus gamma, uh, we use a method of counting the signal events. Uh, so this mode is searched by counting events in the bins of uh, missing mass, uh, uh, which is defined as this expression in ACL signal box. So uh, the number of background events in the signal box is estimated from uh, the EECL data sideband multiplied by a scaling factor obtained from our Monte Carlo simulation. So the scaling factor uh, uh, give a uh, what fraction of the events in uh, sideband fall in the signal window. So in this table, we summarize uh, the our counting results for uh, the signal candidate in uh, all these five bins. And we can see that uh, the our counting result uh, for signal is uh, consistent with expected number of background in that signal window. So again, there is no significant signal. So the systematic uncertainty uh, is 8.4%. Uh, and upper limit on transient fraction is uh, 1.6 in total raised to minus one. Uh, this is the most gender upper limit that's better than uh, BABA result. Then in summary, uh, we present a preliminary result of a first search for the DKB subs to eta prime eta using full data sample collected by Bell at Upsilon 5 as resonance. In absence of a statistically significant signal, we put a 90% conference level upper limit and uh, its value is uh, 7.1 into 10 raised to minus five. Also, we report a search for B0 to invisible and B0 to invisible plus gamma decays using full bell data sample collected at Upsilon 4 as resonance. And we observe no signal and uh, the upper limit on the branching fraction are uh, 7.8 into 10 raised to minus five and 1.6 into 10 raised to minus five respectively for B0 to invisible and B0 to invisible plus gamma. And our result on B0 to invisible plus gamma is uh, more stringent. And uh, the result on uh, the B0 to invisible decays are published in uh, Physical Review D uh, this month. Thank you, that's all. Thank you, Nisar. So we have two minutes for questions. Maybe I would have one quick one on the slide 12. And you have shown the projections of, uh, of the fit. So the signal is the red curve, if I, if I understand correctly, right? Uh, yes, I think. So would it be possible to, to, to cut on ECL on the smaller values to, to get a region that is kind of signal enhanced? Or would it? This not? is not a, a signal enhanced plot, I think. Uh, well, I mean, the, the the relative signal contribution in this region is, uh, let's say, higher than in the other, uh, in the higher ACL value. So that's why I was wondering if cutting in this region would give any benefit, but maybe not. Okay. Yeah. You see this uh, long tail also for signal events. Um, uh, do you have an idea of what's the main contributor there in terms of like neutral clusters? Uh, for this, uh, you're talking about the slide 12, this plot? Yeah, the EECL, um, the signal. Um, no. Okay, so... Uh, we should we should go ahead. So again, if anyone has a question, please put them in the metamo so that Nisar can uh, can ask for them. So thank you, Nisar, again for 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 the yep. talk, and let's move to the next one, uh, which is um, uh, uh, actually the 
the first curry talk in, in the session uh, given by Siavash Nashapur, and it's about rare, B, rare BDK anomalies. So, okay, well, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, and do you see my slide? Yes, we can see. Okay, that. great. So first I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity. I will be talking about rare BDK anomalies uh, and specifically about finding new physics with uh, B2K star mu mu. Uh, as you're all well aware, in recent years, there have been several deviations or so-called anomalies with respect to standard model predictions in B2SLL measurements in branching ratio, in some of the branching ratio of uh, rare uh, semi-leptonic decays and also in lepton flavor violating ratio when having uh, decays of muons compared to decays uh, to electrons in RK and RK star. And uh, there are of course, uh, uh, there have been a number of deviations in uh, the angular observables of the B to K star uh, mu mu observables and most specifically the long standing anomalies in P5 prime or in another basis alternatively in S5. Uh, so uh, uh, recently in uh, March of this year, LHCB uh, updated the results with uh, 4.7 in rare time tomorrow of data where they, where they reported uh, 2.5 and 2.9 sigma local tensions in P5 prime as well as deviations in uh, other angular observables and bins of this uh, B2K star uh, decay, and this will be mainly uh, the decay I will be concentrating on in this talk. So from a theoretical point of view, in uh, to describe uh, the B2K star LL decay, one can uh, use the effective Hamiltonian, uh, where uh, the main contributions come from the semi-leptonic part, where short distance uh, physics of which include possible uh, contributions from new physics are described through this Wilson coefficient C7, C9, and C10, and the long distance contributions are shown with the form factors. But there are also contributions from the hadronic part of uh, the Hamiltonian. These have, uh, these contribute non-locally uh, to, uh, as they are collectively shown here as N lambda, and they all contribute to the vectorial helicity amplitude. And it should be noted that this is the same helicity amplitude where C9 and C7 contribute to. So in order to distinguish hadronic effects from, uh, from new physics in C7 and C9, one needs to have good control over these uh, hadronic contributions. And while these non-factorizable uh, uh, effects have been calculated as leading order in QCD factorization, uh, higher powers, so these H lambdas, are not calculable in QCD factor, factorization, and although there are partial calculations in uh, other methods and there are ongoing progress, but still these power corrections are really as, uh, guesstimated, I would say, and the significance of the tensions in the B2K star mu mu uh, observables depend on the choice of guesstimate made for these power corrections, these, these H lambdas. But Instead of making assumptions on the size of the power corrections, one can just parameterize them by general ansatz. So here, as given here, where plus, minus, and zero corresponds to the helicity. And so overall, one uh, has uh, 18 free parameters with this description. And with such a description, new physics effects in C9 are embedded in these type of contributions. And due to this e e embedding, one can do fits separate fits to new physics and hadronic contribution and statistically compare them via Wilkes test. So this is what we have done. Uh, first, uh, doing a fit to the Wilson coefficients and then a separate fit to these 18 free parameters, considering only the B2K star mu plus mu minus observables. Uh, and doing a fit for C9, we see that uh, there is an improvement compared to the standard model uh, description with six sigma significant. We can also see the effect with, uh, for the fitted, uh, for fit to C9 with this uh, red boxes, for example, at the observable level for S5. And 
Also, we have done a separate fit for the hydronic uh, contribution, and this also describes the data very well with 4.7 improvement compared to the standard model. But here we can also make a comparison between how, they, uh, how the new physics and the hydronic fit compare, and we see that the improvement of the hydronic fit compared to new physics uh, is not that significant. So it's only 1.5 sigma when adding 17 more parameters. And this can be understood partly by the fact that we have many free parameters which are not uh, heavily constrained. So for example, here for the real part of H plus, uh, we see that on the right hand uh, plot, we see where this red line is the leading order in QCD factorization. And here the uh, solid black line is the fitted parameter for H plus. And the dashed black line corresponds to the 68% confidence level. Uh, and so we see that uh, it is compatible with zero at one sigma level. And the reason is that we have just too many free parameters to get strongly constrained with the current data. And this is the case also for the real part of H minus and H zero, and also for their imaginary parts. And so uh, one way of having a better chance of uh, getting more constrained fitted parameters is just by considering a minimal description of these hadronic contributions with, free, uh, with fewer free parameters. Where here, uh, for each helicity, we, uh, we consider a different uh, delta C9. So in principle, assuming these to be real, we have overall three free parameters, or if we assume them to be complex, six parameters, and then we can do the fit again, the hadronic fit. And if new physics in C9 is the favorite scenario, then the three different fitted helicities should give the same value. So this can basically work as a null test for new physics. And doing the fit, we see that while the central values for the different helicities are not the same, but they are in agreement with each other within the one sigma range. And uh, since again, here new physics is, uh, new physics in C9 is embedded in this hadronic description as well. We can also do a comparison and we see that adding these hadronic parameters, so in this case, five more parameters, improves the fit only by 1.8 sigma. And this is a strong indication that the N new physics interpretation is a valid option, although uh, the situation remains inconclusive. So uh, what are the future prospects of such a statistical study for P2K star mu plus mu minus uh, observables? Now we have done, we have done uh, projections for LSDB results considering 14, 50, or 300 in the central bond data. And keeping the present central values, the three benchmark points won't give acceptable fits. So we will find very small p-values. Instead, we assume two extreme scenarios where we adjust the experimental data such that either in one scenario, the central value of C9 remains the same, and in another scenario where the central values of the hadronic fit remains the same. So in the first scenario, where C9 remains the same, we get, of course, very good fits for C9, and this is by construction. And we, of, we, all, we also get very good hadronic fits for all three benchmark, benchmark points, but there is no improvement compared to C9. And actually looking at the hadronic fit par, fitted parameters, we see that they have very large uncertainties, which basically indicates that uh, they, are, they are not needed. And we have done the fit also for the other extreme scenario where the hadronic fit remains the same. And in this case, doing the fit both to, uh, for, uh, for the hadronic contributions and also to new physics, we see that the improvement after round two, so fit 14 versus central model data is still inconclusive with four sigma, but it is only after the first LHTB upgrade that one can get conclusive judgment that new physics cannot be established with uh, the B2K star mu mu uh, decay. So I will also briefly uh, give an update of the global analysis of B2SLL observables. Here we have considered all uh, B2S transitions, all the relevant B2S transitions, specifically this update on B2K star mu mu angular observables and also this up, new upper bound on B sub S2 E plus C minus. Here we have assumed 10% power correction for uh, the angular observables. And uh, 
uh, in the one operator fit, we see that the most favorite scenario is new physics in C9 mu or in C left left in the chiral basis. And this is the same hierarchy as the pre-2020 LHCB uh, data, but the significance has now increased by one sigma for the most prominent scenarios. And the reason uh, uh, of this increase in significance is uh, due to large, just basically due to the update on B2K star uh, mu mu angular observable, where we now get a larger chi-square for standard model, and this can be understood by uh, realizing that the experimental uncertainties are now smaller. So these are the black crosses, the new results compared to the old data shown here with the uh, blue crosses. And also there are now uh, further tensions, for example, in the six to eight G within for the forward backward asymmetry. Uh, we have also uh, updated the set when varying all the relevant Wilson coefficients. So in, in total, there would be 20 relevant Wilson coefficients considering uh, separate uh, lepton flavors for electrons and muons, and also considering the chirality of such operators or the so called prime uh, operators. And here we now get, uh, we, uh, we now get uh, uh, the, some of the Wilson coefficients which were, which were previously undetermined. We have them now more constrained, and this is due to the upper bound of B sub S to E plus E minus. And, Again, the significance of the fit has increased by one, sing, uh, one sigma compared to the 2019 results. And this brings me to the summary, which I will not go through. Mm. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Sivash. So again, do we have questions, comments from people connected, especially our Tory colleagues? Okay, in that case, so let's thank you so much again for, 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 for the presentation. And I would suggest we move again ahead and continue with the, uh, with the presentations. Okay, so our next talk is uh, from Chris Poor about the rare Chandler case at LACB. So Chris, please go ahead. Yes, sorry. Yeah. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Perfect. Let's see the slides as well. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about um, rare charm decays at LHCB. Um, so the main um, analysis that I'm going to be talking about is um, a search for um, D to HLL. So here um, the D is a D plus or a DS plus. Um, and H is a positive charged K on or pi on, and then the Ls are some combination of charged leptons. Um, so this covers 25 decays. So this includes the lepton flavor violating and the lepton number violating decays. Um, at the bottom, you can see the full, the full list at the bottom of all the decays we search for here. Um, and the ones in pink are the ones which are allowed in the standard model, and then the others are disallowed in the standard model for some lepton flavor or lepton number related reason or both. Um, so topologically, these are similar. Um, however, the underlying processes by which these things can happen are quite different. So the aim here is to form a similar analysis on a wide range of channels so that we can get the maximum coverage out of this. Um, so why do we decide to study rare charm decays? Um, so in the standard model, these um, involve either flavor changing neutral currents or weak annihilation diagrams. And these are particularly interesting as they're forbidden at tree level in the standard model. And they're also CKM suppressed due to how small the um, elements are. Uh, um, in charm, these are suppressed yet further due to the GIM mechanism and the mass of the charm quark. Um, so in many of the decays where this is allowed in the standard model, we actually expect that across the entire um, phase space of the decay, 
that the long distance tree level contributions would dominate where instead of it decaying directly to, to um, the final state, it goes through some intermediate resonance like a phi. So in the bottom left, you can see a theoretical prediction for what the um, dimuon spectrum would look like um, in theta pi mu mu decays. And you can see that the resonance is spread across the entire phase space, whereas the non-resonant contribution, for, the non-resonant um, short distance contribution um, in blue is a uh, one or two orders of magnitude lower. Um, however, there's still a long way to go in the search for these decays and there's the potential for um, beyond the standard model things to um, have an effect outside of the range, which are currently dominated by resonance in the region where we haven't um, disproven that um, there's um, the resonance of the dominant contribution in the tail. Um, there's also a scope for a wide range of null tests in the standard model that have been talked about in quite a few papers, um, particularly involving various CP observables around the phi resonance. Uh, however, this analysis doesn't have these, in, um, but it would be an interesting thing to do. Um, for the other decays, um, there's the potential for uh, um, some beyond the standard model physics to come in. So in the bottom right, I show how you can potentially get a lepton flavor violating decay through a standard model neutrino, but because this is beyond the reach of any planned experiment, any of the beyond the standard model ones would have probably involve something quite interesting like a marrow neutrino or leptoquarks or something. So there's a lot of room for um, e either finding something very interesting or providing much tighter constraints. And because the processes by which you get to these final states varies quite a lot between the different decays, there's a lot of room for complementing other measurements here and providing a wide range of constraints from a single analysis. Um, so part of the reason why lepton flavor is so interesting is because um, there's quite a few results involving B to SLL transitions, which are intention in standard model. So while these are obviously quite a different process, it's there's an indication that something that we don't understand is going on with leptons and flavor physics. Um, so in the angular distributions of B to um, K mu mu decays, there's the P5 prime observable, um, which you can you see that the standard model prediction in orange on the middle plot on this slide um, doesn't agree with what the um, measurements are, which are the black dots. Additionally, we're also seeing that there's a lower than expected branching fraction at the low dimuon invariant mass for many decays involving eta s mu mu. So this has been seen across a wide range of um, experiments. And it's so none of these results are individually um, proof that there is something strange happening here, but together they're painting an interesting picture that will be interesting to continue to study. And it's interesting to see if we see any weird anomalies in the um, CTU LL transitions as well. Um, so why do we study rare charm decays at LHCb in particular? Um, so LHCb has got the world's largest sample of char charm hadrons. Um, many billions of charm particles have been successfully collected and we've got very large signal samples. Um, and despite the fact that um, a proton-proton collider is quite a difficult place to do um, flavor physics with the mess of background stuff that comes in, the excellent particle identification and momentum and vertex resolution that we do means that we can filter through all this background and make extremely precise measurements and take advantage of how large the cross sections are for these processes. Um, so in the past, we've got had some uh, nice measurements involving the including the observation of DETA HHLL, and then subsequently putting um, angular constraints on this decay. And this is continuing to improve in precision. And we also have the world's most precise constraints on DETA mu mu and DETA mu e. Um, and relevant to this analysis, LHCB did a previous um, study on four of the decays which are included here. Um, D to pi mu mu. And if you look on the bottom right, the Heverflavy flavor averaging groups um, plot shows that the LHCV measurements are more than an order of magnitude better than the previous best limits on these decays. So it'd be nice to include the other decays inside this and get more information about these decays. Um, so the analysis that I'll be talking about today was performed on HCV's 2016 data set. So there'll be the later, the rest of the run two data set that is still being analyzed. So this is 1.7 inverse femtobarns of data that was collected at um, 13 TV. Um, we, so as I mentioned, there are these long range distributions. So while these are um, somewhat of a curse of the analysis and that it means that you have to veto quite large regions um, of the phase space in the case where these happen, they also are quite useful in that we can use them as a normalization channel that is, uh, has very similar kin kinematics. It's got all the same particles in the final state, so it's very useful. Um, at the bottom, you can see what the um, muons and electrons look like. So 
the really striking thing here is that the resolution for um, muons, you can see like nice, well-resolved peaks, whereas for the electrons, the resolution is much worse. Um, the big problem here is that because electrons lose momentum um, to Bremsstrahlen radiation, um, we have to find some way of being able to form a correction on the electrons to correct to correct what their momentum is in order to reconstruct them correctly. So we can do this based on the color, the deposits in the calorimeter. However, it's quite difficult to get, get the correction perfect as where in the calorimeter the deposit ends up depends on where the photon was emitted. So there's a lot of combinations here and it's quite hard to get correct. So while we apply corrections, you still see that the resolution gets worse. And this is definitely something that'd be nice to improve. Um, so for our signal samples, we you, we do have quite a few backgrounds from various hadronic backgrounds. Um, in particular, for example, um, a D decaying to three pions looks very similar to a D decaying to three muons and happens at quite a high rate. Um, so we fit for those. Uh, we model the shapes of these using fast simulation samples, um, then introduce some smearing so that it can um, describe a slightly wider range of shapes and introduces some new parameters into the fit. Um, and then we extract the signal in a fit to the three body invariant mass. So this is the mass that would correspond to the D or the D um, esters. Um, so to come to the results, all of the results are consistent with the background only hypothesis, unfortunately. Um, however, if you look on the plots on the left, you can see that the green bars um, of the world's best limits prior to this result and um, then the other marks correspond to what LHDB's result is. So the blue cross is the expected limit, and then the other lines correspond to the median one sigma and two sigma intervals. So you can see that all of our observed limits are within the two sigma interval and kind of uniformly spread across as you would expect for a large number of measurements. Um, and the it's quite a significant improvement um, in a lot of the decays. 23 of them improved upon the previous world's best. And the largest improvement factor is a factor of 500, which is great to see. So in conclusion, there's 25 rare and forbidden charm decays have been searched for with no significant deviations. However, 23 of them improve upon the previous world's best limit. Um, there's many more analyses of rare charm decays in progress and coming soon from LHCB. Um, and also just to and promote this a little bit. The, we'll soon be entering the LHCB upgrade era where LHCB will be able to collect data at significantly higher luminosity while also taking advantage of triggering improvements that will um, give us more output bandwidth and a higher efficiency and a higher, um, better utilization of that output bandwidth. There's a huge number of chat talks. I've tried to put them onto a slide, but it's far too many to put on. Um, so I'm just going to refer you to the LHCB upgrade program for run three and run four, which refers to all of them. It's a great talk. Um, and this program should enable the first stage of the LHP upgrade to get down to the kind of 10 to the minus eight level. And then the run to the um, upgrade, LHP upgrade two will allow us to push even further. Um, thank you very much for your time. Is there any questions? Thank you, Chris. So are there any questions from people connected? Okay, I might have one quick, uh, for the slide seven, when you mentioned the difference in the reconstruction properties of muon and electron chance, there is also quite a large difference in the statistics. I guess this is due to the reconstruction thresholds. Is it a momentum or can you give us an idea what, what the difference is? So the other problem when dealing with electrons is not only is the resolution worse, but it's also much harder to trigger upon them because there are a huge number of deposits in the calorimeter from all the various things that come out of hadron-hadron um, collisions, whereas the muon stations can be used to get very high triggering efficiency. So it can become quite difficult to trigger on the hadrons while maintaining a low enough rate and a high enough efficiency. So the efficiency ends up being lower for these. Okay, so the efficiency. I was just wondering if there's yeah. a kinematic threshold as well or not. Okay. I uh, know the kinematics are not so different. All right. Maybe just just to, just to remind me, uh, what are the standard model predictions for for, for for these decays? I didn't see the number actually in the slides. Um, yeah. I don't remember what the number is, but it's a couple of orders of magnitude below what the current state is ish. I, I don't remember exactly. Okay. 
Okay, so any other questions or comments? Well, if not, then thank Chris again and uh, let's uh, move to the talk of uh, Bo Cheng about the radiative and uh, range and decays at best three. Yes, we can see the slides. But we cannot hear you. Are you muted? Could you hear me? Yes, a little bit faint, but we can. If you so can. Uh, that's to uh, read the mute. So um, I will talk about the radiative and the real time decays uh, for base 3. Um, here's the other line, and uh, I will introduce several analyses on the time real decay and the radiative decays. Uh, here is just the uh, BPC2. Uh, it's a double ring, E plus and minus collider, and the, the base 3 detector is located at this point. And, and uh, uh, the BPC2 has achieved its design luminosity at uh, 2016. Um, the bus three has has collected uh, uh, several time data sets for D zero D plus studies and the DSABS and the lambda C uh, at the different energy points. And we also have uh, approved the death taking plan uh, for about uh, seventy uh, inverse F bar data taking at three point W seven three GV in uh, future two years. Um, uh, here shows the. Uh, Oh, we already have the data sets at these energy points. We also have some uh, energy points around the uh, 4.08 GeV. Uh, for the uh, things we know that the D measures or D uh, or the lambda uh, balloon uh, produced by uh, in pair uh, at this threshold. You see, so double or single tag method can be used to uh, study the dimension uh, decays. Uh, if we use the single tag method, the branching fractions can be used, you know, can be calculated by, by this formula. And the double tag method, another uh, formula can, should be used. Uh, first, I'll introduce the uh, leptonic um, number violation decays in uh, D decays. We know that the leptonic peak number is conserved in the standard water, but we know that the neutrino oscillation shows the evidence for uh, uh, neutrino mass is not zero. Uh, there are many uh, new physics scenarios to expand the neutrino mass, and uh, such as force generation, uh, quark generation, and uh, some other uh, models. Um, uh, if we introduce the Majorana, Neutrinos, uh, it can, the, lepton, the lepton number can be violated, uh, such as it, uh, through this uh, Feynman diagram, and the uh, uh, lepton number violated uh, the changes to. Uh, here shows the, uh, we, we started the channels, the D0 goes to K pi, E plus, e pi, e plus channels. There are four channels, uh, three channels. And the Feynman diagram, diagram for the, uh, the process, process where the neutrino, uh, Majorana neutrino exchange so, uh, of Kabibo favored and the Kabibo uh, suppressed the channels uh, in this uh, uh, here, so here. And uh, uh, for this final stage, we use the single tank method to study uh, and the, the data E and the, the beam mass, uh, beam constraint mass are uh, calculated. And here shows the beam constrained in the mass for these three channels and we cannot find any significant signal. Uh, so we then determine the, um, uh, determine the upper limits for these uh, three channels. Uh, and all, all of them are at the level of 10 to minus six level. Uh, some of the, uh, it, some of the um, decays are the first searches and uh, some of the uh, are best limits. Uh, we also uh, can extract the mixing max matrix element uh, of the electron uh, and the, the Majorana neutrinos uh, by this formula. And here shows you the 
uh, upper limits on the uh, mass of Majorana neutrino, mass uh, neutrino uh, dependent uh, upper limits for the branching fraction and the mixing max element. And uh, uh, they are for the mixing max element, they are at the level of 10 to minus 3. Um, we also have searched for the real number violation. Uh, uh, in DB case, uh, we know that the uh, Boolean number is not uh, uh, like the Lepton number, it can be violated uh, in standard order. And we, uh, the excess of the matter over the antimatter requires the Boolean number violation. Um, uh, here shows the, uh, the, um, the Feynman diagrams. Uh, with uh, dimension six or some other uh, models uh, with the real number violation. Mm. Oh, for the first one is with, with that the uh, assumption of that the real number and the left number to be equal uh, to be and the, uh, the violation of the those numbers that should be equal. And then the other is that the uh, the the difference of these two uh, numbers should uh, could be. Uh, can be at the uh, can be at two. Um, we use the single attack method to study these uh, four ch uh, channels. Uh, for the D goes to lambda E and or D or lambda bar E. Uh, we can see that there is no uh, uh, obvious signals in this four uh, spectra uh, beam uh, for a mass uh, beam constrained mass spectra, and uh, we. I'm afraid we lost the sound. Hello, what can you hear us? Uh, we can't hear you. Uh, well, we, uh, our great interest for both the theory and the experiment. Uh, okay, we can now. Okay. okay. Yeah, um, we lost you for um, a minute actually on the on the previous slide. Oh, sorry. And maybe the network is not so uh, uh, so great for me uh, since I'm on a business trip. Um, and they, we, we, we know that the electronic decays can be used to extract the uh, TKM element or the decay constant. And so it's very important. And But the uh, background from the radiative electronic decays and for the uh, radiative leptonic case, we can um, find that they can avoid the helicity suppression and the long distance contribution can affect the decay rates. And so they um, predict the branching fractions for, uh, this, uh, for the decays is at the level of 10 to minus four. Uh, so, uh, and uh, the previous studies uh, of the D plus goes to come in neutrino, this has been studied. Uh, and uh, uh, we have uh, this is uh, analysis we have studied the uh, disabas goes to gamma in neutrino and with the 14 single tank channels uh, and the, we can see that there is no signif uh, significant signals for from the several distribution distributions of uh, from data and we can see that the, uh, we, we, we then determined the uh, upper limit of uh, this channel is at the 10 to minus 4. Uh, we then uh, search for the real semi electronic decays or disabasco uh, decays, and we can find that disabasco to uh, uh, blue number, uh, uh, blue uh, 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 final states only four final uh, three channels, and uh, the uh, disabasco to PV bar uh, in your channel come are uh, suppressed by the uh, phase space. Uh, and we use the three targets, uh, tag channels to uh, perform the, these studies. And we find, uh, do not find any signal in these channels. And the upper limit is determined to be uh, 10 to minus five, uh, four. Uh, at the last, we, I will report the double capable suppressed of DDKs and we, uh, uh, we have searched for the disabasic uh, D goes to K omega. Uh, uh, which can be more constrained to understand the SU3 flavor symmetry and its break effect. Uh, here is just the tags we used and uh, the 
uh, we can see a clear uh, omega from the pi 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 zero uh, invariant mass structure. Um, we then uh, performed a two dimension MB maximum likelihood to the uh, MBC uh, from the single uh, from the tag side and the uh, signal side and the uh, K pi pi uh, pi zero uh, channel uh, is observed and uh, it's about uh, 6.5 sigma uh, of the uh, 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 native uh, derivation from the uh, prediction. We can, uh, we can find it's uh, um, direct significantly. And uh, we also observe the K D goes to K omega channels. And uh, the result is consistent with the uh, uh, the prediction with the SU3 uh, uh, breaks. Uh, it's a break, uh, break effect. Uh, we also have studied the ACP. Uh, here, at last, I will give a summary of the, uh, uh, the report. We, uh, with the world largest time threshold data set, we have um, reported these uh, results. And we observed that the uh, double copyable surface that decay channel, uh, D goes to K pi pi zero for the first time. And uh, we, uh, since we have um, approved another 14, uh, 17 inverse F bar data taken at 3.73 GV, and we can see that there are more, many results are promising in the coming future. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Bo. Okay, so do people have questions or comments? The slides, the presentation? Okay, I may have a quick one. Well, not being much familiar with best three. Actually, if I look on, for example, on the on the analysis on slide eight or uh, or ten, uh, when, when you have uh, the fits uh, and, and the background, what, what, do you do you actually study the composition of the background, or this is purely coming from the data and uh, you do not attempt to actually simulate it or just wonder if you have an idea of what is the, the composition of that. Um, uh, the potential backgrounds are studied by several methods. First is the uh, data E sideband. And since we have defined uh, data E here, and we can use this sideband to study the backgrounds. And then another is, uh, we know that the uh, Monte Carlo simulation in the E plus minus colliders at the Tau Chang factory uh, are very uh, can precisely uh, describe the data. So the, um, the backgrounds can also be uh, very precisely uh, simulated. And the, we can use the inclusive the color samples to uh, study the these backgrounds, uh, and we can. Uh, in fact, in the analysis, we find that the uh, uh, inclusive the color sample can describe the uh, backgrounds very well. Okay, thank you very much. Right. Does anyone else have a question or comment? Let me check my terminals now. Okay, so then in that case, thank you Bo, again for, for, for the presentation of the results. And let's move to the last talk before the short coffee break, which is uh, even one Dracha Chiabip. And uh, it will present the rare and forbidden decays of, uh, of D0 SM. Hello. Um, right, I'm going to share my screen. Shall I start? Yes, yes, please. We can see the slides and hear you well. OK, so um, this is a talk about rare and forbidden decays of D0 mesons at the Bavar experiment. So um, the Bavar experiment, it's a B meson factory at the Slack National Accelerator Laboratory. 
uh, or there we collide electrons and positrons at a center of mass energy um, of corresponding with the 4s resonance and which almost instantly decays into pairs of B mesons. We collected data from 1999 to 2008 uh, with a total integrated luminosity of 424 inverse femtobarns on resonance and 44 inverse femtobarns off uh, below the epsilon 4s resonance. Um, with our collected data, we had around 500 million BBR pairs and around 600 million charm events uh, recorded and analyzed with, um, with our detector and uh, on which we performed a wide range of precision measurements. So, so today I'll be talking about uh, rare and forbidden decays, um, for example, uh, of D mesons. So specifically, we're, we'll focus on uh, charm uh, um, sector. Uh, for example, one of these rare decays D to K minus pi plus C plus E minus. This is, uh, this cannot occur at tree level in the standard model. Uh, the decay is dominated by this, these resonance contributions, as you've heard in previous talks, where you have, for example, here, uh, you have D0 going to K star rho. There are new physics models that predict the enhancements of the branching fraction to the four body decay. And LHCB recently measured um, D0, the muon equivalent and in, in the mass range corresponding with that of the rho meson. And there has also been previously reported upper limit by E791. Um, so this is uh, one of the interesting decays that we can look at and see if we see enhancements to the branching fraction. There are also uh, a series of lepton number violating and lepton flavor violating uh, the D0 decays. Uh, these are <clears throat> these are forbidden and lepton number violating decays are forbidden in the standard model. And there could be new physics enhancements um, that predict a branching fraction of order 10 to the minus six, which we could see with our current sample. They do exist. And other uh, lepton flavor violating uh, where either the uh, where you have D0 decaying to H prime minus H plus, L plus, uh, L plus, or you have a, an intermediate resonance D0 to X0, L plus, L minus. These are also suppressed to the order of 10 to the minus 50 and can be enhanced with new physics. There has been previous limits uh, praised by BEST3 and E791, and this is our first search at Vavar. So to start with, um, D0 to K minus by plus C plus C minus, um, we look for this decay, we measure the branching fraction uh, with, we measure it at a, as, as a ratio to the normalization mode, uh, D0 to K minus pi plus pi minus pi plus. Uh, we look for the D0 mesons and the decay of a D star uh, to a D0 pi plus. For our signal mode, we use uh, a, the full Vavar data sample, which includes an on-peak, so on the epsilon 4s, an off-peak sa uh, sample that's around 470 inverse femtobarns. And for the normalization mode, we only look at the off-peak resonance because uh, this has a high branching fraction and we get uh, a sufficient yield. So to reconstruct our signal, we use a four-track hypothesis. We apply puppy ID and the lepton ID and require four tracks per event. Uh, we use a, a Bremstrong energy recovery algorithm um, to the electrons. So look at clusters with uh, within the cone of the electron reconstruction and attributed them back to the electron itself. We cut on the D0 momentum to suppress backgrounds from uh, charmed BDKs. Uh, we require that we apply a vertex fit to the D0 and remove poorly reconstructed candidates. And to get rid of backgrounds where hadronic decays dominate, we assign uh, the leptons, a K on our pion mass hypothesis, and exclude candidates where the mass of the D or the mass difference of the D star are within, um, are close to the nominal mass. So then to extract our signal region, we define a two-dimensional signal region in both the D0 mass and the mass difference. And we extract the signal as uh, unbin maximum likelihood fit in two variables. Here you can see the projection in the mass um, and in the mass difference distributions. Uh, we see a, a signal yield of 68 events. Uh, for our signal mode, and this uh, the associated significance is 9.7 sigma, and we determine the branching fraction um, 
uh, to be of order four times 10 to the minus six, where the first error is statistical, second systematic, and the third is uh, an uncertainty due to the uh, branching fraction of the normalization mode. This electron mode is the first observation and it's consistent with the LHCB result for the muon counterpart. We also look in the, uh, in the mass range. Uh, so, so just to clarify, this is in the mass range between the row of the row meson, sorry, maybe I missed saying that, between 0 0.675 and 0 0.875 GeV. So if we look in that mass range, we do see in the projection using the S-plot uh, method, if we subtract all backgrounds, we do see a clear row zero in K star mass peak. Uh, our normalization procedure is cross-checked by using a hydronic decay with a known, with a known branching fraction, D to K pi. Um, we cross-check our normalization extraction using this mode. We also look in the full spectrum of uh, the mass of the two electrons. So you can see it's dominated by different resonances. For We look in the phi meson uh, mass region and we, for, we apply our same technique. Uh, we try to we fit to see a signal uh, in that mass range for the uh, electron pair, but we, do, we see no significant signal, but we uh, impose upper limits. We calculate upper limits on this branching fraction. Uh, we also determine the yield in the full continuous range, just above 0.2 GeV, because below uh, 0.2 GeV, the, the decay is dominated by this pi zero to EE gamma. Um, so excluding the resonances and looking at the continuum range, we also determine the yield and we find no significant signal and put branching fractions on the upper limit for this four body decay. So moving on, another uh, interesting decay is this uh, four body decay, D0 to H prime uh, plus, H, H prime minus H plus um, and two leptons. So again, these are lepton number and lepton flavor violating decay, depending on the charge of the lepton associated. Um, here H is a K on or pi on. And again, we look for D star decays, uh, D decay, sorry, in D star to D pi. Uh, a similar signal selection is applied. We look for five tracks and uh, we apply uh, PID um, requirements. We require that the D0 meson has a mass, has a momentum greater than 2.4 GeV and apply a vertex fit and remove, to, uh, remove uh, poor uh, candidates. We also reject hydronic candidates by hydronic sorry, we reject uh, hydronic backgrounds of the D0 meson um, by assigning the, a, a pi and mass hypothesis to the leptons and rejecting candidates that have a mass close to the D0 or D star nominal mass. Another peaking background in this decay is semi-leptonic charm decays where we've mis-ID'd one lepton or charm decays with additional tracks or neutrals. So for that, we train a Fisher discriminant. Um, we use nine input variables. Uh, D0 daughter track momentum, the thrust and sphericity of the D star plus, uh, R2, the Fox Wolfram moment, and the angle between the D star and the rest of the event, sphericity and thrust axes. All the, the, all the channels are normalized to uh, uh, hydronic DDKs, where we choose the number of, of kaons in the normalization channel is uh, equivalent to that in the signals channel. And we define a signal region that varies based on the number of electrons. Um, that's because of the Bremstrong uh, decays vary the mass resolution of the D. So for modes with zero, one, and two electrons, the mass, uh, the signal region is defined as follows. And also for modes where we have one or two kaons, uh, our delta M and the mass difference of the D star also varies. So we have different uh, defined signal regions per mode. And then we fit, uh, we extract the, uh, the normalization mode with a two, bin, uh, a two extended unbind maximum light cleot fit in both the mass of the D0 and the delta M distribution. But for the signal, we just use a one dimensional uh, fit to the, to the delta M. Here you see the nine, uh, sorry, the eight different modes on the right hand side. These are for modes with one or, or zero kaons. And on the left-hand side, you see four modes with two kaons for the different uh, lepton number violating, lepton flavor violating modes. As you can see, we, we don't see a significant signal in any of the channels, 
but we do, we, the signal yield is consistent with zero, but we do extract uh, upper limits on the branching fraction. Uh, the measured limits uh, for each mode, as shown here, are between one to three orders of magnitude more stringent than previous results. <clears throat> okay, so, and, and the last decay I'll, I'll present today is this, also this lepton flavor violating decay, D0 to an intermediate resonance, E plus mu minus. So here we search for seven lepton flavor violating decays. Again, in the uh, this is a D0 decay where, <clears throat> sorry, D star plus goes to D0 pi plus. Um, and here the X0 is either pion, K short, K star, rho, phi, omega, or eta. The signal again is normalized to a hydronic D decay depending where the number of kaons in the signal mode is equivalent to that in the normalization mode. Um, we use a very similar selection to the non-resonant lepton flavor violation mode that I just presented, but uh, there's a different track multiplicity depending for modes where we have a pi zero or an eta decaying into two pions. We require only three tracks per event. The, the mass of the X zero for each of these um, and resonances is required to be within three times the reconstructed RMS width. And then we reject uh, backgrounds using a BDT with the following input variables. So here we have the low momentum, the momentum of the lowest um, track, uh, which is an X zero daughter or track or photon, um, the maximum angle between the D and the D star, uh, the total energy deposited in the, in the, calorimeter from all the tracks and clusters used in the reconstruction, the X zero mass, and then the ratio of the D star momentum to the, uh, to the D star, uh, to the momentum determined from subtracting the beam energy from the mass of the D star. Um, for modes with the pi zero or um, um, omega, we use the uh, mass of the pi zero, momentum of pi zero, and the energy of the photon with the lowest uh, uh, energy from a pi zero. Um, as also additional discriminating variables in the BDT. Uh, we, we select the best D star plus candidate uh, based on a chi-squared of the vertex fit. So here the signal region is defined in a delta M distribution, uh, delta M region as defined here. And the mass of the D0 varies for each of the modes. Uh, it ranges between five and 21 MeV uh, beyond um, around the nominal D mass, and that depends on the resonance. We do an extended unbind maximum likelihood fit to the mass difference of the D star to extract the signal yield. Um, we use a CRIF function for all, si all signal channels except uh, the modes with the phi meson, where we use a two piece Gaussian. The signal yield here is consistent uh, with zero for all modes. You can see here we have. Um, two eta modes where eta goes to gamma gamma and eta goes to pi plus pi minus pi zero that's at the bottom left um the remaining modes for the phi omega and, and other resonances on the right hand side we also see a signal consistent with zero so we uh, we then um here also i show the the normalization modes uh, this is the d delta m distribution for the different normalization modes with two one and uh, zero kaons respectively as shown from left to right. Um, here we extract the, the branching fraction and 90% upper limits. The upper limits that are determined in this analysis are one to two orders of magnitude more stringent than previous uh, results. And you see for some of these modes, um, the specific uh, eta decay, there were no previous upper limits. So, um, in summary, uh, we have reported the first observation of the rare D meson decay, D to K minus pi plus E plus E minus. Uh, the branching fraction is of four times 10 to the minus six uh, with statistical and systematic uncertainties in the mass range, uh, which I forgot to add. Um, and that's consistent with the LHCB result uh, in the corresponding muon channel. It's in the mass range of the rho meson. Um, improved, we also determined improved constraints on nine lepton number and flavor, lepton number violating and three lepton flavor violating uh, D0 decays. And the improvement is by one to three orders of magnitude. We also looked for uh, seven lepton flavor violating decays, uh, the form D0 to X0 E plus mu minus. 
um, and we improved existing constraints by one to two orders of magnitude. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. So I see there is a question from Raul again. So please, Raul, go ahead. Uh, so we have to unmute. Let me check it. Raul, can, can you unmute? Uh, I see you want to raise a question. Yes, yeah, so, sorry, I, I, ah, it, yeah. it, it, it was uh, my mistake. Sorry, no, no, sorry. No, 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 I mean, I, I didn't want to, to ask something, just it was. Ah, okay, <laughs> I see. Okay, sorry. Sorry <laughs> for that. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's fine. Okay, so anyone has a question? <laughs> Maybe I would have a quick one uh, at the very beginning uh, when you mentioned that uh, the normalization channels are taken from uh, just from the off-peak uh, uh, yeah, uh, luminosity. Uh, does it have a, uh, does it have any effect on the kinematics, uh, or do you have to co correct for that? Or I was just wondering why not taking some let's say similar fraction of proportion from the on peak and off peak uh, for the normalization event and just take every tenth event or something like this yeah my understanding is that the, the there were there was no corrections that were needed to apply in the kinematics uh, comparing the two um, but the branching fraction uh, in just in the off peak luminosity you get an a large enough yield so you can see maybe i have the yield somewhere for like you, you get a large number of candidates just by looking at the normal at the off peak. So this is a different uh, analysis, but if you look at the bottom, you can see you get thousands of events uh, just by looking. So there's a big branching fraction. So um, yeah, okay. I guess there's no need. Okay, I see. Yeah. Thanks. Does anyone else has questions or comments? doesn't seem to be the case. So again, thank you, Dracha, for, for the presentation. And now we have a short uh, break, uh, basically around six minutes. <laughs> yeah, so for, for, sorry for the for, for the uh, for these breaks to be so short, but unfortunately, the agenda is very packed. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Bye. Okay. So we will basically reconvene at uh, 1737 as, as stated on the agenda. Does anybody want to test their connection? Now would be a good yep. time. Thank you, Then It's a good point. Well, since we're there, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi. OK, hi. Very good. Thanks. So I think that's it. Let me just check if my video is working. Yes, I can see you, and I guess you can try sharing your screen. Ah, yeah, that's a good idea. So if I do the share, and then desktop. How about now, Ops? Yes, I can see it's fine. Great. OK, very good. Perfect. So that's it then. Does anybody else want to try? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, and I will try sharing. Okay, go ahead. Can you see the slides? Yes. Thank you. Uh, maybe try making them full screen? Yes, sure. Yes, it works. Great. Okay, thank you. Hi, this is Sony. Can I try mine? Yeah, go ahead. All right, but is that yeah. okay? Yes, I can see them fine. Great. All right, very good. Thank you very much. No problem. Hello, this is Shimiz, and can I try to share the screen? 
Of course, just wait till the previous speaker stops his sharing and now you okay. can go ahead. Okay. Okay, do you see my screen? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you very much. So I suspend the screen. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Okay, Pavel, it's 5.37. I stopped sharing my screen and I think you're free to uh, call on the first speaker. Okay, hello, can you hear me? So I will... Uh, I wait, will... wait, just uh, wait for uh, the conveners, please. Yeah, uh, sorry, Dan, that's, actually, that's... Karim is the other convener for the session. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, my, our mistake, we should have told it. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I guess we can uh, resume the session. Uh, today we have now in this session five talks about Keon physics and two talks about uh, spectroscopy. And uh, uh, since, okay, the, 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 the agenda is quite packed, I kindly remind uh, the speakers to stay in their allocated time. I will uh, uh, flash uh, on the slides uh, the, the, the missing minutes, uh, like five and two uh, minutes. So please, uh, the, the, the first uh, talk is Amarit Soni. Uh, 
uh, we'll uh, discuss about the recent progress uh, from uh, the count. Uh, so please, uh, Amarit. Hello? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. I cannot hear anything. How about now? Yes, now, yes, please go on. All right, so I'm gonna talk about some uh, recent uh, results from Kaons. And uh, uh, these of Kaons, of course, have a long history and giving fantastic results all, over the decades. And uh, I can't seem to move page down. I think you have to exit full screen. Sorry? You maybe need to exit full screen. Sometimes oh, yeah. it happens. Okay, exit full screen. Uh, all right. Okay, yeah, so here are our outline. I'm gonna remind you of some of the old stuff and then go to the new ones. As you know, it uh, started out with the the chaos, uh, there are two Nobel Prizes for BNL. One is for parity violation and the other for CP violation. And then there is a KK bar mixing, which is a fantastic phenomena. And it gives rise to a very important consequence of this quantum mechanical mixing is the K long, which uh, lives for macroscopic, uh, and travels macroscopic distances. And uh, this, uh, you know, was extreme, it became an extremely powerful tool for experimentalists. And <clears throat> it led to the discovery of CP violation, first discovery of CP violation in 1964. And a very important consequence of this quantum mechanical mixing is the, that the two kion states are very close in mass and maybe like 10 to the minus four or 10 to the minus 14 in terms of normalizing to the mass. And another important consequence of this kion mixing is the, in, in the, <clears throat> that it provides an extremely stringent constraint on, on, um, um, on um, beyond the standard model. And this turns into, uh, we can convert into lattice calculation of uh, um, B parameters, and which can, which then go into constraining the, uh, through the measurement of uh, indirect CP violation, position constraint, the unitary triangle. So this is just a reminder of the delta MK constraint, a very, uh, as I said, um, measured extremely precisely experimentally. Unfortunately, theoretically, uh, the calculation uh, has at the moment about 50% error. This is because it has long distance pollution, long distance coming from pi pi intermediate states or operator product expansion cannot be performed. So you cannot use it as a, a precision tool and it has not been used all these decades. But now in the last five, seven years, our collaboration, RBC, UKQC lattice collaboration has made lots of progress in taming these and is the third generation student beginning Wang now working. And the calculation at the moment has errors of order 20%, no longer 50%, and we are making all kinds of checks. So another year or two, uh, this will become useful as another constraint being able to use experimental data. So this is uh, the reminder of the two states. If CP was exactly conserved, there is K long and uh, K short, and one of them will go to two pi and the other will go to a three pi. But, um, and, and then the, the small mass difference gives rise to the very, very long lifetime because of the one of the is face is pressed to three pi and the other is two, two pi. And this led to the CP, CP uh, violation discovery. And it was found that key long does go to two pi and, key, and, and, and just like a, a two times 10 minus three in the amplitude. This is the indirect CP violation phenomenon. And this is a, uh, 
left, right, and this is the constraint coming from the uh, delta S equals to Hamiltonian. In the standard model, there are two W's exchanges, the box graph, and an explicit illustration was done decades ago in this uh, Greg Bell's thesis. And it was for the left right symmetric theory. In left right symmetric theory, one of the gauge bosons is, uh, is the right handed gauge boson, the other is the standard model gauge boson. And uh, unbelievable, just because of the current now, because no longer left left, but left cross right, which is not fuse invariant, it led to uh, the ma mass of the very massive right handed gauge boson. And this is the origin of the flavor and secret puzzle of the beyond the standard model. So this uh, enhancement comes from a factor of 20, just factor of two and three is coming, four of them all together. It's a phenomenon. This is a reminder of the uh, hierarchy puzzle and the flavor puzzle. And in most theories, like in uh, Randall Sundrum, which is a very beautiful theory for flavor, <clears throat> you see that, and also in suji like theories, because of the presence of these right-handed currents, uh, the constraints become very powerful. So now I go to uh, talk about K2 pi and delta I, I school half and epsilon prime. This is the recent results from the lattice, RBC, UK, UK QCD collaboration. This is the reminder of the delta I school half rule, which is okay, as you change the down quark to the S quark, down quark to the U quark, uh, the lifetime change by a lot. This has been a puzzle for decades. And uh, so now this is the, uh, direct CP violation and the route for experimentalists is to measure that K long goes to charge pion and K long to neutral pion. And they, these are both CP violating, so it's a minuscule difference and is expected to be very, very small compared to 10 to the minus three. It took decades to measure and eventually it was a for 10 to the minus six. The most important reason for going after theoretically for calculating epsilon prime is because of naturalness. CP is violated, it's not a symmetry of nature. We know that since 1964. Therefore, naturalness arguments are compelling. They say that if you write down a theory, there is no uh, reason why the phase has to be zero. So the new phases, so the theories have to be accompanied by a CP violating phase. Of course, there are other reasons, but they're not as powerful. For example, baryogenesis. So this is a theoretical route for calculating the KD2 pi, it, it, it requires calculating in the same non perturbative framework, six quantities, imaginary and uh, I, I equal to two and I equal to zero imaginary real parts and the phases of I, I equal to zero and I equal to two strong phases, delta two and delta zero, all six quantities. And in, it's normalized to indirect CP violation, uh, which is 10 to minus three and the measurement after decades I will show uh, is about uh, epsilon prime is of our 10 to the minus six. Very, very small quantity. They were sensitive to new physics. So this is the, my career in lattice gate theory started with wanting to calculate epsilon prime long, long ago. This is like a 19, started about 1983. This is the first lattice conference I went to with the intent to calculate epsilon prime on the lattice. And so there have been like a dozen graduate students over the years, and it's extremely challenging calculation, many mistakes and many, uh, you know, puzzle, many uh, obstacles have to be overcome. And of course, lots of people in the community have contributed to this kind of a phenomenal project. So this is a monumental experimental achievement, but it should be recorded. There were two experiments, one at Fermilab and one at CERN in modern times. It took about 20 years, but the lattice work actually started earlier than that but they were very difficult situations. So anyway, it's a standard calculation framework. You have to calculate the matrix sum of 10 operators to get the real and the imaginary part. And you have to calculate them to all orders, um, matrix sum of these four clock operators between K and two pi to all orders because it's non-perturbative. And the only method that you know of is the lattice to do it from first principles. First, First attempt was to use Carter perturbation theory. If you can do that, then you can reduce the pro problem by factor of a, in difficulty by hundreds of times. So you just reduce one of the pions. Unfortunately, the trouble is that in those days, it's around 84, 85, uh, the, the, on the lattice, Carter perturbation theory does not exist. It was very, very, you know, in a four dimensional lattice. So we started thinking of uh, other uh, applications and B physics came to mind and there were four, four or five theses and all of those put down how to use the lattice for B physics where the chiral symmetry was not as important. <clears throat> and 
it led to the modern day unitary triangle. And you, these days, every quantity uh, here is with error of less than 2%, except for some other planning form factors as a function of Q squared. So the first breakthrough came around 97 uh, with two, um, Tom Blum and I wrote two papers in introducing the idea of fictitious fifth dimension to win all quarks. And this on a finite lattice gives rise to chiral symmetry. So the kaon and pion physics could be done in a very systematic fashion on the lattice. And second breakthrough for KU2 pi came from a paper from Lelouch and Lucier, who showed how to calculate directly KU2 pi from finite volume correlation functions without using Carter perturbation theory. So those are now used, and they tell you this formula relates uh, lattice calculations to the continuum, and uh, those, those are being used for the last uh, 15 years or so. This is our result from 2015, and in which we calculated all six quantities that I told you before. The result was we got a central value for epsilon prime around 1.4 with very large errors. It was about, it was consistent with the measurement given their 16.6 .6 times 10 to the minus four at about two sigma level. But, but in, in addition, we got, of course, the death size for half full, uh, real A0 and real A2 and all that compatible with experiment. There was one difficulty. So before I go into that, the unique aspect of this calculation is within this calculation, all six quantities are being calculated. So the real A0 and real A2, those exper are experimentally known, the phases are known. And if you don't do all this along with epsilon prime, then you have to worry if the, there is some problem in the calculation. So this is the reason we do all of them. Several of the quantities are measured from experiment. Imaginary A0 that are imaginary A2, which require epsilon prime determination are not known from experiment. Okay, so the difficulty in this 2015 calculation was when we do the phases, they were off from Carter perturbation theory by about two sigma. So that was all we could do with those computers that we had in 2015. We had 216 gauge configurations. We tried to do the best we could. So in the last several years, we have uh, had gigantic, you know, uh, more gauge configuration by uh, working uh, in, over several continents. And instead of 216, we have 1440. We have analyzing about 700 of them. <clears throat> we also improve the calculation of bases, in particular, including the sigma-like operators and, and as a result of those, uh, we first uh, now have um, major improvements in our result. This is the delta is called half rule in which the main point about this that I wanna show you the key is that the enhancement actually is an unnatural cancellation in the, in the three half channel. The n square term where n is the number of colors and the n term tend to cancel n is equal to three when the pion mass is physical around 140 MeV, the two terms cancel to 80%. Uh, this cancellation is unnatural. If you go to slightly heavier masses, we show on the lattice that cancellation gets much reduced. So now I go to imagine as you know, this is our paper. We, we do the lots of systematic checks. This is a two state fit and three state fit. And we, you know, they're essentially compatible. The central values we take from the two state fit. Okay, so zero, these are all the graphs are calculated and these are the results. This is a summary of the results. We're compatible with the size for half rule. And also the epsilon prime is compatible with the experiment, real is zero and I'm out of time. The uh, isospin electromagnetic effects are, we don't have at the moment. We take from Peek and um, Vincenzo Cirilliano, they are a recent paper. And we, this is the unitary triangle, epsilon prime in the horizontal band naturalness. So because the errors are around 30, 35%, we have to reduce the errors and we are working very hard to do that. So this is not a conclusion the naturalness breaks down or anything like that. Sometimes you have to work very hard. So anyway, we're working that hard in the next three to five years, we're going to try to uh, improve these errors by reduce these errors by factor of two. And we are also trying to do independent calculation, totally different way, because this is a very treacherous calculation. All right. Thank you very much. I, I think I took uh, more time than I needed, was allowed. Thank you, Amrit. So any comments uh, or questions from the audience? I don't see any. 
Okay, maybe I have a quick question. Uh, so re regarding, uh, you have discussed mostly about Epsilon Prime over Epsilon, but do you think there is uh, any other experimental, uh, uh, let's say measurement, uh, which uh, could be uh, interesting uh, I mean, for probing uh, uh, the lattice QCD uh, results? Well, the lattice QC results are being, um, you know, checked against experiment for many of them, but they are not in such a complicated calculation. This, this is a very uh, complicated calculation, and I wish other lattice collaborations would start doing these calculations now that it has been demonstrated. Uh, there were some efforts uh, in, in Japan from, you know, but uh, uh, we hope very much that they will uh, they, you know, they needed more, com somewhat more computing power. And I, I hope very much they will do. And once we have demonstrated this like uh, in the last five, six years, uh, I don't doubt that other will do it. But as I said, we are trying to do a totally independent way in the last two, three years. In another two years, we'll have results from an independent way of doing also. Okay, thanks a lot. So I guess uh, we can move on. I don't see any other comments or question. And if you have, please uh, go to the Mattermost uh, channel. So uh, thanks again, uh, Amarit. Uh, Thank now you. we go on with uh, Nuboshiro Shimizu, who will uh, give us some updates on the Kelong 2.0 Nunubar uh, measurement at the Koto experiment. Yeah, good night and good evening. And this is Shimizu from Koto Experiment. And this time I would like to report about our recent progress of the analysis of Kelong to Pfizer New New Bar Decay. And uh, the goal of our project is to search for new physics via uh, uh, Kelong to Pfizer New New Bar Decay mode. This decay mode is heavily suppressed by the standard model, and the branching ratio is predicted uh, to be uh, three times 10 to minus 11. And its theoretical prediction is very precise, just the, uh, uh, it has a large sensitivity on the new physics beyond the standard model. And Koto experiment is conducted at J Park, Ibaraki, Japan, using 30 J uh, proton accelerators and Koto detectors, as shown in the left figures. And uh, Koto is a collaboration having uh, 13 institutions and more than 60 people are now working for the uh, uh, Pfizer New New Bar analysis. And this page shows a uh, 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 schematic view of the experimental method. Uh, protons are accelerated up to 30 JEP uh, and uh, hit to uh, gold target. The uh, produced huge K long. Uh, transported in the KL beam line, and uh, it is uh, transported to uh, decay regions of the Koto detectors. And the decay of the Kelong is observed by Koto detectors. The signatures of the Kelong to Pi Zero New Bar decay is two photons from a Pi Zero, and nothing, since neutrinos are not detected. And for two photons, uh, heat positions and energies are measured by the CSI calorimeters, and the decay volume is surrounded by hermetic beta uh, counters. And to reconstruct uh, the event, uh, we assume a uh, pi zero is produced on the beam axis or the axis, and invariant mass of two photons from nominal uh, invariant mass of two photons form nominal mass of pi zero. And the events are analyzed in so-called the BT, PTG 2D correlation plots, where horizontal axis is uh, reconstructed the vertex positions, and vertical axis is a transverse momentum of the pi zero. And signal region is defined in this 2D uh, plot, and uh, blind region, uh, uh, and this region is blinded before determining the selection criteria to avoid human bias. And last year uh, in autumn, before uh, the uh, conference of K on 2019, we uh, determined the selection criteria. The obtained single event sensitivity was uh, approximately uh, seven times 10 to minus 10. And this corresponds to the standard model uh, events of 0 
and we uh, unmasked the blinded regions and found four events appeared as shown in this uh, figure. And after unblinding, we reinvestigated our analysis from the beginning, uh, including uh, minor ones, we first evaluated almost all the decay mode of the K-Long, and uh, this uh, capital N corresponds to the updated one. And uh, fortunately, we concluded that uh, such decay, minor decay modes did not uh, have significant impact on the expected number of the uh, background. And in the software, uh, we found that there was a mistreatment of the application of cuts. And since we decided the selection criteria uh, or procedure to define this cut uh, before opening box, so we, and did not give any tuning on the selection. That's why we uh, decided to update the cuts. And with this treatment, a number of the uh, appearance event was changed from four to three. And uh, also uh, by investigating all the backgrounds, we realized that there was a new item we missed. And that is a charged K on contributions, uh, and which is actually a dominant background of this table. And let's see what it is. How charged K on contributes to this Python union bar analysis. <clears throat> now this figure shows a, a, a schematic view of our beam line. And uh, actually, we have three pink magnet in the middle of our beam line, and the charged particle are basically removed by this. But uh, if K, uh, K long interacts uh, in the collimator downstream of this sweeping magnet, uh, because of the charge exchange, there may be a chance that charged K on is produced in the inner wall of this collimator. And uh, actually, the, uh, according to JANT3 based beamline simulations, uh, the produced charged K on flux uh, was uh, predicted to be. Uh, uh, 1.6 times 10 to minus 6 compared to the KL flux. And of all these uh, K plus decays, uh, K E3 of K plus uh, has a dominant uh, contributions. And since uh, this decay mode has a larger PD of the pi zero and uh, positron or electron can be soft. For this reason, uh, the expected number of background is 0 0.33 in total from uh, all the charged K on the case. But uh, it is important that this number has a systematic uncertainty. So uh, for this reason, this year in May to June, we decided to take data to measure this K plus minus flux. And we developed a new trigger scheme to accommodate the decay of charged K on and also we installed a prototype new charged counter in the upstream region, and this will be explained in later. And at the same time uh, as Python new new bar data, we collected uh, K plus data, and uh, this uh, corresponds to the new one we have just collected. Uh, of all uh, charged K on decays, we uh, first decided to measure uh, K plus decays to pi plus pi zero. Since this branching ratio is high and sufficiently uh, 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 efficient uh, in our, for our detectors. Uh, so Koto detector is specially designed for the detections of neutral particles, but we can actually reconstruct this decay mode. Uh, at the trigger stage, we first import that the number of the clusters in the CSI collimator is exactly three. And uh, for two neutral heats in software, we uh, uh, calculate uh, the reconstructed position of the pi zero vertex, uh, which is same as the uh, uh, pi zero new new bar uh, analysis. And for charged heat, uh, since Koto uh, uh, detector does not have a tracker and we cannot directly measure the momentum. However, we can measure the position of the heat on the CSI collimator. And assuming the PT balance of the momentum of uh, pi zero and charged pi on, we can calculate uh, uh, the momentum indirectly. Uh, so uh, by this method, uh, we can reconstruct uh, K plus to pi plus pi zero decay and calculate the invariant mass of two pion system. 
the events are studied in the 2D correlation plot, where the one variable is reconstructed position of pi zero, and the vertical axis is invariant mass of the two pi on system. The signal region is defined in the uh, two dimension plot as shown in this blue rectangle. And the selection criteria is basically determined by the Monte Carlo study before this data collection. And the signal acceptance is enough high uh, to be approximately four times 10 to minus fourth. And as a reference, uh, the acceptance of the K long to three pi to decay mode is approximately 20 times smaller than this. So from this fact, you can uh, imagine that how efficient this decay mode is. And the background which can contribute to this uh, pi plus pi zero is uh, K long decays to pi plus pi minus pi zero decay mode, whose branching fraction is 30%. And actually, they uh, populate in the low mass region as shown in this figure. And the purity of this uh, signal is enough high, and which is uh, much higher than 90%. The middle figure shows the obtained 2D correlation plots after imposing all the cuts uh, for the data collected in this year's uh, data collections. And in total, we uh, collected more than 800 events uh, in the signal region. And the left figure shows the projected invariant mass uh, distributions of uh, two pion system. And the green distribution is from uh, K long to uh, pi plus pi minus pi zero, and empty uh, histogram corresponds to pi plus pi zero. And as you can see, the K plus Monte Carlo distribution well reproduces, uh, reproduces what we observed. Also, left figure shows the reconstructed momentum distributions uh, of uh, events inside the signal region. And we can also see good agreement between data and Monte Carlo. And not only for these two distributions, but also other distributions, some of them uh, in backup slide, uh, but are uh, very well reproduced by uh, K plus decays. And in terms of the shape of distributions, the K plus decays nicely explain what we observed. But uh, the K plus flux relative to uh, well-known K long flux was larger than uh, Monte Carlo by factor of three. And this was we observed in this uh, year's run. Based on this feedback, we updated the background table for 2016 to 18 analysis. Uh, however, we still have homework in the estimation of K plus background because uncertainty of the Monte Carlo simulation can be divided into two sources. First one is the systematic effect from the K plus flux itself, while the other is a systematic uncertainty of the acceptance of the K plus decays. Uh, though uh, I couldn't explain the detail of in the pre presentation, but uh, we also collected K plus control sample uh, by turning off uh, the mentioned sweeping magnet. And so using data, we will study the latter systematic uncertainty. And this is actually ongoing. So uh, though we haven't uh, fully finalized the table, but the tentative uh, total number background uh, is shown in this uh, table. And uh, the total number background is now 1.05. Now we found that there is a uh, really charged K on in our beam line. And next uh, homework is to how to control this background. And as a matter of fact, as I mentioned, we installed a prototype new charged beat counters in the upstream region of cotton detectors uh, just before this year's run. And the name is uh, UCB, upstream charged beat, as shown in the red circle here. And uh, the purpose of this UCB is to confirm the existence of K plus and two bit of K plus, which is uh, of course now important for the future data collection. And the design of this detector is shown here. And the sensitive region is composed of one millisic plus concentration fibers and MPPC detects the photons. And the right figure shows the uh, UCB energy deposit information for the event in the signal regions. And uh, <coughs> Uh, we can observe MIP peak structure in the distributions. 
And if we define the heat uh, by half a MIP, uh, then we uh, can uh, observe uh, whether the event in the signal region has heat. And red events with red marker correspond to uh, the events uh, with uh, UCB heat. And actually, we found that 30% inefficiency exists, uh, but they can be explained by limited coverage of K plus halo and limited sensitive region of sensation fibers and noise fluctuation due to the irradiation of MPTC. And uh, to reduce inefficiency, uh, and we are now developing a new UCB. And for the limited coverage of the K plus halo, we plan to enlarge the chamber. Uh, and also for the limited sensitive regions uh, of the scintillating fiber, new scheme will be planned. The uh, cross-sections of the uh, scintillating fiber is shown here, and each part is not uh, sensitive. That's why we are planning to uh, arrange the uh, scheme of the uh, fibers. And also to uh, reduce the noise from MPPC itself, we will uh, keep uh, distance uh, of the MPPC from beam core to avoid the irradiation. Uh, in summary, a uh, uh, quota experiment uh, such as new physics by a Kelong to Pfizer New New Body K and by analyzing 2016 to 80 analysis, we realized that K plus background was dominant. However, we uh, need to estimate the systematic uncertainty of the Monte Carlo simulation, and we uh, did uh, the, uh, we collected the data for K plus to Pi plus Pi zero data, and the measured flux was three times larger than Monte Carlo simulation. And uh, based on this, uh, we updated the background table, and uh, we are planning to publish uh, this result uh, uh, in next order. And to suppress uh, child chaos, uh, new UCB detector is uh, now uh, developed. So this is all from Shimiz. Thank you, thank you very much. So we have time for a quick question. Is anybody from the audience who would like to have uh, this chance? I don't see anyone. Ah, yes, I see Daniel, please. Hey, so I wanted to ask you a couple of things regarding the rest of the events that uh, you have uh, in uh, your detector. So, so now you're mm -hmm. claiming that you have you had four events. Now three remain after the new cuts, mm -hmm. but what I remember from previous talks is that two of those events had funny properties. So one of them had a weird pulse shape, and another one had activity in your charge. Just outside of it. So, what, yeah, exactly. what are you guys going to do with those? Did you make a decision on what's your take on those events? Yeah, actually, for such a, a, other, uh, other events, we are now trying to understand the properties. And uh, yeah, yeah, please wait for the uh, uh, progress uh, from now. Actually, we are now uh, uh, intensively working for this. I see. And the and yeah. the charge current back if the charge K on backgrounds that you have, can they also explain this fifth event that is right outside of your signal region? Right side. Uh probably yeah, that's possible. Yeah, since the distribution of the charge K on uh is consistent with this shape. So yeah, that's possible. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, for any comments or questions, please uh, use the Mattermost uh, channel. Uh, now I think uh, it's time to go on. So now we have uh, Radoslav Marceski uh, reporting uh, new results on the K plus, 2 plus neutrino, antineutrino at the N62 experiment. Hello. Hi, Rado. Let me try to share. Okay, sharing is done. Can you see the slides now? Yes, let me I will uh, tell the you the time. Yeah. Full screen. Is it working? Yeah. Okay, so I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to show the evidence for the decay for the K plus to pi plus mu bar from the NA62 experiment at CERN. Uh, so the pine new bar is a flavor changing neutral current process that is an S to D transition and has the highest CKM suppression. 
It's theoretically very clean as it is dominated by short distance contribution. And uh, the hadronic matrix element governing K to pi transition can be measured with a sub percent precision from KL3 decays. And the standard, standard model predictions can be found uh, here uh, in, in uh, this paper. And um, so the uncertainty is dominated by uh, parametric uncertainty. So here I list uh, uh, various models that uh, can be sensitive to the pi nu nu branching ratio and can give a contribution to it, uh, ranging from uh, three level flavor changing neutral currents mediated by a Z prime or uh, models with lepton flavor universality violation. Um, with NA62, we use a K on decay in flight technique for the first time to measure the K plus to pi plus nu nu bar decays. And we have collected about 2.2, 10 to the 18 protons on target in our uh, run one, which uh, spans from 2016 to 2018. Uh, NA62 is located in the north area of CERN and takes uh, 400 GeV protons from the CERN SPS and, collide, and we collide them in a, with a beryllium target, uh, creating a secondary beam of 75 GeV with a 6% of it uh, is K plus that we're interested in. Then the K plus are measured by our detectors upstream of the fiducial uh, decay volume, followed by a 60 meter long uh, decay tank where the K plus decays. And we have a set of detectors that are used to detect the pi plus and to, and are used to identify the pi, pi plus and to make the measurement. A quick reminder of our previous results. In 2016 and 17, we observed uh, respectively one and two events. And you can see the, in the publication more details on the analysis. With the last one, it uh, was recently published and submitted uh, to JHEP, where we put a 90% confidence level very close to the standard model value. And we'll see what, what we will have in 2018. The analysis strategy is simple. We have one track in, one track out, and our main kinematic variable that we use is the square missing mass. And uh, we look inside uh, those uh, two signal regions denoted on the plot below. The main K on decay backgrounds uh, are uh, having uh, branching ratios that are about uh, 10 to 11 orders of magnitude larger than our signal. So the, in NA62, we must have a very strong muon and pi zero suppression, better than seven orders of magnitude, an excellent time resolution of about uh, 100 picoseconds and better, and a kinematic suppression of 10 to the four. So the signal regions that are um, shown on this plot uh, can remain uh, free of background, and uh, the signal over background ratio is good, so we can make the measurement. We have done important improvements uh, from our previous analysis with respect to our previous analysis. Now we use uh, seven separate categories where the definition of those categories depend on hardware configurations. We have two samples in 2018 with different uh, hardware configurations and uh, in bins of momentum. The selection is optimized separately for each category that allows us to have an improved signal sensitivity with respect to our uh, 2017 analysis. We use a multivariate analysis for our particle identification and the upstream background rejection. And this is how the data looks like in 2018 after uh, applying the full selection. And you can see here the various control regions that we use to validate our background prediction uh, on the side of the KMU2, K2 pi, and K23 charge pi on peak regions. They're very important to, to, to validate our background predictions. We normalize the pine, the pine new measurement to the K plus to pi plus pi zero decay, which is very important because it has uh, a kaon and a pi plus in the final state. So allows important cancellation of systematic effects relating to the, to the pi plus and to the K plus as well. And uh, we have about 6.5% uh, uh, uncertainty on the single event sensitivity. And as an example here, you can see one of the um, uh, variables that enters in the single event sensitivity computation, which is the random veto induced by our pi zero rejection procedure. With the black is the total uh, random veto, depending on uh, the intensity. And we are sitting in NA62 at a, in 
2018 at about 450 megahertz. As a, the background from Canon decays, I give here an example of uh, the K plus to pi plus pi zero decays. So to estimate the expected number of uh, background events in the signal region, we count the number of pi plus pi zero, so the number of events in the peak region after the complete selection. And we multiply by the kinematic tails, so the fraction of pi plus pi zero that uh, should enter the signal region. And for this, we use control k plus pi plus pi zero data to study those tails. And you can see here the region one, region two on both sides. So the same procedure is used for k plus to mu plus neutrino and the k3 pi backgrounds. While for the KE4, the estimations are done entirely using Monte Carlo simulation and normalized to the single event CST. The last background that is the most important one is the upstream background, which is uh, or background from upstream events. Those events are coming from pions produced by uh, upstream of the fiducial volume by either early K plus decays or interactions of beam particles with the beam spectrometer material. The detected pions are then associated to an accidental particle from the beam line, and they can be very dangerous if, if coupled with the pion scattering in the first spectrometer chamber. You can see on the plot the projection of the detected pi plus by our spectrometer at the beginning of the fiducial volume, and you, see, you can see that they mostly come from the aperture of the last beam line dipole. So to suppress this background, chaos pion association and geometrical cuts are effective, and we use uh, data to validate the background estimation and to produce the background estimation in signal regions. So in total in 2018, we expect 7.6 standard model events and a total background of 5.3 with the main contribution coming from the upstream background more than 50%. All of those background expectations are validated in control regions using a blind procedure. And you can see the results for the K on the case here. We have six samples the same uh, and the regions are the same as uh, the one shown uh, previously. And you can see that there is a very good agreement across all samples. So the numbers speaks for themselves, speak for themselves. And uh, additionally, we have a set of data samples defined by vertex signal region criteria, uh, signal selection criteria to uh, validate the K plus to pi pi e nu decay background, background estimations and the upstream background estimation. And you can see here also that the agreement is quite good across all samples. Here, what I want to stress is that the sensitivity of some of the control samples are uh, comparable to the single event sensitivity as we expect the number of events comparable with what we expect for the signal, which proves that we have a sensitivity to observe very small signals, which is very important for uh, such a rare search. And here now it's time to open the box. So this is the two regions blinded and here come uh, here they're unblinded. So we observe 17 events that are consistent with the, the, so their missing mass and momentum distribution are consistent with what we expect from the standard model signal, which can be seen as the shaded uh, background area showing where the acceptance for signal lies. And you can appreciate this even better by doing a projection integrating over the full pi plus momentum and looking at the missing mass squared. So here the signal is uh, uh, normalized to the standard model expectation. And you can see that the data events in region one and two and also outside in the background regions are in quite good agreement. So to obtain the branching ratio, we use eight categories, nine categories. And we use a maximum likelihood fit using the signal and background expectation for in each of them. So we have two samples with different hardware configuration in 2018. The first one, which is called 2018 S1, has 80% of the data set. And it has six 5GV wide bins from 15 to 45 GV. And then we have the second sample S2, which is only 20%, but this one is integrated over momentum because it doesn't have the statistical power to split in categories. Then the 2016 and 17 data sets are added as separate categories, and they are also 
everything is integrated over momentum and you can see the expectation. So here, those are only the expected signal and background. There is no fit included here. And this is the result. So the branching ratio for the K plus to pi plus nu nu bar from the NA62 run one is 11 plus four minus 3.5, 10 to the minus 11. And is dominated by statistical uncertainty of the Poissonian fluctuation of the expected number of events. Then we have added all the, all the expectation from all categories together to test the background only hypothesis. And we can reject the background only hypothesis at 3.5 sigma. So the significance of the signal is 3.5 sigma. And to put this in a historical context, uh, context so this is really uh, comes after 50 years of experimental effort to detect the K plus to pi plus nu bar decay. And you can see here where we are. So we can finally start making a more precise uh, comparison with the standard model expectation with NA62. And here you can appreciate the improvement with respect to previous results. And also the correlation with the branching ratio of the K long pi plus nu nu bar together with the exclusion limits from Koto. And I let uh, for the amusement of the audience to compute the Grossman near bound using our experimental results. And we let uh, to our Koto colleagues uh, to push the branching ratio of the neutral mode below this boundary. So in summary, then 62 I presented then 62 results from the complete run one. And the branching ratio is 11 times 10 to the minus 11, which is the most precise measurement of the branching ratio obtained so far. And the result is compatible with the standard model prediction within one standard deviation. NA62 will resume data taking in 2021 by doing important modification of the beam line by installing additional beam spectrometer station and another VITO counter to reduce upstream background and enhance further the sensitivity. And we will also have a new calorimeter downstream of the muon VITO system and upstream of the beam dump to further suppress K on decay background. And you can find more information in the addendum that is the, if you click on the link there. Thank you. And this is the link after the meeting, whoever wants to discuss or during the coffee break, uh, you can ask me questions or in matter most also. Thank you. Thank you, Rado. First of all, uh, congratulations for these uh, beautiful uh, results. So uh, any comments or questions, please? Yeah. Hi. Hello, please. Yes. Can I, can I ask uh, about the weighted average with the uh, Brookhaven experiment? Sorry, which weighted average? Your new result plus the Brookhaven. Uh, well, there is no yeah. weighted average. This is only our result independent on the Brookhaven. No, I understand. I understand, but but you you know you, you could try taking the weighted average, right? Yeah, we can, but uh, for now we I mean here we prefer we didn't uh, attempt this. Okay, we would rather just go with uh, with our because we have to also understand the differences between the results. And here we are only interested in let's say showing what we get, and then the other is a matter of interpretation a bit. Okay, very nice. Thank you very much. Okay, so if there are no other questions, maybe Rado, you can uh, tell us uh, some more, something more about uh, the prospect for the next uh, data taking. So the main emphasis on the next data taking is uh, to reduce the background as much as possible and to allow for the relaxing of the selection so we can gain more signal efficiency. And as you can see here on the plot, sorry, on the table. So the dominant backgrounds are the K to pi plus pi zero and the upstream background. And uh, those two, so the upstream background should be reduced significantly by the improvement of the beam line and adding a fourth uh, beam spectrometer station and also adding additional VITO counter to detect those events. And uh, then there would be another detector that should help to suppress further the pi plus pi zero. So the main aim is to reduce at least by a factor two the total background so we can get even better sensitivity and allow for a more precise measurement. 
Okay, thanks a lot again. Uh, if there are no other comments or questions, uh, I would uh, move on and then uh, please uh, use the Mattermost uh, channel if you have uh, more comments uh, about this. So now uh, the next talk uh, is uh, still uh, on uh, NE62 uh, new results. Lubos, Lubos Vision uh, will present the new measurement of the K plus pi plus uh, new mu uh, the, uh, rare decay. So Lubos. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. And can you see the slides? Yes, yes. Good. Uh, okay, so uh, how do I put this away? Uh, okay, so I will present the, the new measurement of the k plus two pi plus mu mu minus uh, at NA62. So as you can see on the slides, uh, on slide two, the the history of Kion experiments at CERN is briefly summarized here. And uh, you can see the NA62 as the most recent Kion experiment at CERN at the bottom of the list. So apart from the main measurement, the trenching fraction of uh, K plus two pi nu nu, it allows for other searches of, of forbidden decays or, or also heavy neutral leptons, axions, dark photons, and so on but also it allows for precision measurements uh, of uh, K and decays. One of these measurements is uh, the measurement of K plus to pi plus mu plus mu minus, which was also measured by NA48 slash 2 before. So uh, since Rado already told, told you something about the beam and detector, I will only briefly summarize the detectors that are uh, most important for the present analysis. So we use uh, KTAC as a Kion taker, then downstream spectrometer to reconstruct the three chart tracks. Then we use the hodoscopes chart and NA48 chart for timing uh, conditions, and then uh, LKR and MAF3 uh, for particle identification. So from the theoretical point of view, the, the PIMU mu is uh, also a flavor changing neutral current decay and is uh, dominated by one virtual photon exchange. And uh, together with the electron mode, uh, measuring both per properties of both decays allows for tests of lepton flavor universality. Uh, and the decay, uh, differential decay width can be written in terms of two Dalit variables, X and Z. And the Z uh, uh, is explicitly uh, present in the decay form factor W. And for this measurement, we chose the parametrization that you can see in the, in the box at the bottom. Uh, so it, it contains parameters A and B. And uh, so I will go, briefly go over the, some overview of the analysis. So we want to measure the form factor parameters A and B and from them compute the model dependent branching fraction of the pi mu mu. So in order to do this, we need to choose a normalization decay for, for the measurement. And the natural choice of this is the K plus two three charge pions. The, the reasons are, is, are that the decay is uh, abundant and uh, schematically very similar to the um, pi mu mu, to the signal decay. So the data was collected using two trigger streams uh, that ran in parallel. The, the, non, the normalization sample was co collected using the multi-track trigger downscale by a factor of 100. And the pi mu mu decay, uh, the signal sample was collected using daimion multi-track trigger, which is similar to the multi-track trigger, but it also contains two muon condition in, in level zero. And the downscaling for this trigger was only two. So this allowed us to, to collect the sample size that we actually did, as you will see. And the trigger efficiencies uh, for, the bo for both trigger streams are measured to be around 90%. So for the normalization sample, uh, the, the data used in this analysis was collected in 2017 and 2018, and it corresponds to around 6.8 trillion uh, K on decays. The, both, both normalization and signal selections uh, share uh, several cuts or several conditions. Uh, this, these involve the, the 
vertex fitting using strut tracker, then timing cuts involving hotoscopes, gate again reach, and then also uh, electron uh, and positron background suppression using straw tracker and uh, LKR. The final cut on the in the normalization selection is a cut on the three pion invariant mass, as you can see on the plot in the plot on the right. And we see around 20, uh, 280 million uh, K3Pi decay candidates in the signal region. Um, and with very little, very small contamination, mostly by K3Pi gamma, as you can see also in the plot. Uh, regarding the signal event selection, it, it, it proceeds by, via the same uh, generic three track selection cuts. And then on top of them, there's a particle identification applied to identify the pions and muons using MAF3 and LKR. And uh, additional kinematic cuts are also applied to reduce the K3Pi background as much as possible. Uh, so again, the final uh, selection cut is to cut on the invariant mass of the Pi Mu Mu. And we see around 28,000 events in the signal region af after this final cut, which is around nine times more than NA48 slash two. And the background contamination is practically negligible, sub per mu level. Okay, so, so having collected the signal and normalization samples, we can proceed to the form factor fitting uh, procedure. This, this is achieved by reweighting the Z spectrum, reconstructed Z spectrum of the Monte Carlo events to best fit the data. Technically, this is done by minimizing a chi-square function as a function of A and B. And you can see the result uh, of the best fit in the plot on the left and also the corresponding A and B are shown uh, in blue. The second local minimum is, is, uh, can be seen in the, in the first quadrant of the, of the AB plane and it's shown in the, in the box on the bottom right. Uh, however, it seems that, that uh, the, the negative solution is uh, preferred at least from the statistical point of view. So regarding the full error budget, uh, you can see it on this slide in the table on the left. So the, the most, the two dominant systematic errors are coming from the reconstruction efficiency and the accuracy of the beam and pileup simulation. And uh, on the right, you can see the, the, best, the position of the best fit in the AB plane uh, together with the 39 and 68% confidence level contours. So comparing the, the, the result that we got from, from our analysis with, uh, with previous results, uh, you can see the comparison in, in this slide on the two, in the two plots. On the left is for the parameter A and on the right is for parameter B. Uh, the first two points are the pi EE, so it's the electron mode, and the second two points are the muon mode, muonic mode. Uh, you can see that that indeed all four points are in agreement and also the electron and the muonic modes are, are in agreement. So, so at least from this result, we, we see uh, no te tension in the lepton flavor universality. And this brings me to the summary. So, so NA62 collected uh, physics data between 2016 and 2018 and the present data analysis was performed on 2017 and 2018 data sets combined. This corresponds to around 6.8 trillion K on decays, and uh, a sample of around 28,000 pi mu mu event candidates was collected, which is nine times more than NA48 slash two. And uh, we measured the, the form factor parameters AB, and from them we computed the model dependent branching fraction of pi mu mu, and you can see the, the summary uh, of the preliminary result at, uh, in the table at the bottom. That's all from me. Okay, thanks a lot, Lubos. So we have uh, some time for some questions from the audience. I see Bob. Please. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I just wonder. Okay, since you measured the pi mu mu, you you should also have a pi e, right? Uh, In your, your plot, do you actually have a? Yes. For pi e. Yeah, we. I think we have pi e, e, but but it's not the statistics that is that is uh, uh, 
uh, competitive with respect to the previous ones. Oh, really? I see. Uh, the previous ones, A65, they have about 10,000, right? I think the, the, the biggest biggest problem is, is, the, is the trigger that... The... I see. Okay. I got it. Sorry? No, I think I got it. You, you said the aesthetic wise uh, is due to the trigger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I understood what about it, not, not I got it. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, any other comments uh, or questions to Lubos? Okay, if not, uh, so maybe you can tell us uh, something more about uh, the prospects uh, about reducing uh, or better estimating uh, the dominant systematics. Yeah, sure. So, so as you can see from the table on, on this slide, the, the two dominant systematics are the reconstruction efficiency, which is actually dominated by the spectrometer reconstruction efficiency. And uh, there, are, there is currently a method under validation that, that should improve the estimate of the, of the systematic uncertainty, uh, but it's currently just being tested. Uh, and uh, regarding the second largest uh, systematic uncertainty, it's the beam and pileup simulation. And this one is dominated by, by the accuracy of the simulation of muon halo. And that's actually a larger work, but, but there's work ongoing to, to, to improve, the, uh, improve the accuracy of this, of this simulation. So, so this, once we improve the accuracy, we should, we should also lower the the systematic error coming from that. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, so uh, if there are no other comments or questions, I would propose uh, to move on. So thanks again, Lubos. Sure. Hi, Karim, can you hear me? Yes, oh. ciao, Mauro. Okay, good. I can try sharing the screen. Yes, please. Okay, tell me if you see the screen. Yes, yes, yes. Fine. So whenever you, you want, I'm ready. Please start. Okay, so I will report you on the latest results from the NA48 slash two experiment. It's a couple of uh, camera rail decays and form factors. So the experiment uh, was run during 2003 and 2004, so more than 15 years now, but we're still producing interesting results, mostly in uh, K plus radiative decays. Uh, the experiment was made about 100 physicists from 15 institutes in eight countries uh, around the world. And the particular thing with this experiment is that, on the contrary, on an A62, where we only have K plus, we were having at that time a simultaneous K plus K minus beam, which allows the experiment to uh, study mostly CP violation in K, in K plus decays. So, this was the main aim of the experiment, but Together with this, we collected two 10 to the 11 charged count decays, which are a very good sample to study ray processes and relative decays. So the energy was a little bit lower than it was. It is now with an A62, it was just 60 GeV, with a very good precision. And the experiment is rather similar to an A62, but with some differences. For example, we were having a, a drift chamber spectrometer instead of the present uh, strobe spectrometer with a very good uh, momentum uh, measurement uh, with 1% precision. And then the same krypton calorimeter was used uh, as it's used now from an A62. And then there were a muon veto and a hadronic calorimeter to complete the experiment. Basically, we report about studies of color perturbation theory. So color perturbation theory is an effective way of treating uh, low energy QCD. And in particular, what can be obtained by counts is the constants which are involved in the L4 DS equal one Lagrangian. So this can be developed in a series where you have coefficients and operators, this NI and WI coefficients. And most of those, these coefficients are unknown or poorly known, but they can be measured by using k relative decays. There's a work by Ambrosian collaborators, which shows uh, how this can be measured. And you can see, for example, in the table in the uh, lower part of this slide that uh, we already published a lot as an A48 slash two on this topic. For example, pi LL, which we all were hearing before also, pi gamma gamma, 
which is also useful to access some of these variables, and k plus pi, plus pi zero gamma, which we also published in 2020, uh, 2010. And then in this talk, we, we will hear about pi plus pi zero e plus and minus. So you see that this allows us to access mostly the uh, NA14 to NA17 constants. So combining those results, one can extract these constants and, and improve the predictivity of the current perturbation theory. So I will report about the first observation of the pi e decay. So the pi e decay is uh, very recently developed for being a count decay because the theory goes, dates back to 2012 by the Ambrosian collaborators. And this offers a various opportunity to, to perform chiral tests. One of the most important is that measuring K plus, K minus, uh, K plus to P plus P zero gamma, it was observed that discrepancy in between the sign of the interference with respect to the theoretical prediction by vector the meson dominance. And using pi plus pi EE, we can confirm or uh, disprove the sign of this uh, interference term. Then there are also interesting parity violation observable and charge asymmetry that be, can be measured in this uh, channel, which are expected to be larger than in other channels. Using pi plus pi zero gamma, theoretical prediction can be uh, done for the various terms because the pi pi EE can proceed through different mechanisms. One is the inner Bramstralum, where you have basically um, gamma, off-shell gamma radiated by the pions or the kions in the initial state, or you have the genuine pi pi E, where you have a gamma radiated at the vertex, which produces the pair. And what we are interested in is mostly this direct emission part, which is the one containing the N515 to 17 combination, which is what you want to measure. So basically, based on the measurement of pi pi gamma, one can predict that the direct emission is roughly 1% of the total, and then the interference is very small, 0.4% and negative. So this is a strongly constrained final state because we have five particles. We have a pair of plus and minus, which are coming together, and which allow us to measure a further determination of the decay vertex by tracking back the two uh, uh, charge track. Then we have a couple of photons coming from the pi on decay, pi zero decays, and with also with this one, we can reconstruct the vertex of decay vertex. And then we have a single pion. So we, we have two kinematic variables that we can use to select this uh, kind of decays, which is gamma gamma mass, which should be equal to the mass of the pi zero because the two gamma are coming from the pi zero decay and the mass of pi gamma gamma EE. So the total mass of the event, which is compatible with the current mass because this is coming from a current decays. So using all these constraints, it's, uh, it can be selected a very clean sample. As a normalization channel, we use the very similar decay, which is pi plus pi zero dilates. So where the pi zero, instead of going to a pair of gamma, it goes to an electron, positron, and a gamma. This kind of decay is also very uh, easy to select, and it's also very abundant. And here, the precision is limited by the fact that the, the branching ratio of the pi zero dilates is known to 3%. So this will be a limited factor in this measurement, but the sample is very big. So here you see on the left plot, uh, the signal normalization sample, which is the pi plus pi zero dilates decays, where we have more than uh, 16 million uh, candidates. So we have a very precise measurements of the luminosity by using this uh, sample. And on the right, you see the signal candidates together with their background. So we have a sample which is 4,900 roughly, so near to 5,000 events with a background which is just 5%, so it's very small, and mostly produced by pi plus pi zero, pi zero dilates. From these samples, we could extract the first branching ratio measurements for pi plus pi zero plus and minus, which was never observed before. And the branching ratio is according with theories 4.2 10 to the minus six with a precision of uh, roughly 3%. This has already been published last year in physics letter B, you have the reference here. So the error is actually dominated by the external error on the branching ratio of the pi zero dilates. So the precision could be even improved when the pi zero dilates measurement uh, will be improved. We have a very good uh, agreement with the prediction by the Ambrosian collaborators because they predict 4.22 for the total branching and we have 4.23, so it's a very good agreement. We also attempt, even if the statistic is limited, to measure the, the direct emission magnetic component, which is supposed to be something like 
and we obtain the 1.14 plus or minus 43. So as you see, this statistic is limited and it's not a precise measurement, but still it is a first evidence of the existence of the direct emission in this channel. And we also had uh, an indication that the, the interference could be negative as it was already measured by an A48-2 for the pi plus pi zero gamma. We also investigated the CP variation asymmetry with some precision, which is uh, just 2% because of the sample the high, uh, size, which is just 5,000 uh, tenths. Uh, let me move to KL3 form factors. These semi-leptonic form factors are useful uh, tools to uh, determine VUS. You can see from the formula on the top of this page that uh, there are several inputs that we have to measure. The red inputs are what we call theory inputs. So these are calculations that are done from theoreticians, but there are in blue some experimental inputs which are needed. One is the branching of the KL3 and the, the lifetime of the KL of the kaons. And then there is this IKL, which is the phase space integral of this, uh, of this decay. And this has to be calculated, but it, ne it needs uh, uh, form factors. You have two kinds of form factors, the F plus squared, which is the vector form factor, and F0, which is the scalar form factor. These two form factors can be extracted by two different semi-leptonic decay of the kaon. So the vector form factor is typically in the pi plus E plus neutrino, which we call Ke3 uh, from now on. So Ke3 allows you to access the vector form factor while the, the muonic channel, so the pi plus mu plus mu minus neutrino, so the Ke3 allow you to access both the vector and the scalar form factor. So to, need, to have a full determination of this IKL, so this uh, phase space integral, you need to measure both K3 and K3 together and get the form factor values. This form factor have theoretically been parameterized in different ways. So we have the quadratic uh, parameterization, which is simply a Taylor expansion as a function of this L parameter. So we have lambda prime and lambda double prime. Then we have the pole parameterization when we have, where we have basically a pole at the vector mass, which is the mass of the raw star. And then we have this dispersive relation, which is more complicated in exponential uh, parameterization. We explored all of the three uh, parameterization in the paper of by an A48-2. Here you, you see the samples that we collected. So on the left, we see the sample of K3, which are roughly 4 million of K3. These were collected in a three-day special run we performed in 204 with a particular trigger configuration, which allows us to maximize the acceptance for those decays. And on the right side, you see the KMU3 sample, which is still a couple of millions of events. So in both cases, we have a scale of a million events to do these measurements. The measurement is, is made the way, this way. We generate Monte Carlo Davids plot with a fixed value of the form factor, which we call LGN so far. And then we can test different form factors by reweighting our Monte Carlo, changing the values of these form factors. And then we minimize the sky square that you see in the bottom right part, which basically maximize, minimizes the difference in between the data, the backgrounds, and the Monte Carlo with different kinds of form factors. And the best form factor will be the one giving our the best to us the best sky square. So I go fast in, through all of these slides. Here you have listed all the results for the different parameterization of the form factors with their statistical precision and systematic precision and their compatibility with other experiments like LOI and A48-2 ISTRA and KTEF. Let me go directly to the final plot, which is the combined results and the Flavian net fit. So here you see the combined result by K3 plus K3. So we did a combined chi-square of the two decay together to get the best values of this L plus L minus, for example, L plus L, uh, plus L double prime and L zero. And here you see that uh, we, partially solved some tension that was before in between uh, our measurement, which is the green tree and the uh, black one, which is now in a better agreement with the, the other measurement by Chloe, Istra and Kate. So I can go to my conclusion. So an A48 has to perform the first measurement of the branching ratio of the pi plus pi zero plus and minus decay, which was never observed with the precision which is around 3% and which is in good agreement with the theoretical prediction by Kai PT. And we also did the first evaluation of the direct emission magnetic term of this decay, which is rather a small precision for the moment, but this is dominated by the statistical precision. So with the larger sample, we could do better. And we also remeasured the KL3 form factor with a special run of an A48-2 
and we also published this with a, a precision which is competitive with the previous experiment and with a lower tension with respect to previous measurements. So I end my conclusion. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Mauro. So any comments from the audience? I don't see any. Okay, so if uh, there is nobody uh, asking questions, okay, maybe I have one. So uh, since you are also a member of the NE62 collaboration, uh, could you tell us if there are uh, some plans, uh, let's say, to uh, improve this measurement with the NE62 experiment? So in principle, K to pi plus pi zero e plus or minus could be improved by NA for E62 because uh, the flux is uh, 20 times higher. So in principle, you could reach samples which are 20 times bigger. So you could reach approach the 100,000. There are two difficulties in doing this is that, first of all, you need three tracks events. And in our trigger, the three tracks events are normally downscaled strongly because of the higher flux, you cannot collect them all. So a way of doing this should be to have a clever trigger which is able to identify electron positron pairs. And this maybe we can achieve with the new L0TP processors. So this would be the, the point. And then of course we cannot improve on the CP violation because we only have K plus. But from the branching, we might try measuring, for example, the direct emission component with the higher precision, which we very, there is a bro to check the cost, to cost check the pi plus pi zero gamma measure. Okay, thanks a lot. Yes, very clear. Anything else? Uh, if there are no other comments or question, uh, thanks again, uh, Mauro. So if uh, anyone has uh, other comments or question, please uh, uh, go to the Mattermost page. And then at this point, I would propose uh, we move on. We have uh, the last two uh, talks uh, of this, let's say, small session, which uh, are about spectroscopy. So we change uh, uh, a bit the topic. So now we have a talk uh, by Alexi Drupskoy uh, on the latest D0 results on exotic hadrons. Hello. Hello. Please uh, uh, try to share the slides. I can hear you. Okay, very good. Okay, is that all right? Yes. Okay, let me start. Uh, okay, uh, I will discuss uh, recent D0 uh, results on production of uh, exotic hadrons. Uh, here you can see uh, outline of my talk, I will present uh, D0 uh, studies uh, on prompt non prompt production of X3872 and Psi2S, associated production of X and soft pion, and then uh, prompt and non prompt production of Z sub C3900 and evidence for inclusive uh, non prompt production of P sub C states. And then we'll go to conclusion. Uh, so, uh, this data were uh, collected uh, in uh, tevatron proton and uh, antiproton uh, collisions uh, at energy uh, 1.96 TV. Uh, full data sample uh, um, is a uh, obtaining this Fentabarn. D0 detector is a uh, multi purpose uh, high acceptance detector. There's a good tracking and vertex systems, uh, excellent uh, muon ID in wide rapidity range. So. It's quite a st standard detector. Uh, so uh, before I go into results, let me say a few words about uh, classification of exotic states. Uh, dynamic configuration of four quark states can be a tightly bound, uh, like tetra quark or penta quark for five states, uh, five quark states, or loosely bound, uh, as it is shown, molecular uh, or hydroquarkonium, or probably the mixture of this, uh, uh, the, uh, this uh, co configurations. Uh, many exotic states were observed experimentally, however, theoretical interpretation is still unclear. Um, 
uh, usually uh, state uh, today usually state uh, X3872 is assumed to be a mixture of conventional KC12P state and molecular and state uh, Z sub C3900 uh, usually assumed to be a molecular. Uh, and in this uh, talk, I will try to compare prompt uh, production of exotic states with non-prompt non production of exotic states, because uh, it can provide uh, important information about the states. Prompt production means then uh, this state uh, uh, comes uh, directly from a primary vertex, uh, in our case, uh, uh, proton antiproton. Uh, non prompt production means that uh, uh, some B hadron comes from primary vertex and then this uh, B hadron decays to the, uh, the state which we study, for example, X3872. Uh, the, uh, the big question is uh, um, if uh, loosely bound and especially large uh, state can survive after production multi uh, track vertex, uh, I mean, uh, in primary vertex. So this question is. Uh, uh, not not clear and probably can uh, um, shed some light on 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 uh, configuration of these states. Uh, first analysis, uh, which was uh, which will be presented, prominent non, non prom production of X thirty eight seventy two and Psi two S. Uh, both states are studied in uh, decay mode. Uh, J Psi pi plus pi minus. Uh, uh, Psi two S sample is used as a control sample, and we study. Uh, 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 initially, uh, X3872. Uh, uh, this uh, analysis uh, uh, was uploaded uh, in archive uh, uh, yesterday, uh, so it's a very fresh uh, result. Uh, so you see, uh, uh, JPSI signal is very large, uh, uh, more than 100 events. Uh, and uh, X3872 uh, uh, signal is also quite large at 16,000 events. Uh, so such a big samples allow us to study uh, pseudo proper time distributions, uh, which are shown below. And this uh, uh, pseudo proper time, uh, time formula is shown here. Uh, and uh, uh, mass feed was done in uh, pseudo proper time beans and each point uh, which is shown here uh, just from uh, mass feed, uh, uh, respectively, uh, uh, no uh, combinatorial background. So you uh, see that prompt uh, contribution and non-prompt contribution uh, can be separated in the feed, and uh, we can get uh, non-prompt fraction uh, from from such uh, feeds. So next uh, slide shows uh, 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 non-prompt uh, fraction for psi. Uh, 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 a 2s as a function of pt so our our points are shown in red and uh, they compared this uh, other experiments and on the right you can see uh, the same plot uh, for x3872 and what is important uh, uh, tendencies are quite similar for uh, increasing for psi 2s and uh, flat for x3872 uh, however, uh, on the right side, I would like to stress that uh, uh, there is a big difference between D0 uh, values and Atlas values and uh, mean values are different. Uh, if we will, uh, combine all points, uh, they will be different, uh, slightly uh, larger than five sigmas. But uh, also quite interesting parameter is the ratio of prompt to non-prompt. And in that case, for Psi 2S, uh, uh, on the left side, uh, you can see the figure. Uh, at 10 GeV, the difference between Tevatron and LHC is uh, only 25%. But in case of X, the difference uh, for prompt to non-prompt production is different almost three times. So it's a quite a big difference. So I can conclude that uh, relative X3872 uh, production to Bihadron production suppressed three times from D0 to Atlas. Uh, it can be slightly compensated by different uh, pseudo rapidity uh, regions, which are shown here, but uh, this effect is not big. Uh, next uh, slide shows another analysis uh, associated production of X3872 and soft pine. Uh, this analysis was motivated by uh, this uh, uh, theoretical papers of uh, Bratton and others. And you can see a diagram uh, which describes uh, molecular production of 3872 um, uh, using uh, 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 described by a triangle uh, diagram. 
and uh, we tried to to check this effect and also uh, we selected two samples a prompt and non-prompt and uh, from this theoretical paper uh, we can conclude that uh, quite a big part of uh, x uh, uh, events almost one seventh of these events should have uh, uh, sh should be accomplished by soft pi in this uh, small uh, kinetic energy less than 11.8 uh, mV. So in prompt sample uh, in this region we attained 18 events, uh, estimated six events of background, and uh, from this theoretical paper we expected uh, much more events in in the, in the range of 200, 700 somewhere. In non-prompt sample, situation is quite different. For this region, uh, we obtained 27 plus minus 12 events, estimated uh, background as two events, and expected number of events uh, 3187. Um, unfortunately, uh, obtained result uh, uh, is only two sigma effect in non-prompt production. It's not enough for definite conclusion. Maybe in LHC experiments, they can uh, get uh, better accuracy for this study. But this is an interesting hint. Uh, for this effect. Uh, so next slide, uh, let me just uh, say a few words, uh, what is going, uh, what can be concluded from this study. Uh, first of all, why X uh, prompt production suppressed relatively uh, to B hardened production at LHC? Is it effect of dissociation of a spatially large object uh, by many other tracks uh, producing in primary vertex? This was discussed in a, a LHCB conference paper. Such effect was discussed in this paper. And by the way, uh, I have to say that number of particles produced in primary vertex at 7-8 TV LHC is about twice larger than that uh, in uh, Tevatron 2 TV. So probably some, uh, uh, probably uh, some more information can be obtained. Some uh, situation may be more clear if LHC will measure uh, non-prompt fraction uh, at uh, certain TV, uh, so it could shed some light. And also, let me a little bit speculate. Uh, so if exotic uh, state X uh, prompt production is suppressed at LHC, is it possible to get even stronger suppression for other exotic states in LHC, in particular for uh, X5560A? Uh, because uh, state uh, 3872 probably has large two quark component and maybe not too much suppressed. Okay, next uh, analysis, which I would like to show, uh, prompt and non-prompt production of Z sub C, 3900. Uh, paper was published uh, last year. This analysis was done in semi-inclusive way. So uh, two tracks from the same vertex were uh, selected. Uh, and also a sample was separated uh, to non-prompt and prompt uh, uh, samples, sub-samples. Uh, and here, um, what was done, uh, mass uh, of uh, J psi pi uh, was uh, a distribution, was attested in different J psi pi pi uh, intervals. Uh, in particular, uh, uh, you see on the left side for non prone production, uh, this uh, distribution, and only in the region 4.2, 4.3, we see some signal. In uh, other intervals, uh, signal is almost zero. And non, uh, for prompt sample, it's also uh, almost zero everywhere. But in this uh, uh, region, you can see, by the way, in this uh, 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 right top plot, uh, the signal, how it looks like for this region. So uh, signal is more or less uh, clear. And uh, signal shown here, it's uh, uh, quite a big uh, signal, 5.2 uh, sigma. And this region indicates probably uh, that uh, Z sub C uh, 3900 comes from uh, Psi 4260. Uh, it looks like that. So, uh, well, and uh, last uh, analysis which I would like to show is uh, uh, evidence for inclusive non prompt production of P sub C states. It was also semi inclusive analysis, uh, selection uh, J Psi proton. Uh, so, three tracks from the same vertex were selected. Again, uh, sample was selected to non prompt and prompt sub sample uh, and uh, on in in the top uh, in, 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 the, in the top figure I'm, I'm sorry just in the top figure uh, figure you can see some uh, small uh, signal uh, and uh, 
uh, in, in the region of 44, uh, 50 mEV. Uh, and we know from LHCB uh, uh, studies that in this uh, region, uh, they uh, observed uh, two uh, signals, 4440 and 4457. Uh, in our feed, uh, we, we used uh, some of these two signals because, because uh, our resolution doesn't allow to separate the states. Uh, signal shape was fixed using LHCB result. And you see the uh, observed signal was uh, 3.2 sigmas, uh, no signal and prompt sample. So it's uh, first uh, uh, confirmatory evidence for uh, P sub C states observed by LHCB by a few years ago. Uh, so uh, you can see conclusions. I, I, I don't think I should repeat all, all that stuff. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Alexi. Any comments or questions from the audience? I see one, Semen. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, I have a question on slide number five. So uh, what about the contribution, the short-lived one that you refer to as the BSUB-C? Uh, how sensitive uh, are you to this contribution and how is it treated in the feed? Is it fixed or? Uh... Uh, we are quite sensitive to B sub C, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> Not unfortunately, just uh, what we got, uh, we got. Uh, in principle, uh, here, a uh, chi square of uh, well, this feed is, is, is quite good, uh, taken into, in, into account that it's quite simple. Uh, shape three Gaussian to to describe prompt production and exponential shape to describe uh, 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 non prompt. Uh, but uh, let's say uh, chi square uh, is uh, 24 in case of uh, we include a B sub C, and it's about 110 or something like that if we do not include. So it's a quite big effect. Uh, so definitely we cannot avoid. Uh, B sub C contribution. Um, so in in the paper you can see you can see uh, this archive um, paper. It's uh, explained in more details. It just repeat today. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. So if there are no more comments or question, I would move on. And then for any other comments, please use the Mattermost channel. So we have uh, one last uh, talk before the coffee break, uh, which is uh, uh, Sergei Polik Polikarpov, uh, and they will talk about the uh, search for QCD exotic states uh, at CMS. Uh, yes, hello. hello. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, I can share because uh, somebody else is sharing. Okay, now I think you you can try again. Yes, and uh, now it should work. Okay, please. Okay, uh, I will uh, describe the search for uh, exotic uh, states for QCD exotic states at CMS experiment. Uh, my talk includes. Uh, the study of uh, B plus to gypsy anti lambda proton decay, search for exotic states decaying into upsilon one s uh, mu mu, and observation of B sub s to x phi decay. Uh, so uh, B, B plus to gypsy lambda anti lambda proton decay uh, was previously studied at Bell experiment with only, only 17 signal events. And CMS performs the study of this decay uh, with uh, more data. Uh, so now this decay allows to search for possible exotic hadron contributions uh, in the gypsy anti lambda and gypsy proton mass distributions. Uh, for example, it could be possible to uh, to search for pentaquarks similar to those observed in gypsy in gypsy proton system from lambda b decays by LHCB. Uh, for the branching fraction measurement, we use the B plus to gypsy k star decays normalization channel where k star plus decays into k short pi. The event selection requires uh, uh, 
uh, very displaced uh, vertex for uh, lambda or k short reconstruction. And uh, then uh, B plus candidates are obtained by fitting Demion with this uh, long lived candidate and additional track vertex with me plus me minus constraint to J psi mass. Uh, as you can see on the bottom of the slide, we have about 500 B plus into J psi anti lambda proton candidates uh, with a clear peak on a small background and about 20,000 normalization decays, which allows us to measure the branch inflection ratio, uh, which is about 1% uh, on, the, on the bottom right of the slide. And using the known denominator branch infraction, we measure the B plus to gypsy anti lambda proton branch infraction. Uh, and this measurement is the most precise uh, to date. And then we use this data to, uh, to search for uh, possible intermediate resonances in this decay using a model dependent approach introduced by Babar and also used by LHCB. So basically this approach allows us to test the compatibility of the data uh, with only resonances decaying into anti-lambda proton. So uh, in the end, we will uh, get the degree of compatibility between data and uh, uh, phase space, which is bad. So the data is not compatible with phase space. And then we get the, that the data is compatible with the resonances decaying into anti-lambda proton, which could be possible known uh, higher excited K star resonances. Uh, in this way, uh, we, show, we have shown that the data is uh, compatible um, with only known resonances. And therefore there is no need for extra exotic states which could decay into gypsy anti-lambda or gypsy proton. Uh, next slide shows the, the next analysis. So uh, there are uh, four big work tetra quarks predicted with mass close to twice the eta b or upsilon mass. And such states would decay into upsilon LL and CMS performs a search for upsilon in upsilon plus me minus final state where upsilon is reconstructed in the demion decay channel. Uh, for, for such a search, the double upsilon production process is a background source. So its yield is estimated in data with the two dimensional fit to two demion masses and the shape of this upsilon, upsilon contribution is estimated in the simulation for, uh, S, for single proton parton scattering and double parton scattering process. Now in the next slide, this shape is used in the and the search for exotic states, which decay into the upsilon mu. And the background shape is uh, defined by studying events with low fermion vertex width probability. And then the plot on the left shows the observed uh, distribution of fermion mass, which, is, uh, which doesn't show any significant peaks. And the, the example signal at 19 GV mass has significance of about one sigma. Uh, using this distribution, an upper limit was set on uh, cross section times the branch infraction. Uh, limits are also set in wider mass range for different models of potential uh, signals decaying into upsilon mu. Uh, uh, now I move to the next uh, topic, which is uh, observation of B sub S to X phi decay. So X3872. Uh, particle uh, was observed by uh, Bell about uh, 17 years ago, but it is still a very puzzling particle with mass very close to D0 anti D star zero threshold with very small natural width. Uh, also the decays of X3872 violet is a spin and uh, uh, production of X3872 was uh, uh, found to be excited, uh, uh, was found to be uh, larger than expected in, pro in uh, lead lead collisions, which I will show in the next slide. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, theoretical interpretations of this state, which include tetraquark, molecule, or mixture of those states with conventional charmonium. 
Uh, however, so far, the X was never observed in B sub S decays, only from B0, B plus, and lambda B, and prong, and, and, and in prong production, as it was discussed by previous speaker. Uh, measurement of its production in B sub S decays would help to understand uh, the properties, which I will also show in a couple of slides. Uh, we measure this uh, ratio defined in the bottom part of the slide. Uh, so basically, as a normalization channel, we take psi 2 s 5 where psi 2 s decays into j psi pi pi. Uh, this allows to cancel many systematic uncertainties related to track reconstruction, uh, because uh, basically the same the same final state is used uh, two muons plus four tracks. Um, now, uh, slide eight shows X production in lead lead collisions. Uh, so uh, the excited state production is known to be suppressed in heavy ion collisions, for example, for upstone states. Uh, while uh, CMS has found an evidence for X production in lead lead collisions, as you can see on the plot on the left, uh, with about four sigma significance. And the ratio of efficiency corrected yields with respect to psi 2 s was found to be unexpectedly large. Uh, so the same ratio of productions uh, with respect to psi 2 s in proton-proton collisions is about 10%, while uh, in lead-lead the measured value is uh, about 1. However, the uncertainty is, of course, uh, large. Uh, then uh, slide 8 shows uh, the difference in, X, uh, in possible ways of X formation in uh, B plus and B zero decays. Basically, the two Feynman diagrams on top uh, work for any charmonium state uh, produced uh, in B plus or B sub S decays. Uh, the two uh, diagrams in the middle of the slide uh, show additional way how X can be produced in case it includes a contribution from a DD star uh, uh, rescattering or DD star molecule. And then the, uh, the diagram on the bottom, which can only exist for B plus and not for B0, not for B sub S, shows additional way for B plus uh, to produce uh, X3872 uh, via, uh, via DD star rescattering. Uh, so in, in, in case uh, this uh, very naive model has, uh, has some sense, let me say, uh, we could expect different behavior of this uh, B plus to X K plus and B sub S to X phi decays. Uh, now, moving on to the analysis, uh, we, we used the whole run to uh, data set of 2016 to 2018, corresponding to 140 inverse center bar. Uh, the B sub S uh, candidate reconstruction is quite straightforward. We require two uh, well identified muons and four tracks to form a good quality vertex displaced from the beams. And uh, then uh, I will not go into much detail since there is little time left. Uh, the signal yields are extracted with a two dimensional fit to mass of J psi pi pi and mass of KK, which uh, in case of normalization channel come from psi 2s and phi decays. And then uh, slide 12 shows the signal channel uh, where we see X uh, to J psi pi pi and uh, phi to KK signal peaks also extracted in a two dimensional fit. And the statistical significance exceeds uh, seven sigma, so we can report the first observation of this decay. Uh, and then uh, uh, we cross-check using background subtraction technique that the remaining non-B sub S background is uh, very small. So all of the reconstructed psi 2 s phi candidates or X3872 phi candidates come from B sub S decays. Uh, the systematic uncertainties uh, are listed on slide 14, and uh, I will go to, to the results of this study. So we report the observation of B sub S to X3872 phi decay, and measure this uh, ratio of branch and fractions, which allows to, uh, to estimate the, branch, the product of branch and fractions B sub S to X phi times X to J psi pi pi. 
which can be compared to similar uh, similar uh, products of branch of fractions for B plus and B zero decays. Uh, this is also done graphically on slide sixteen, uh, which shows that uh, the branch of fractions of B sub s to x phi, B zero to x k star, and B zero to x k zero are quite similar to each other, while the same product of branch of fractions is uh, quite different for, for B plus. It is uh, basically two times larger. And uh, then uh, we also plotted the same comparison for charmonium states, G psi and psi 2s. And there we see that all these uh, branch fractions are quite consistent, uh, which suggests different uh, production mechanism for X uh, uh, with respect to traditional charmonium. And this brings me to, to the last slide, which is summary. So we have measured B plus to gypsy anti lambda proton decay, and uh, we found no evidence for exotic resonances. We have uh, searched for exotic states decaying into upsilon mu mu and set an upper limit. And we have observed B sub S to X phi decay, and the measured branch inflection indicates different production dynamics of X and B plus and B zero and B sub S decays. Uh, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Any comments or questions from the audience? I do not see any. So, okay, I have one. Uh, is there any, uh, let's say, expectation on uh, the ratio of the, uh, of the branching ratios that you just measured to be 0 0.5? Uh we did not find any theoretical predictions on this exact uh, branching of branch of ranges, but uh, there is a theoretical paper uh, that uh, was uh, released after uh, the CMS uh, analysis went on archive, uh, which explains this absurd difference uh, between B0, between B plus and uh, B0 and B sub S uh, decays using uh, a tetra quark model of X3872. Okay, so I guess uh, there will be some more uh, uh, interest uh, following in on the theoretical side. Okay, very good. Okay, thanks a lot. So these, uh, if there are no other comments or questions, ah, I see one uh, by Daniel, please. Hi, yeah, just a, a really quick question about the production in lead lead. Um, you commented on the, uh, relative um, rate and, and, and mentioned the possibility to constrain the X3872 nature. What's your conclusion about that um, constraint given that observation? Um, I, I actually, I'm not aware of any constraints which could, uh, which could be produced from this measurement. I would just highlight that uh, the uncertainty in this measurement is quite large and it is still consistent with the uh, Proton proton uh, ratio within like uh, one and a half yeah. sigma. Yeah, no, I just wondered if uh, if a, a high value around unity would, would imply something about the compact I, nature of the state. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't know details if, if this is some, if this can clarify any mo model. Sure, thanks. Nice, uh, nice result. Okay, thanks a lot. So if uh, there are no more comments or questions, I would propose uh, to close this uh, sub-session and uh, having, have uh, a coffee break. And then I leave, uh, the, let's say, everything to Carla. So please, Carla. So let's have a five minutes break and reconvene at 14. Oh, it's 14 here. So at 32 minutes after seven. If someone has any, everybody's um, try their video and audio for the next uh, block want to try here. Okay, hello. I, I'll have have a try. Um,
Hi, Carla. He, Sheila is speaking. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm... Thank you. I'm just testing my... Own. Can you see my screen? Yes. My slide? Okay, it's okay. To, Thank uh, you. to make it full screen, so just to test. Okay. It's okay? And try to pass it to the next okay. slide. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, okay. Thank you. Okay. I'll go ahead, Shayla. Okay, let me share my screen to test it. We have, we see your full, uh, maybe you want to share just, uh, just or make, the, uh, or the make this screen maybe, what, uh, what's best for you? It's okay. Yeah, so try to pass it. Yeah, that doesn't work. Yeah, let me try just to. Uh, share yeah only the that uh, window maybe yeah okay that works Anybody else? Try mine. This is Brad. Let me see. Okay. Okay. Make it full screen. Uh, this works anyway, but. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I can try. Uh, is that okay? I'm not seeing anything right now. Yeah. I mean, no, so just, you can just leave that way and, uh, okay. okay. Yep. Clearly. Okay, could I share now? Oh, let's uh, wait a, a little more because you tested already, right, Sheldon? Right, but who knows what happened in between. <laughs> <I'll stay down. Okay, it's, it's time already anyway. Okay. For a test? Can I have a test? Oh, okay. If I uh, just take a, a minute. Okay. Am I sharing? Yeah. No, I think it's better uh, at your time now, long he. Let's, uh, let's start. Uh, it's time to start already. So uh, let me put my video. So we are starting the, the third and last block of this evening uh, dedicated to uh, production, ma mainly production and decay properties of B and C hadrons, uh, including onias. Uh, just to let you, uh, to remind that you have 12 plus three minutes. 
Uh, we will have, uh, this is an experimental block, so we have uh, results from LHCB, CMS, ATLAS, BESS, and BELL. And we encourage people remembering to uh, put uh, questions and debate there at the Mattermost channel, but at the end of this uh, block, and uh, at each uh, session, the end of each full session, we uh, maintain the this um, the Zoom close uh, open, so you can uh, maintain or ha have further discussions here at the end of the, the block today. So please, uh, Sheldon, you can start. Okay, I'm going to talk about isospin apple tubes and B baryon spectroscopy at LHCb. Okay. If, whoops, I'm having trouble. The slide is not changing quickly. Do you see a slide change? We still see the first one. Okay, well, I knew there would be a problem. I'm, I'm going to go out of full screen mode. Sorry about that. All right, I go to the second slide. Isospin yeah. is strong interaction symmetry between U and D quarks. Weak interactions do not conserve isospin. In k to pi pi decays, as an example, the final state with isospin zero is much larger than the final state with isospin two. It's, it's very precisely measured, it's about 22 and a half. Now it can be explained as a strong interaction effect by recent lattice calculations, which have a value of 19.9 with a considerable error. But Boris et al, in an older paper claimed that their analytical calculation of about 16 doesn't agree and there could be new physics. We're not studying kaons here, we're gonna be studying B baryons. So we start with the lambda B to J psi lambda versus lambda B to J psi sigma. The isospins are written below and you can see that the, uh, the uh, isospin with the sigma transition is a change of isospin of one, whereas with the lambda B, the to lambda, it's zero. Now we're taking the initial isospin of lambda B is zero from the quark model, although it's actually never been measured. So what could we learn? Well, here's a Feynman diagram at at, uh, at leading order. So you either get a J psi, you get a J psi in either a lambda or a sigma. Now the B to C C bar S operator doesn't change isospin because all the objects here are I equals zero. So we expect the lambda mode to be much larger than the sigma mode. Okay. If the J psi lambda mode is much larger than the J psi sigma mode, then the lambda B isospin would be measured as zero. Some analysis have assumed that only the smallest isospin changing amplitude is present. Example, in the pentaquark analysis of lambda B to J psi PK minus, it was assumed that the PK minus formed a lambda star rather than a sigma star. Can we justify this? Can we apply this to other analyses? Can we detect an I equal one new physics amplitude? Other things we can learn are, in general, I spin breaking is at the level of 1% in rate, but if the U and D quarks in the lambda B are in a tightly bound I equals zero di quark, this breaking will vanish. So we would test the di quark model. The lambda sigma wave function mixing is predicted to be at the level of 0.01% of 1% in amplitude, 10 to the minus four in rate. Several predictions, including lattice, uh, have made this prediction, and we could measure this with enough sensitivity. Data analysis. We reconstruct the J psi lambda mass distribution for J size and lambdas that form a vertex detached from the PP collision point. A boosted decision tree is used to reduce background. For lambda B to J size sigma, sigma to lambda gamma, we look for this without reconstructing the photon because of its low energy and related low detection efficiency. The, this if you look then at the mass of the J psi lambda from the J psi sigma decay, you find the satellite bump just below the lambda B mass. Now other significant backgrounds are lambda B goes to J psi lambda star, lambda star goes to pi zero, sigma zero, and then the sigma zero goes to lambda gamma. And we also have sigma B goes to J psi sigma, sigma go cascade, cascade goes to pi lambda. 
We fully reconstruct the ladder in the charge cascade B mode, which gives us a normalization on this, and then we simulate the shape. But we use data from run one and run two, and we analyze them separately because they have different efficiencies. So here's the reconstruction of the cascade B to JSI cascade minus background. You can see plots for run two and run one up there. They're very clear signals here. Okay. So we simulate the JSI lambda shapes from these, these normalized rates. And the JSI lambda star shapes are just simulated and there's no normalization possible. So here, here's an example of shape that you'd see in the MJSI lambda mass spectrum from a JSI uh, cascade zero decay. And also for the JSI sigma, this is the signal shape we're searching for, and this is just from simulation. Uh, so here are our results actually for this. So what you're seeing on the log scale is the JSI lambda mass. The, this, the big peak here is for JSI lambda, and then the uh, dashed peak here is just from JSI, JSI prime or psi prime, where the psi prime goes to pi pi psi, and you get sort of this Gaussian shape here. Then these other shapes here you, uh, that are lambda star shapes with various masses here are put into the fit separately in the green dot, black dot, and uh, blue dot. And then the J, J side lambda background from the cascade B, this is the shape, the simulated shape I showed you before. And this is the normalization we get, which we put into the fit with a Gaussian constraint. The signal for lambda B to J side sigma is not seen. And what's put in here is the upper limit that we find. So we had an upper limit of 0.21% at 95% confidence level. And the dashed line here is the combinatoric background. Now this next peak here is the first observation of cascade B going to J psi lambda, which is a Kibibo suppressed decay. Okay, in detail, R, which is, is the square of the amplitudes of the A1 amplitude to the A0 amplitude or the J psi sigma to the J psi lambda, branching ratios times the phase space factor. And we get that by measuring the number of events and just dividing by the uh, relative efficiencies and the phase space factor. So we determine our, I showed you run two data, but we actually determine it with a joint fit to the run one and run two JSI mass distributions. And we include systematic uncertainties using Gaussian constraints. They're mainly relative final state efficiencies of 2% and the normalization of the cascade B to JSI cascade background, which is about 10%. And here's a table of the fit yields, which I won't discuss. So here's a synopsis of the lambda B results. If the lambda B was isospin one, where we had new physics, then A1 over A0 would be up here somewhere you know, above one, maybe five. Okay, if you have one, there is no preference for the I equals zero or I equal one amplitude. Okay, point one is expected from the UD ma mass difference if we don't have die quarks. And our measurement in terms of the amplitude ratio is 0.046 at 95% confidence level. And the expectation from lambda sigma mixing is down here at 0.01. So we're, we're in this region here. Okay, and I will discuss the consequences of that later. We also measure uh, cascade B to J side uh, lambda O and divide that by J psi sigma zero. Okay, so you can see the diagrams here and you can see that there's the Kibo suppression comes in when you form a lambda rather than, than a, a cascade. Now by assuming equal widths for the charge and neutral decays, we also measure this ratio for J psi, ratio of branching ratios for J psi lambda to J psi sigma as 8.2 times 10 to the minus three. And then we make an amplitude analysis out of this also. So the isospin for the cascade B0 to J psi lambda decay, we start out with an I, an I equal a half system and the final state is, both, is zero. So that's an A equals zero amplitude. And in the case of the 
cascade zero final state, it's an A equal a half amplitude. So we measure this ratio of A zero to A equal a half, we take out the Kabibo suppression factor. And then, uh, you know, we put in a phase space factor, which is different. So we get a value of 0.37 plus or minus 0.06 plus or minus 0.02. Now there's a theoretical expectation based on SU3 flavor. The lambda B, the cascade B0 and the cascade B Mormons form an anti-triplet while the lambda and uh, cascade are in an octet. So this prediction of Derry et al. predict that this ratio, the amplitudes here are just determined by the uh, SU3 clutch Gordon coefficient of one over square root of six, which is 0.41, which is in very good agreement here. But the, and there's a 20% uncertainty in the prediction due to SUF, SU3F breaking. Okay. So in conclusion, the lambda B is isospin zero as the quark model says, the U and D and the lambda B almost certainly form a diquark. In the pentacork analysis of lambda B to J psi PK minus, it was assumed that the PK minus formed a lambda star rather than a signal star. This is now justified. There's no preference for the I equal a half amplitude in J psi cascade over the I equal zero amplitude in cascade B to J psi lambda. And this is very similar to results on beta pi pi, which, ha which have a, a ratio of A zero of A two amplitudes equal to one. And unlike that in D to pi pi, where the ratio is 2.5, and K to pi pi, which is 22.5. So it seems as you go to higher masses, the QCD effects get smaller and smaller until you're in the B system when they, you can't see them very much. Okay, and that's the end. And the paper has been published uh, in PRL. Thank you, Sheldon. Uh, any questions? Don't see any raising hands. Well, if, if someone have a question after that, please uh, uh, put in the mattermost and uh, we'll follow them. Thank you. So the next speaker is Sheila Maral talking about production studies of double botonium at CMS. Hi, let me put my presentation. Okay. Okay, I will talk about the production studies of the Botonia at CMS. Oops. Uh, and this talk, I will show the motivation to perform this study, the main feature of the CMS detector used in this analysis, and the result, and then the conclusion. So uh, quarkonium production is an uh, ideal probe to both perturbative and non-perturbative process in QCD. And also the quarkonium pair uh, may originate from the single parton scattering or the double parton scattering, which provides insight into the underlying mechan mechanism of particle production at the LHG. Also, it's a potential ground for discovery for for theta quark bond state or generic resonance with mass close to the y to twice of the upsilon meson mass. And the main subdetectors used for the, this analysis are the neon system and the silicon tracker, where the charged particles are reconstructed by the silicon tracker, and the neon reconstruction and identification are performed using the outermost part of the CMS. That's the immune system, using the heats in the immune chambers. Here on the right, we have the distribution of the invariant mass spectrum of a dimion in events collected with a, with a double mu trigger in 2018. In green, we have the trigger that selects the region of 8.5 to 11.5 uh, GV, showing the three peaks of the, oops, uh, 
And the paper that I'm going to present the result is this one. Uh, to extract the number of signal events, uh, it was performed the uh, unbinding two-dimensional maximum likelihood fit to the invariant mass distribution of the two opposite sign mu pairs. And the signal is fitted using a sum of two crystal ball function. And since the background is composed by two components, with a lot of components like the Upsilon 2S and the Upsilon 3S, which is model with Gaussian function. And the combinatorial background are model with the Chebyshev polynomials. Also the number of events are corrected for the efficient acceptance also. On the right, we have the simulation of the projection of the 2D feet, which is described by the line, to the invariant mass distribution that are the points for the SPS contribution. And the vertical bars are on the point show only the statistical uncertainty. And assuming the unpolarized Upsilon meson, the inclusive cross-section measuring the fiducial region where both the meson have absolute rapidity below two is shown here in the red box. Also the CMS measure the same cross-section in the same fiducial region at HDV and the result is shown here in this gray box. Um, here we have the projection of both dimension with all the fit components. And the upsilon pair production signal is shown here in this field area. And the contribution from the combinatorial background and the combination of other upsilon states are overlaid. Here are the backgrounds of the, the events that was measured. Also to check the sensitivity of the fiducial cross-section measurement of the upsilon 1s meson decay, different polarization scenarios are considered. And the polarization of the upsilon affects the angular distribution and it's through with following this formula where the, the theta and the phi are the polar and the azimuthal angle respectively to the positive charge mu with respect with the ZX. And the table show a summary of this study where the effects of different polarization can be substantial and change the measure cross section from minus 60 to plus 25%. Also the contribution of the double part of scattering to the inclusive pair production cross-section is determined for the first time at CMS. And since, as I said before, the DPS production is characterized by a large separation in rapidity between the meson, also they are large uncorrelated and uh, by a larger invariant mass of the meson pairs. So uh, those variables was used in this study. Also the distribution of delta phi, delta r, and the transverse momentum differ for the SPS and DPS, but they carry a, a large theoretic uncertainty because of their sensitive to the choice of the model parameter in the simulation. And to measure the fraction of DPS events, the fiducial cross-section is measuring five beams of a rapidity between the meson and five beams of the invariant mass. And then it is compared to the expected distribution of SPS and EPS after the fraction is measured with a beam maximum likelihood fit of these two simulated distribution to measure the fiducial cross-section in these five beams of rapidity and in five beams of the invariant mass. And then we get the, the fraction. Here we have the measure fraction of DPS events. The result using the invariant mass 
is compatible with the measurement using the difference in rapidity, but with much lower precision. Uh, because the uncertainty is strongly dominated by the uncertainty of the cross section in the beans. And the theoretical uncertainty in the predicted SPS and DPS distribution play a big role at percentage level. Again, this measurement is performed for the first time at CMS. Here on the plots, we have the measure uh, different fiducial cross section in beans of rapidity between the mesons on the left and in beans of invariant mass, mass of the meson on the right. The shaded area around the total distribution corresponds to the uncertainty in the measurement of the fraction. And the solid line, that's the blue, show the sum of the SPS and DPS contribution. Also a search for narrow excess of events above an expected smooth form your invariant mass spectrum was performed. Assuming that the resonant decay, the resonance takes decay into two mu and the upsilon meson that further decay to a pair of mu, the signal resolution can be improved by using these uh, modified mass variable. And this modified mass variable has a resolution about 50% better than a 4 mu invariant mass. And the results are extracted by performing a fit to the modified mass spectrum. The signal are modeled by a sum of two Gaussian function and the background separating two components. The first one is the epsilon 1s pair production obtained from simulation and is modeled as the product of a sigmoid and exponential function. And the other component is the combinatorial background. It's, it's obtained in the signal region using several generic functions. On the right, we have the distribution of this modified mass of simulated upsilon epsilon events. The dashed line are the best fit models for the SPS in pink and DPS simulation uh, in blue. And the solid line is the average of both models. Here we have an example signal for the tetraquark with mass of 19 GeV, which has a significance about one sigma. And here we have the corresponding upper limits and they range between five to 380 phantom bars and depending on the mass and the signal model. The patterns and the limits are broader for the spin two signal than for the scalar and pseudo scalar states because the signal is characterized by softer and more forward neons leading to our roles worse mass spectrum resolution. So the summary, the fiducial cross section for upsilon 1s in the fiducial region where both upsilon 1s meson have an absolute rapidity below 2.0 at 13 GeV is measured at CMS with 2016 data, which correspond to 35 to nine inverse phantom bar. And the results are presented assume that the epsilon are produced unpolarized, but also the effect of polarization was shown. Also the contribution of DPS to the total inclusive epsilon pair production cross section is determined for the first time at CMS. And the results of, this, of a search are also presented for a light narrow resonance such as tetraquark for a bound stage uh, beyond standard model, the came to also and a pair of opposite sign mules. And no excess of events compatible with a signal is observed. So CMS has produced several new results in the field of quarkonium production and polarization. And thanks for listening. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, questions? Well, 
I, I have one question though, you uh, in the light of the recent uh, uh, Teta Park result from LHCB, uh, what do you have to say about JPSI pair production at PMS? Have ongoing studies on this? Uh, I don't know how, I don't know about the JPSI pair production. Sorry. No, it's okay. Any I can other... search it and, and say in the metamorphs. Okay. So uh, thanks, Shane, again. So let's move forward uh, to uh, Brad Abbott. Atlas results on quarconia and associated production. All right. You, you can see the screen okay, I hope. Oh, not yet. Yes. Good. All right. So I'd like to uh, present uh, results on quarconia and associated production. And I'd actually like to present two different measurements. The first is on JSI and Psi2S production, cross-sections at high PT at 13 TeV, and another analysis on JSI production in association with the W boson at 8 TeV. Now, why are we interested in looking at these uh, studies is we like to look at quaconia states because they really provide nice insight into QCD near uh, the boundary perturbative and non-perturbative regimes. Now, these cross sections have been measured before, but typically they've used dimuon triggers with lower thresholds so they could get down to the low PT region. But as one goes higher in JCI PT, uh, the dimuon triggers become inefficient. And so that limits your reach to a roughly 100 GeV. And we'd really like to go to this high P production across sections because it may help discriminate between various theoretical models. And so uh, previous measurements have gone out to about 150 GeV and there's a shown here. And so what's new with this measurement is Atlas has gone to uh, using an unprescaled single muon trigger. So that allows the full run to uh, data set to be used. And now we've expanded the PT range up to around 360 GeV. So it's a, a nice extension on the PT range. So on the plots on the right, you see an example of in a particular uh, PT and rapidity range, we see the dimuon mass and the tau, and then we do a simultaneous mass and lifetime fit. And so that allows us to extract both the JSI and the site 2 s yields as long and also for prompt and non-prompt. So after going through all the different PT regions and rapidity regions and correcting for efficiencies and so on, we can first now uh, see the first differential cross sections. And so we see here a nice result for uh, JSI prompt and non-prompt. So on the left, we see prompt JSI. On the right, we see non-prompt JSI. And we see the extension all the way out to uh, high PT up to 360 GeV. And we can also do the same thing for Psi2S. Now we don't go as high in PT. But again, we see nice uh, measurements in three different rapidity regions. Now we'd like to start uh, doing other things with this now. So we can start taking ratios and things. So we can start looking at say non-prompt uh, production fraction. And now what we see here for JSI and psi 2 us we see basically independent of PT since it's relatively flat and re relatively independent of rapidity because again, all the points are the same or line near each other. And so we see the same for JSI and Psi2S. And we can also look at the ratio of uh, Psi2S to JSI. And again, we see something very similar that it's relatively independent of PT and relatively independent of rapidity. And so now we'd like to start comparing to uh, theory. And so we have to worry about the unknown acceptance and so as everyone knows, we have to worry about this polarization of the, the, the psi states. And so we know that that can affect our acceptance. And so what we've done in order to uh, do this, is we've taken and varied uh, these lambdas in the range which they can vary under any physically allowed uh, spin alignment assumptions. So this is a um, 
So here we see a table showing all the different choices we've made for the different uh, choices for lambda. And so now we also want to compare. We have to look at systematics. So the main systematics are the trigger efficiencies, the muon reconstruction efficiencies, variations in fits, acceptances, bin migrations, momentum scales, and so on, and of course, luminosity. And so here we see uh, the results. And for the JSI prompt and the non-prompt JSI on top, and the site 2 s prompt and the site 2 s non-prompt on the bottom. And as you would expect, as we go to very high PT, we're dominated by statistical uncertainties. And if one looks at lower PT, we find that it's basically the muon reconstruction and the trigger uh, are the dominant uh, uncertainties. But we can see that certain ones are on the order of roughly 10 to 20%. So now that we have the acceptances and the systematics, we can start now comparing to uh, theory and to CMS. So here we see a nice comparison of a result from CMS and also in this new Atlas measurement. And this is fit to a simple function. And one can see in the overlap region, we get a very nice agreement, which is very nice. So it'll be a very nice consistent results between the two experiments. We can also, for the non-prompt cross-sections from JSI and Psi2S, we can start comparing to these fixed order next to leading log calculations. And so here again, we see a uh, comparison and we see relatively nice agreement in both uh, JSI and Psi2S, but we would like to really start looking at a little bit more detail so we can look at ratios. And now we see why we'd like to go to higher PT uh, cross sections, as you can see, actually we get very nice agreement at lower PT, but we're starting to see now that these fixed order nectulating log predictions are slightly larger. And so hopefully this, again, by going to the high P, we may be able to start discriminating against various models. And so we see for the non-prompt JSI cross section, a slight deviation compared to fixed order nectulating log. However, for the psi 2 s we see a relatively uh, good agreement. And we can also look at this non-prompt production and the ratio shows, again, good agreement between uh, data and fixed order next to leading log. All right, so now I'd like to uh, turn my attention to the second measurement, which is uh, JSI production in association with the W boson at 8 TeV. Now, again, why we wanna look at this is the production mechanisms in hydronic collisions is not really fully understood. So we know that the relative contributions of color singlet and color octet is, is, is not known. And we do know that we'd like to include both of those and it brings theory and experiment into a better agreement. And so why we'd like to bring in the W boson is by requiring this associated object, in this case, this analysis of W, it filters the possible color singlet color octet diagrams. In addition, because we have these two uh, particles, we can start looking at double parton versus single parton scattering because we can look at the angle delta phi between the two particles. And so again, this gives us a handle on understanding single parton versus double parton scattering. Okay, so uh, how does one go about making this measurement? And so we're measuring uh, this variable called RJ psi, and it's basically the cross sections of W plus J psi divided by the cross section of W. And the reason we like to do this ratio is you'll notice when we start measuring these cross sections, many of uh, the uncertainties can cancel out. So things doing the triggers, luminosities, efficiencies for the Ws and acceptances for the W all cancel. And so what we're left with in order to make this measurement is we need to know the number of inclusive Ws. We need to know the number of W plus J psi events. And then we just have to correct for the efficiency and acceptances for the J psi. And so to get these numbers, we can uh, apply some simple cuts shown here. And once we take into account the various backgrounds, say from electrons and going to e, or W to Enu, W to Tauno and so on and so forth, then we can fit this distribution with these known backgrounds and extract the number of inclusive Ws. We then turn our attention to looking at J psi plus W. So we take the uh, W uh, sample and we again, we apply a selection to find uh, J size. And so here we see, just like we saw earlier for the previous measurement, we're gonna do a uh, 
simultaneous mass and lifetime fit. So here we see, in this case, we've broken the data in two bins of rapidity. And this allows us then to calculate the number of prompt J size in, in this sample. And so once we take into account various backgrounds shown here, uh, B sub C's, QCD, J psi plus Z, J psi plus W, with the W going to tau nu, we can subtract those backgrounds. In addition, we need to worry about pileup events. And this is when a J psi and a W are produced in two different collisions. And so once we take into account all these backgrounds, this gives us the number of W plus J psi events. And so finally, the last thing we need to worry about are these efficiencies and acceptances for the J psi. And those are determined using PT and repeated dependent corrections. So now we have all the pieces we need in order to calculate this ratio. So now we said we could look at double parton scattering and why we like to do this is if we look on this plot on the right, you can see that if I have single parton scattering, one expects a peak uh, near pi, because again, they should hopefully be back to back. While if they're independent of each other, if they're double parton scattering, you would expect this delta phi be relatively flat. Now, unfortunately, we do not know the exact shape of the SPS distribution. So at this point, we're unable to do a fit. In addition, the probability of the second hard scatter depends on sigma effective. And at this point, we actually don't know the effective cross section for this particular uh, choice of J psi plus W. And so what we've chosen to do is use two different values of sigma effective from previous atlas measurements, which are similar to our uh, mode. So we look at sigma effective, which is around 15 for W plus two jet events. And we have a sigma effective of 6.3 from prompt J psi pair production. And so we see that here's a plot of uh, delta phi. And unfortunately within the statistics right now, we cannot separate the, which either sigma effective is used. For systematics, we see a table here. And just like we've seen before, we have to worry about this J size spin alignment. And so that's our dominant uncertainty. And so now we can make the various measurements. We have the fiducial measurement, which we do not worry about the unknown spin alignment. And we find this number 2.2 to the minus six. Once we take into account the unknown J size spin alignment and the acceptance, we get this inclusive measurement of 5.3 times 10 to the minus six. And finally, if we want to start comparing to theory, we can now uh, remove off the DPS contributions. And since we have two choices of sigma effective, we get two possible values. And so now we see a nice plot comparing the measurement to a, a color octet SPS prediction. And you can see very nice agreement for sigma effective of 6.3. And unfortunately, we still cannot rule out sigma effective of 15. But if we do a differential measurement, what we see is that uh, neither value of sigma effective can actually correctly model the JSI PT dependence. And so in conclusions, uh, presented two different measurements uh, for 13 TEV cross sections, we see good agreement with previous measurements. We've extended the reach to 360 GEV. We see that uh, the effects order next to leading log are, are a little higher at higher PT. And the goal of this measurement is to bring the PT range down to eight GEV, so we extend the whole reach. For prompt J psi plus W, we do see that we see both SPS and DPS contributions. The smaller value of sigma effective is preferred, but neither value uh, can describe the J psi PT dependence. And that is it, thank you. Thank you, Brad. Questions? Okay, if there are any questions, so uh, we can uh, move forward to Shuang Xing Lin. Hi. Hi. I'm sharing my screen. Okay. Okay. Can you see my slide? Yes. Can uh, will you try? It's first screen. Thank you. Okay, okay, thank you. Hi everyone. I'm Chang Xing Ling from San Yasen University. On behalf of the Bessery Collaboration, I'm going to introduce 
has only tremendous decays at best rate. And the talk has spot paths, including introduction, measurement of strong phase parameters, amplitude analysis, and branch inflections of dimension decay. Uh, finally, I will give a summary. Uh, the BPC2 is a double ring electron position collider operating in tau time energy region within 2.0 to 4.9 GeV. The best three detector has been running since 2009 and reached the desired peak luminosity in 2016. And the structure of best three detector includes main drift chamber, thermal fly detector, and electromagnetic calorimeter, and super, uh, superconducting solenoid, and the muon counter from inside to outside. Here we show the DD bar and DSDS bar data samples uh, collected at best three, and they are produced near threshold without accompanying particles. About 3.6 times and 5.3 times they are clear C. Single tag and double tag mass are used in analysis. And single tag is used for channels with view background, and double tag provides clean samples for amplitude analysis and branch inflation measurement. Uh, recently, BAS3 has reported the measurements of stone phase parameters in digital decay to KSOR or KLON pipeline. In model independent GGXJ approach, stone phase parameters measured from quantum correlated DD bar decays are the key input parameters for gamma measurement. Three meaning schemes are used in this work. Equal delta, uh, optimal and modified optimal. Two dimensional phase are performed to exchange signal events in order to improve the statistic, statistics of double tag events. Two partially reconstruction methods are used by missing one pi plus from D and missing one pi zero from case of. They are shown in uh, the, the figures. And here, the, the, this slide shows the best three result, results from digital to case of Kelong Papa, which is the most precise measurements to date. Redos are the results of this work. Blue dots are the expected values, and green dots are the clear C results. The strong phase parameters are still limited by statistical uncertainty. Best three results are a factor of 1.9 to 2.8 more precise than previous results. And the associated uncertainty on gamma is reduced from four degrees to one degree. The improved results is important input for gamma measurement in B mass decay. And for the strong phase differences in digital decay to case or K long KK, by using the equal delta binning scheme, the results of strong phase parameters with n bins equal to two, three, and four are shown in the figures. Pin dots are closely results, blue stars are Baba models, and black dots with error bar are the best real results which is the best precision for strong phase parameters of digital decay to KSOR or KLON KK. It is also important for the determination of time missing parameters and search for CP violation. Uh, best three has also uh, reported the Dalit Pro analysis of digital to KSOR KK using 1845 signal events with a purity of 96%. The Dalit plot is well described by a set of six resonances. The Dalit plot projections are shown in figure. Blue line is the amplitude model, and the results of fit fractions and significances are shown in table. And the A0980 couples strongly to the channel KK bar. The branch fractions of D0 to K saw KK is the first S-loop measurement. 
Here, BAS3 reports the preliminary result of amplitude analysis of DS to KKPi, which is important for theoretical input and refine theoretical models. Meanwhile, uh, there is an obvious difference uh, of branch inflations of S980 pi plus between different experiments. Uh, using double time method, uh, we obtain 4397 events uh, with a purity of 99.6%. That means background free and best three results are shown in the table. Uh, which are closer to BABA result. And uh, for the branch inflation measurement of DS to KKPi, we obtain 5148 double test signal events from the feed of DS mass, and, ma ma DS mass from signal side and the feed of mass difference of DS from signal side and test side and obtain the best precision of branch inflations at, at present. For the decay, branch inflations with intermediate states like K star zero or phi one zero two point two zero, uh, they are consistent with theoretical prediction. Uh, here, the Dalis Pro analysis of DS to pi by pi is beneficial to better understand F0980 reasoners and obtain important input for the global study of DS decay. We obtain uh, 13.8 thousand events with 80% signal purity. The Dalis Pro of data and model are shown in figures. The unbeing measurement likelihood fit is uh, performed with likelihood function depending on Dalis Pro Position for each event. This slide shows uh, the fit projections and the preliminary results by using BABA model. The table shows pi plus pi minus S way has the biggest decay fraction. Other models are also tested in this work. With improved precision, best three results are compatible with BABA measurement. And for the branch inflations of DS to two through the scalar method could be used to explore as usually a symmetry and provide crucial calibrations to different theoretical models. The signal yields were extracted by fitting the, the invariant mass of DS and use DS to KKPi as a normalization mode. And the table shows the precisions of relative branch inflations significantly improve, as well as the fit measurement of two ratios. And BAS3 has also reported the s loop branch inflations of EDK to phi and s loop scalar method, which could be used to explore isospin symmetry between U and D quarks. The signal yields were extracted by two-dimensional fit for MBC and MKK spectrum. Uh, the precisions of BAS3 results are significantly improved by comparing with PDG and the branch inflations ratio of D to phi pi support as a mean symmetry. For the S loop branch inflations of singly capable spread D decay to omega pi pi or eta pi pi, signal yields were, uh, are obtained by two dimensional phase. For the MBC spectra of signal and time modes from signal region and sideband region, and the table shows the fifth, fifth first measurement of D plus decay to omega pi plus pi zero and the precision of five channels significantly improve. Furthermore, BAS3 has also reported the branch inflations of DDK to KK bar pi pi, which can be used to explore DD bar missing CP violation and SUC asymmetry. The signal yields are also extracted by two-dimensional fields. For the MBC spectral of signal and tap modes, five channels are observed for the first time and precisions of four channels significantly improve. Uh, for the uh, known D decay to eta x only account for 44% and 16%, which are the key potential backgrounds in some lepton flavor universality tests. These decay are crucial to address the tensions found in lepton flavor universality tests, as well as 
citrine for CP violation. The tables show 14 decay brain transfractions and several char conjugated brain transfractions with uh, uh, asymmetries. All of them are the first measure, measurement. No evidence of CP violation found. And the best three has also reported the observation of D to eta eta pi and improve measurement of D to eta pi pi, which can clarify the gaps between inclusive and known D decay the, to eta, eta x. And signal yields are obtained by two dimensional fields for the MBC spectrum shown in the table. D plus decay to eta eta pi plus is the first observation and no evidence of CP violation found. And uh, in summary, uh, strong phase parameters in digital decays are measured with best precision at best rate and which can reduce the gamma measurements of systematic uncertainty at LHCB and Bell 2. Three amplitude analyses of d decay are performed. In addition, 21 dimension decay channels are uh, the first measurement and 20 channels with best precision. And the, result, uh, the result, results have used to check SU3 asymmetry and support ISO spin symmetry, uh, but no CP violation found. Uh, 17 uh, inverse figure bar precise 3770 data will be collected in the next two year, years. And more results in dehydrogenic decays are coming. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Shang uh, Questions? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I have yes. a question. On page nine, page uh, nine. the dot, dot plot analysis, dj 2 k short kk uh, yeah. Uh, here, the data model, uh, the last one, uh, uh, intermediate resonance, uh, A0, 1450, and minus K plus, is double capable surprise, uh, double capable surprise process. So what's the uh, recording capable favor process significantly? Uh, A0, 1450 plus K minus, you don't include uh, in your Lomina finance uh, data model. You, you mean here mean, means uh, uh, some intermediate state and should include? Uh, for me, I, I'm surprised. Uh, this double copy was about uh, process. It uh, must be have a larger significantly significance than uh, oh responding capable favor uh, process. So I want to know the significance of the capable favor process, A0, 1450 plus, K minus. Okay. Ha have you included it in the fit? Uh, I think in, in, in this, this analysis, I use the model not, not include uh, another uh, intermediate. Intermediate state. Okay, maybe the statistic uh, limit. Okay, I have a lot of question on page eight, eight, 18. 18. 18. 18. Yes. Uh, yes. On the third channel, DJ to KK eta. Uh, I found that the, uh, yes, the, blunt, uh, the efficiency is much slower than the first one, k pi eta. The efficiency, yes. They both have two charged channel and the same eta particle. So what's the reason for the efficiency is much smaller? That's, I, I think it, it's not so much uh, uh, the phase space. I, I mean, it's the, the K, K ions mass is uh, larger than the pile. So, so the, 
the space is not so large, so it, it maybe this is the the region. Yeah. I, I think. This may be the reason, but the, the difference could be so large. Okay. I think there's uh, some other reason, maybe. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. I have thank a- you. Thank you, thank you. I myself have a quick question. I have two, but I uh, just made me one and page uh, okay. 13 in the D Sabas two, three pi on analysis. 13? Yes. Yes. Okay. 13, one more. Yes, so uh, you pretty much have the same uh, statistics as the Babar, and you have the so the smaller uncertainties are due mainly to systematics, I suppose. Systematic. I mean, you have the same uh, sample Sem size. Sample. We you, you mm -hmm. have thousand events, right? Yeah, yeah. The here, here had uh, thirteen point eight thousand data events. Yes, yeah, so I think Babar had the same. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, let's let's move on. I'll I'll leave my other question in Mattermost. So uh, thank you. Okay, let's thank move you. with uh, Lonky Lee. Recent charm results from Bell. Okay, let me show my sc screen. Okay, can you see my slides? Okay. Okay. Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to present a recent charm result from Bell. Mm, my, uh, my talk include uh, four analysis to detail uh, uh, mass on decays and uh, uh, two uh, decay of uh, uh, Bar Baron, lambda C and Kasak C. Uh, firstly, let me give some simple introduce to our Bell experiment. Uh, it's located at the KKB, uh, a semi-tick semi, semi energy a, a lepton collider Mm, we know Bell detector have uh, is uh, one of uh, advanced detector uh, which have a good uh, momentum vector resolution and uh, uh, good uh, performance uh, on the particle identification and so on. Uh, also, Bell full data accumulation has been finished for 10 years. Uh, but a uh, fruitful result on charm phys uh, physics are lasting to produce uh, based on, on our larger uh, charm sample. Mm, okay, let's move on my first uh, analysis. It's a measurement uh, on charm mixing parameter YCP in CP order uh, decay desired to Kessler omega. Um, before that, let me give a, a simple introduction to char mixing and the YCP measurements. Uh, mixing phenomena is a neutral meson uh, transformed to its uh, anti meson and vice versa. Uh, experimentally, uh, mixing in all this open flavor neutral meson system has been observed. Uh, the mixing result from the flavor eigenstate differ to mass eigenstate. So we define, define two mixing parameter y, x and y, x related to the mass difference and y related to the y difference. Uh, continuing mixing parameters are very small. Uh, the decay time dependence of the zero to CP eigenstate is a uh, approximately uh, explanation. Uh, this, uh, this form uh, related to the mixing parameters y CP. Uh, with a different sign for CP even and CP order decay. Uh, neglect the possible direct CP relation in the decay. The YCP has a nice formula uh, related to the CP relation parameters. Uh, 
uh, if a CP con conserved Y CP equal or mixing parameter Y. Uh, here I show in the current experiment uh, Y CP result, the most precise result from uh, CP A even process D0 to K short, D0 to KK and pi pi. Uh, let only one CP order decay D0 to K short phi. And concerning another CP order decay D0 to K short omega has a five time um, of the branch ratio of D0 to K short phi in PDG. So we measure YCP in this decay channel for the first time. And based on, on Bell data, firstly, we obtained the larger sample of the D0 to K short omega and uh, also the a flavor eigenstate is due to K-pi uh, uh, with a very high purity. And the YCP parameter is determined by the uh, difference of the zero effective lifetime between these two decay channels. A uh, lifetime fitting is performed with the uh, resolution and the background uh, in the, in the, by this formula and then this fitting result. Uh, finally, we have the YCP result is here. This result is consistent with uh, our previous result, D0 to K short phi, uh, as well as the order average value. Uh, you may notice the, uh, the, the uh, statistic error is dominant. So in the future, uh, compared with the more precise result of YCP, uh, with the letter of mixing Y, maybe relieve uh, new physics effects in charm sector. Sector. Uh, my second uh, analysis the, the does plot analysis is K pi eta. Uh, we know that plot analysis of this channel um, is performed for the first time to study is dynamic and also pro provide us a platform to study the decay of some excited K ions to K pi and K eta. We obtained more than 100,000 years uh, for this decay with uh, high purity. And then we performed that analysis. That uh, analysis using the S bar model to describe the amplitude of singular, uh, including Kwanzaa two body decays. The, the, the background is obtained from M set band region and a fraction of each singular determined by MQ feet. Finally, we uh, the optimized that the model includes uh, five resonance with uh, relative, relativistic uh, Blaine-Wagen and uh, A0 line 80 with the uh, flat and uh, two K pi, K plus, uh, K pi and K eta S wave with the last model. Uh, and uh, this is the result shown here. Uh, we determine the fit fraction of this uh, eight uh, uh, intermediate process, and all uh, the intermediate process has a larger significance, more than 10 sigma. Um, for K on, um, K, uh, K, exciting K on intermediate process. Uh, using normalized model DJ to K pi, we determine the relative branch ratio this here, and uh, then we have the branch ratio, this here, you may find the, the uh, uh, systematic error is dominant uh, due to the eta reconstruction. Uh, a further discussing its performance based on uh, that uh, plot fitting result and the above uh, branch ratio, we determine the detail to k star eta decay branch ratio, this result uh, is consistent with and uh, more precise than current uh, current world average. Uh, however, it the, the okay it varied from theoretical prediction more than three sigma. And the k star to k eta decay the Blanc ratio is here. Uh, the relative uh, the ratio of uh, the k star to k eta and the k pi. Uh, is here, this ratio is a lot consistent, a lot consistent with the serial prediction. Uh, if we as, uh, assuming a K star 1618 is a pure 3D1 state. Okay, let's move to the third analysis, it's the lambda CDK. We know the, the branch reflection 
in uh, of weak decay charm baron process or we study both weak and uh, stronger interaction for this decay channel is uh, uh, it ideal decay model to study lambda 60 70 because the uh, s beam is fixed for any compilation of two particle in a final state using the four data we have uh, uh, a large sample of lambda C2 eta lambda pi is obtained uh, by this environment distribution. Uh, meanwhile, the lambda C2 eta sigma pi is observed indirectly as a fade down components, and it had an efficiency correlated the years listed here at a level of 10 to 5. Uh, 10 to, 10 to 5. Uh, considering the lambda C2 eta lambda pi and the K and, and the nominalization, nominalization the model lambda C2 K pi, K, PK pi has a efficient large statistic. So the years in individual beams of that plot are determined. And the total uh, years and is here at the uh, uh, larger uh, statistic level. And then we measure the Laplace ratio. Uh, on the data plot of lambda c to eta lambda pi, we can uh, see uh, some band, band uh, related to lambda c, c lambda uh, sixty seventy and the sigma thirty eighty five, and also uh, eight zero line eighty. Uh, uh, for every two MeV beams of uh, environment, the lambda eta and the lambda pi distribution, the lambda singular is determined by fitting. And then the uh, uh, blood vegan is using the describe these two uh, reasons, and the fitted mass and the y's are showing here. Uh, then we choose, we measure the blunt ratio related, related to the luminous channel list here, and also the absolute blunt ratio. Uh, at the last uh, analysis, it uh, first determination has been parity of charmed string baron, like say, uh, 2970. Uh, theoretically, there are many possibilities for the spin parity assignment for this uh, uh, like say, baron. Uh, this unclear theoretical situation motivated the uh, experimental determination for its spin and parity. This will pro uh, provide uh, important information to test uh, this uh, prediction and help uh, understand the lecture. Uh, the spin is determined by the angular distribution of CSC to say a, a 20, 2645 uh, pi and the pi pi. Uh, the first highlight angle is a uh, uh, highlight uh, angle of CSC. 20 line 14, and uh, this is the angle distribution. We fit uh, with the expected decay angle distribution for different uh, spin uh, hypothesis. The best fit is uh, uh, one half, uh, where other, the ex uh, other uh, spin hypothesis are ex ex excluded uh, for small scale. So the result is inclusive. Uh, inclusive. Uh, a lot of uh, highlights angle uh, of sexy 2645, the expected uh, uh, angular correlation with the uh, assumement with the uh, lowest pressure wave uh, dominates is used to fit. And uh, J JP equal uh, one half hypothesis um, um, over to other uh, spin hypothesis at the level of 5.1 sigma and 4 sigma. The priority is estimated from the relative blunt ratio of this decay channel and the result uh, disfavor JP equal one half plus with the spin of a light quark uh, degree of freedom zero. Okay, that's my summary. Based on the larger charm sample at Bell, some selected recent charm result are present today. Uh, there are some other topic uh, above a lot included in my uh, talk. So, uh, and uh, more charming, charming results from Bell will present in the near future. As a summary, I'll, uh, I'll see Bell is not uh, only keep alive. 
but uh, still capable Atlantic together with uh, its upgrade experiment, Bell 2, which is under uh, uh, rabbit growth. That's all. Thank you for your attention. Questions? I have a quick question on page 10. Yeah. No, not page 10. It's uh, it's not here. It's other page. I think you're, can you go to the uh, Dalit's plot analysis of Cape Aita? Yes. I don't know why I have it written as page 10 here. Sorry. Um, so it, you you put there a non-resonant, but you don't find any non-resonant in the in the fit. Uh, the last model for K pi and K eta as well include a, a long yeah, distance it, term. Yeah. Yeah. So it, that that's my question exactly because in the isobar formula there you put a non-resonant, but. Yes. Uh, so I was wondering whether you do put it, but do not find with the generalized less, or you just don't put it? I don't put it. No. Okay. So the generalized less, you have this uh, effective range parameters free? Yes. Uh, for last model, the parameter is free, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other Thank questions? You. Okay, thank you. So we thank can uh, uh, move to our uh, last talk of this uh, block, which is uh, Valentina Mariani. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, production studies of DNB uh, mesons at CMS. So uh, I can share the screen. Yes, we need to uh, can stop you... the previous one. Yeah. Okay. Now you should see my slides. Mm, not yet. Not yet. Oh, yes. No, no, I can't. Yes. Okay, perfect. So um, my presentation is about the production studies of B and D mesons in CMS. So let me start with a very quick introduction. Um, the measurement and the observation of the EV flavor production provide usually very important tests of QCD and gives insight into the particle production colliders. Uh, the, what is very challenging in these uh, kind of measurements is the adronization part that is really uh, well to understand. This is why we need more and more measurement to, uh, to fulfill the, the picture, let's say. And also these processes are not only interesting per se, but they form a, an important baseline or background for other um, physics studies in uh, uh, LHC. And also we know that LHC is providing access to wide kinematic range with a very high production cross-section if compared, for example, to the E plus E minus collider. So in the next slide, I will show you basically two recent results on D and B meson production in uh, CMS. Let me start from the D meson production. This is the overview of the analysis. We considered basically three different states, the D star plus, the D zero, and the D plus, and the corresponding charged conjugates, um, considering the three uh, final states that you can see here in the slide with the other decays of the three mesons. We analyzed data from 2016, so PP collision at 13 TV, in a quite wide phase space with a PT of the D meson from four to one GV and the um, uh, absolute value of cell rapidity less than 0.1. We also applied a very inclusive trigger that we call zero bias. Then we measured the differential cross-section in PT and eta beans, and this was the first measurement of the open term production cross-section in PP collision for CMS. So let me start with an um, uh, overview of the reconstruction strategy. Uh, the strategy, the baseline of the strategy is the same for the three mesons. So I'm going to take the D star plus decay that you can see sketched uh, in this slide, uh, just as an example. So what we are interested in are the prompt produced mesons. So prompt means uh, produced around the interaction point that you can identify as this uh, orange region in the, in the sketch uh, where the 
this star is, um, is produced and instantaneously decay into the uh, phi slow and the D0. Then the D0 uh, has the D plus as well, as a non negligible decay length, uh, something like 10 to the minus 2 centimeters. So it can uh, travel, let's say, in order that we have a decay vertex of the D0 that is different from the generation vertex. And this is the very important tag uh, from an experimental point of view for this kind of decays. So um, what we do in the uh, selection strategy is the search of the tracks in the final state. So for example, in this case, the um, uh, pi plus and the K minus. And let me just underline that in CMS, we have not a particle ID uh, detector. So basically from a, an experimental point of view, uh, for us, the um, K ions and the pi ions are just a the same track within the tracker detector. This is why, for example, comparing to LHCB, we have a lot of combinatorial background in addition to our signal. Then we combine these tracks in order to form a secondary uh, reconstructed vertex, uh, asking for a certain confidence level. And we ask to the direction of the meson to be uh, parallel with respect to the distance between the primary and the secondary vertex. And then we cut on the decay length. So this is the general idea behind the, the reconstruction strategy that of course each cut is tuned, let's say, uh, according to the specific meson. And this is what we get uh, um, at the end. So here you can see the um, distribution of the invariant mass for the D star, D zero and D plus from left to right. For the D star, of course, what you see here is delta M so the difference between the reconstructed D0 and, uh, uh, sorry, D star and D0. And you can see that the data points in black are well described by the, uh, by the feet. So, um, so what it's very important to uh, include uh, in this analysis is the contribution from the secondary decay. So basically the aim was to measure the prompt of the production cross-section, where prompt also from the literature means coming both from the primary vertex or so from some uh, charm excited states. So again, taking the same decay uh, as example, the D0 coming from the D star is still considered prompt. So what we have to take into account is the possible contamination from char meson that comes from B meson decay. That still, they are signal because they are really um, uh, charm meson, but of course we want to subtract this kind of contribution. We evaluated this rate uh, in a Monte Carlo following the equation that you can see here. And what we find at the end uh, is that the contribution is something between 10 and 15%. Then you can see the detail of the contamination distribution as a function of PT and eta in these two plots uh, in the bottom side of the slide for the three, uh, for the three mesons. So what we do at the end um, is uh, to correct the visible cross-section B by B for this contribution in order to only have the prompt open channel production cross-section at the end. So here you can see the results on slide seven. The, this is the cross-section as a function of PT for the D star, D zero and D plus. Um, the same distributions as a function of eta are in backup if you want to see them. Uh, here you see that the data points in black again are compared to different Monte Carlo with different tunes and also to the FONLL predictions that are the uh, green blocks reported in this, uh, in this plot. You can see that the description that the Monte Carlo provides um, for, uh, for data is fair, but they are uh, also strongly dependent on the specific tunes used. Then since uh, um, our measurement in CMS come, uh, came at last within the LHC collaboration, we decided to study also the evolution of the cross-section um, with respect to the center of mass energy and with respect to the different kinematic region, uh, just comparing our results with the previous results obtained by the other LHC collaborations. Since the comparison, uh, um, let's say data to data directly uh, would not be so useful and also to, to so easy to provide, we decided to use the FO NLL prediction for the comparison because these calculations are de developed in order to obtain stable and reliable prediction in the condition for which the PT 
of the quark is almost equal to the, to the mass of the quark. That is the condition where the charm meson are usually uh, produced. So you can see here the comparison. On the top side of the slide, you can see the um, comparison between the CMS data at 13 TV with some uh, um, results at 7 TV. On the left, Atlas. On the right, Alice. So for Atlas, since the measurements have been done in the same kinematic range, you can see directly how the cross-section scales with the center of mass energy and since data uh, for uh, both the experiments are compared to the corresponding form prediction, you can see exactly how um, and if the cross-section follows, let's say, the, uh, the calculations. And this seems to, be, seems to be the case. Then if we move to the, to the right, we see the comparison between CMS and ELIS. Here, the, the comparison is, let's say, uh, maybe less direct because uh, the, um, the acceptance is different in case of ELIS. They just uh, uh, go uh, up to uh, Y less than 0 0.5. And also, there is a um, factor 2 of difference between the two because ELIS is not considering the charged conjugates in the, in the cross-section. Uh, the last one is, I think, the most interesting one because both the measurements have been done at 13 TV and is the comparison between CMS and LHCB. And in this case, of course, the two measurements are, uh, let's say, fully complementary between them because it's uh, um, like CMS is adding a new bin for the uh, LHCB uh, measurements, of course, uh, in, term of, uh, in term of rapidity. And even in this case, you can see that the, um, the scaling of the cross-section seems to be in a very good, uh, uh, very good agreement. Then uh, I think I can move to the B meson production. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, this measurement, uh, this new result is based on a let's say previous result that came last year in CMS uh, with the first observation of the B sub C two S and B star sub C two S states uh, in these well um, uh, well uh, defined two structure peak uh, with the masses consistent with the theoretical prediction. So then the, the next step was the measurement of the relative cross section of the B sub C two S and the B star sub C to S states with respect to the B sub C, and this is what I'm going to, um, to describe in the next slides. Uh, as for the previous measurements, even in this case, uh, they analyzed the whole uh, run to period 15 to 18 um, for a total of integrated luminosity of 133 inverse mensupar. And the phase space um, is the PT of the B sub C greater than uh, 15 GB and uh, acceptan acceptance in Y uh, less than 2.4. So the, um, the strategy is basically the same with respect to the previous measurements. First of all, the uh, reconstruction of the B sub C decay, starting from a two opposite side muons with the hypothesis that they came from a J psi and the combination to a track that is the, the Pi's law, uh, coming from a common displaced vertex with a B sub C candidates cuts in terms of kinematic that is the same that I just described in the previous slides. So here you see uh, the distribution of the B sub C candidates um, with the data uh, described by the feed function for both signal and, uh, and the different background contribution. Then for the whole uh, decay reconstruction, we need to add two additional opposite side tracks uh, with the hypothesis that they uh, come uh, uh, from a common vertex between the two tracks and the B sub C. In case of uh, uh, more candidate, the one with the highest PT is taken. And then we obtain the nice uh, double peak structure that we uh, already seen a couple of slides um, ago. Here I also reported the CMS event display with the um, uh, candidate events. You see the two muons and the three pions uh, uh, reported here. So then these are the results. You can see the three ratios reported here with a formula in the top side of the slide. Let me just remark that the branching ratio do not reflect the decay uh, from the B sub C star to the B sub C 
uh, gamma, since the gamma is too soft to be detected and the branching ratio is taken to be 100%. Then you can see the results for the three ratio here in this uh, lower box. And also it has been studied how and if the, uh, the ratios are sensitive to the B sub C uh, kinematics, so the transverse momentum and the absolute relativity. And from these two plots, you can see that basically no uh, important deviation have been, uh, uh, have been shown. So this brings me to the, to the conclusion. Uh, I show you the results on the first measurement of the open channel production cross-section in PP collision in CMS using 2016 data. And I show you how the CMS measurements uh, show a good agreement with the previous ones within the LHC, considering the evolution in the center of mass energy scale and the kinematic dependence. Then I also show you the latest results about the BSEPC mesons uh, uh, with a ratio, the relative ratio of the uh, cross section. Uh, no significant dependencies on the PT or Y of the BSEPC have been observed. And this is a very important experimental information in order to improve the theoretical understanding of the BC EV quark uh, uh, states and their production. And thank you for the attention. Thank you, Valentina. Um, do we have uh, questions? Well, if uh, not, uh, we are closing this uh, this block and the session for today. I would like to uh, to thank everybody for staying on time. So this is uh, challenging, but uh, we made it. <laughs> And uh, let's meet again tomorrow. Thank you. We ask for those who want to stay to discuss, please, the room is yours. Hello, so just to mention, <clears throat> it's uh, one of the speakers that was talking on the K plus to pi plus new bar. So I still have my Zoom uh, meeting room open so I can move also there in case people want to discuss something after the end of the session. Because I saw that one or two people tried to join but I was not there because I was following the meeting. So whoever is interested, we can either discuss here or uh, we can meet in this room. Thanks. You can find the link on the on my talk.